All right. Good morning and uh, welcome back to all of you for the third and final day of the International Conference on the Built Environment, ICBE 2021, organized by the General School of Art and Architecture at OP General Global University. Today, we will have the last four sessions of the conference on various themes around the built environment. Uh, in each session, four students will present their research papers in a panel which will be moderated by a student from the JSA. Each discussion panel will be followed by a question and answer session with the questions that have been sent in by our audience uh, here on Zoom, as well as from uh, those of you who have joined us on YouTube. Uh, the first discussion panel for the day is titled Bays We Dwell and will be moderated by Shan Mary Saji. The second session is titled City Networks and Ecosystems, which will be moderated by Anamika Sarkar. Uh, after the lunch break, we will return at 2 p.m. with the third session for the day titled Politics of Urban Phenomena, moderated by Kirti Tomar. And the final panel for the day titled Processes Around Built Heritage, which will be moderated by Akshita Nag. Before we begin, a few reminders for the audience. All recordings of this conference will be uploaded on our JSAA YouTube channel in case you wish to go back to them. You can follow all of our social media platforms for updates on the ICBE 2021, the links for which have been sent on the chat box. Additionally, we will be releasing the ICBE 2021 book of abstracts as a part of etc. the JSA student newsletter on the 1st of October 2021. Now, as we move on, I request Shan Mary Saji to begin with our first session for the day titled Ways We Dwell. Over to you, Shan. Thank you, Aditya. A very warm good morning to all of you present here. I'm Shan Mary Saji, a second year student at the Jindal School of Art and Architecture, and I'm moderating this session titled Ways We Dwell. Before we begin this session, I hope you all enjoyed the past two days. Trust me and be rest assured, this session is also going to be one filled with learning and critical reviews. In particular, in this session, we are going to talk and review further about the topic ways we dwell. Now, when we think of dwelling, we often associate it to the place um, we, are at, we are all shut in for the past one and a half years, thanks to the pandemic, our homes. But is it just limited to our homes? As future architects or designers, you know we could exacerbate inequality in dwelling through ways we design and build. So in this session, we have four interesting research papers that ask such questions pertaining to the act of dwelling, ranging from housing types and policies to that of dwelling in public spaces. We have four undergraduate students who will present their different views and approaches about the places we dwell. Over the session, we will have 15 minutes allocated to each of the presenters to present their research papers. And we will have the last 15 to 20 minutes open for the questions. For keeping the time short and enhancing the mode of communication, we will take all the questions of this session jointly at the end of the session. I repeat, we will take all the questions of this session jointly at the end of this session. So I request all of you who have joined through Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook to type down your, comment, type down your questions in the chat box uh, along with the paper or the person you're directing your questions to, and we will collate all of it at the end of the session. I really hope we come to work for a healthy discussion. All the best to all the panelists. And let's start the session with this warm note. Firstly, I invite Abhiram Lokanathan from Sriram College of Commerce in India to present his paper titled Life in Coffins, an Economic and Policy Perspective of Hong Kong's Housing Crisis. Over to you, Abhiram. Thank you, Mishran. I'll present my screen. Yeah, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay, so I'll begin in three, two, and one. Yeah, so good morning, one and all. Respected professors from the Jindal University and, our, and from other esteemed universities, my fellow presenters, other participants from around the world, 
and my dear friends. Good morning to you all. I am Abhiram Loganathan, a second year undergrad student of economics at Sri Ram College of Commerce, University of Delhi. So today I present my paper titled Life in Coffins, an Economic and Policy Perspectives from the Hong Kong's Housing Crisis. So this is how my, I've laid out my paper, the introduction of what the crisis is. The research questions I had in my mind while beginning, uh, while doing this particular research, the analysis and observations I've made from existing literature and other secondary sources, my personal comments on what I've observed and the conclusions. So, well, in fact, before delving, delving into what the crisis is, I would wish to say about Hong Kong, a bit about Hong Kong. So, Hong Kong, often referred as the Pearl of the Orient, is one of the world's most modern and advanced economies. It is a special administrative region, often referred as the HKSR, or the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, a subsidiary unit under the, under the governance of the People's Republic of China. However, the city-state, as it's called, has an independent fiscal, economic, and governance systems. The territory as a whole comprises of two major islands, the Hong Kong and the Lantau Island, the Kowloon Peninsula and numerous other islands, small islands spread all across the South China Sea. And it was a British territory handed over to China in 1997. As I said, it is one of the world's most affluent, rich and populous cities uh, territory and it's a well developed and advanced economy and is also noted for being the fourth highest territory with the human in regard of the human development index. Well, in fact, anything you see about Hong Kong is all about this richness and poshness. This, you have the sea, the rich a sky kissing skyline in the backdrop of lush green mountains. But the, that is not just the case. Hong Kong is also the world's most unequal city. In fact, you have one in seven who is a millionaire, but one in five lives below the poverty line. Talking about unequal, inequality in the city, housing is one of the biggest causes for this. Over the past years, for over the past 11 years, Hong Kong is noted to be the world's most unaffordable housing market. And it's in fact noted that an average Hong Konger would have to spend at least 19 years of his entire earnings to be a home owner. The smallest apartment in Hong Kong rent is rented at around 12,000 Hong Kong dollars or a bit above one lakh Indian rupees. And because of this reason, most of the poor people are left outside the whole housing market and are forced to dwell in apartment buildings which are small in apartments which are smaller than 75 square feet big this in fact uh, becomes uh, startling when an average parking lot is 120 square feet but a house is just 75 square feet in fact i just um, put a picture for reference here you have a, this is pretty much a house where a family of four lives you have the children sitting on their bed a shelf, a fridge, and a table, and clothes hung from the ceiling. And this is pretty much what a house is for them. In fact, the United Nations also calls this an insult to human dignity. So my paper specifically delves into what is, why is this crisis so, um, such a salient one? Why is this crisis just unique to Hong Kong? And what are the economic and policy mistakes um, that have led to this particular crisis. Though it's an insult to human dignity, much of the discourse has happened only for long-term um, approaches. What are the short-term impacts that we need to look into with regard to this crisis? So these are the key questions that I had in my mind while going, with, going about with this research. And so I'll define what exactly the crisis is. Put short, this is the crisis in Hong Kong. Housing is not available. For most people, they don't have a house to live in. And if available, it is very, very unaffordable. Uh, in fact, this is even this is also a house, a, play, a subdivided section of a bed is what one person can call his house. I and mean, that is why I've added this housing, this picture also. And this, in fact, leads to a lot of problems. Three key problems which I have identified to be remarkable are threat to hygiene and sanitation. You have about 19 or 18 or 20 families living in a place sharing just one single toilet and the kitchen. And that is indeed a threat to hygiene in the city. And it was also noted to be a community soup, a hotspot of community super spread even during the recent pandemic. Households are forced to spend about 60% of their uh, monthly income just on housing. And that leads to a deficient consumption, the consumption from the Keynesian world where people are, don't spend on anything else other than housing. And there is also change in household systems. 
till in fact the general way is that once a child attains 20 or 25 years of age he moves out from his family and lives and leads a life of his own but that is literally not possible in hong kong even children as old as 35 years old or even above are forced to over dependent on their parents because the family can afford just one house in fact the hong kong statistics department also says that in average a person has only 161 square feet to live in in the city and uh, it's becoming more the the crisis becomes more imminent when we realize that at least 2 lakh households live in the city with uh, in an apartment that is less than 50 square 50 square meter big so that is the crisis housing is not available if available that is very very unaffordable and so my paper specifically wishes to delve into the economic and policy reasons behind it First reason is that the land is not available. So Hong Kong, as I said, is an island and a peninsula, and it has a very rigid border with China. Any city, as we have known, from Lahore to Ludhiana or from London to Luanda, have all grown by accommodating more and more land. All the suburbs or the villages around it slowly get integrated into the city as the city grows in area. But that is not possible in Hong Kong. Three sides is sea and the other side is a very rigid border with China. Even the land that is within the state are steep uh, limestone cliffs, much like other Indochina and lush green forests. Therefore, developable land is fixed in supply and the supply of land is very volatile. So this is a graph that I've been able to source about land supply. It's very volatile. It has never remained the same. In fact, we'll see why it's not remained the same. And land is literally it is very much influenced by the trends in the global market in fact you can see 2008 was a perfect zero while in 2007 it was all-time high so land is a major input for housing construction and uh, availability trends can translate to be the reason for all this crisis but as i said the reasons for this crisis are not independent two three four reasons but a chain of causes and co correlations that have led to this crisis so Bigger problem, a uh, bit more bigger problem is the anomalous role of the government. The Hong Kong government owns every strip of land in Hong Kong and the government decides what use each strip is to be used for. In fact, the government says six percentage of land must be a farmland and that has been left barren for over past 20 years. In fact, during the colonial times, Hong Kong had one of the best public housing programs in, uh, in fact in the world. And after the ascension in 1997, the new government was faced with the Asian financial crisis. And because of that reason, the public housing system was re-regulated and the government left it entirely to the private players. But still the government owns the land, but it is the private parties who make the houses. Currently, the kind of situation the government follows is, government takes a piece of land and puts it up for auctions and private land developers take up this land through auctions and construct houses there in fact the government is a resource constrained monopolist aiming for market efficiency but this comes at a cost of social equity why is that the case it is because of the free playing land developers there is literally no control on what the land developers can do within the city the most of the developers come from mainland china and they, per, they are able to purchase these lands at astronomically high prices. About 70% of what a company spends for constructing an apartment complex goes just for getting, these, getting this land. And they are private players. Profit is the only thing they aim for. So literally, the uh, developers cannot sell their land at cheap, cannot sell their apartments at cheap prices. They only sell it at a premium. And their input cost itself is very high. And as a result, Houses are also sold at extremely high prices. Again, houses, these construction, uh, construction companies are not interested in developing any other places apart from the already urban areas of Hong Kong and Kowloon. In fact, in this land use map that I've put here, you can see only this particular uh, box in the orange area is only that has been urbanized. Rest other land is the hinterland or the rural areas are underdeveloped or not developed. They can be potentially put for housing development, but the companies are not interested in doing that. Then the company, in fact, three quarter of all the houses in China, Hong Kong are constructed by just three, three companies who all came, come from China. And because of that reason, they have assumed 
immense market power and they have also been influencing the governments hong kong is also a very robust economy with literally no indirect taxes and very meager corporate taxes as a result the government is also over dependent on land sale revenue about 40% of what the government earns comes exclusively from selling land deeds and therefore uh, government also cannot completely let go of this particular paradigm of selling land to private parties um but then again we have also seen another core i was also able to understand another correlation that is government supplying more land does not lead to an increase in supply of housing why is that the case because companies are private only focus on profit so even if a company gets the land construct a flat they don't sell it until the prices go up therefore as a result the supply of housing is very very constrained then another minor reason which i was also able to identify was the influence of growing china so as i said hong kong is a separate entity bit different from what the way how china functions however china has the influence china has in hong kong has increased year over year china developed another city named shenzhen just outside the border of hong kong as a twin for hong kong um specifically intending to take up all the uh, resources and investment that comes to hong kong then investment in hong kong spe specifically comes from mainland china so uh, through the means of land developing companies and there is also an influx of permanent residents so hong kong is a bit more free state a bit more freedom bit more ex uh, other business and better business environment therefore more permanent residents come into hong kong already where people don't have enough place to live in us china trade war because of which investment in hong kong decreased uh, by a great extent due to which even the property boom that hong kong saw in the past 10 to 15 years was also bounded right now so these are the four uh, chain of uh, reasons i was able to identify and what are the ways forward so right now the hong kong government takes up a belief believes that increasing land supply will be the only way possible to come out of this crisis and as a result they have devised the task force on land supply who has identified that who has identified that the city state will face a land supply crisis for the at least till to 2046 and uh, has suggested this land tower tomorrow vision program which aims to reclaim 4200 hectares of land from the sea to house 1.1 million people but again most of people cite this as a long term measure which will not be possible at least in the next 15 to 20 years and some people even refer it as a project to throw money into the sea only because of the reason that increasing land supply cannot solve this crisis that is what i have been able to identify through the my research, through my analysis because land development is completely owned and operated by the private parties they will not sell their land they will not sell their apartments until and unless they get a profit but uh, so that is what i have defined as the conflicting objectives between the government and land developers government in fact as a benevolent social planner a government must do must be doing things which help uh, to abate this crisis but land developers don't do that they only need a profit and that is the reason why this crisis has been unfurling so coming to my conclusion i have been able to identify the Uh, economic and so these are the policy mistakes the government has done why did the government own the land lend to le give it to private parties to develop and uh, it has in fact specifically affected the lowest strata of the society we said 20 percentage of hong kongers are, live below the poverty line and they literally don't have a house to live in hong the government is inactive all the policy suggestions government has been currently giving only are only effective in the long run short run we need measures to deregulate the market from all this uh, laissez faire paradigm where developers sell only when oh, cannot sell their houses at cheap prices land supply definitely is a problem but increasing land supply is not just the only solution we need we need much more shorter short term measures which can help to deregulate the market a b to increase market efficiency wherein the importance of getting a housing for people is given the priority so uh, these are the few references that i had and that's it so the crisis in hong kong is imminent it's indeed an insult to humanity because basic human rights are all violated but 
and we need better uh, policies from the government which can help to abate this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Abhiram. Next, I invite Ujula Krishna from SEPT University in Ahmedabad in India to present her paper titled The Spatial Type of Serving Quarters, Understanding the Design and Manifestation in Apartment Type Housing. Over to you, Ujula. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. I hope it's visible. Yes, it is. All right. Good morning, I'm Ujwala, a recent architecture graduate from SEPT University, and I'm currently an urban fellow at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. I will be presenting my paper on the spatial type of servant quarters, understanding the design and manifestation in apartment type housing. This paper is a part of my thesis uh, on servant quarters as done under the guidance of Professor Vishwanath Kashikar at SEPT. Okay, uh, to start with a quote, Domestic servitude confuses and complicates the conceptual divide between family and work, custom and contract, affection and duty, the home and the world, precisely because the hierarchical arrangements and emotional registers must coexist with those of workplace and contract in a capitalist world. It encompasses and is realized through differences of gender, race, caste, class and power in the home. This quote is by Simon Kayum and Raka Ray in their seminal work on domestic workers in India called Cultures of Servitude. Uh, the culture of servitude is becoming increasingly prevalent in contemporary society in India with inequality and economic disparity on the rise. The urban poor often get trapped in cycles of domestic servitude leading to work without dignity. That leads me to my research question. What is the role of spatial type of servant quarters in the manifestation of the culture of servitude that leads to exclusion, inequality, disparity and segregation within defense and developer driven apartment housing schemes in Bangalore? Government estimates say around 6 million people work in the domestic servitude sector, employed as maids, ayahs, cooks, cleaners, and nannies, though the number is expected to rise to 11 million people in 2022, that's next year. Productive relationships and systems of work are at play in dialectically changing and creating these sociocultural relationships, often negatively. To start understanding and addressing these structures better, it is first very important to understand who is a domestic worker and what is the definition from according to government reports. The KPMG report for the NSDC defines a domestic worker as a person who is employed for remuneration, uh, whether in cash or kind, in any household through any agency uh, or directly, either on a temporary or permanent part-time or full-time basis to do the household work, but does not include any member of the family of an employer. The exploitation and inherent hierarchy that is part and parcel of this culture of servitude is clearly visible within our own homes. The relationship has been marked by social relations between employer and employee, uh, looking at ideas of duty, the cultural aspects of caste, class and gender. Moreover, there's no dignity in the labor domestic uh, workers engage in. They're asked to sit on the floor while eating and not given a place on the table or a chair to sit on. And we all engage in this. Uh, on doing a quick survey on the employment of domestic help, 85% of the people said yes, while only 15% said no. Moreover, 55.3% employed domestic workers part-time uh, while 59% of the people said no to disclosing the salary of the domestic helpers. These statistics were important in figuring out the dialectics for employment and work structures. Now, it's also important to speak of the spaces, uh, the, the structure of work and habits. Before that, what is the dignity of inhabitation? But once again, before we answer that, we should ask what is the dignity of work? Uh, dignity of work is defined as the quality or state of being worthy, honored, or esteemed. If one had to conjugate this dignity of work to the dignity of, dignity of inhabitation, it would translate as the quality of a space of being worthy of inhabitation by a human. According to the international human rights laws, everyone has the right to an adequate standard of living. Uh, according to the UN Habitat Report uh, of 2014, um, the right to adequate housing includes two major aspects, freedoms and entitlements. The freedoms include protection against forced evictions, right to be free from arbitrary interferences, privacy, freedom of movement, choice, 
The entitlements include security of tenure, equal and non-discriminatory access to housing, and participat participation in decision making. Um, to discuss servitude today, it is also important to understand the history of servitude, from Britain to colonial cultures of servitude in our country, to those in the defense. And um, all of these have had a direct imprint on the current scenario. Servants in Britain during the Victorian eras resided in the homes of their employers. Large houses and manors have designated sections uh, to house a multitude of servants employed for various jobs. Um, Robert Kerr's book, The Gentleman's House, How to Plan English Residences in 1865, illustrates plans and detailed designs for these British mansions. And there was a clear distinction between the areas marked for servants separate from the rest of the house. Similarly, historical uh, television, historical and fictional dramas like Downton Abbey brought to light social cultural distinctions manifested within spaces. Uh, bringing out uh, these distinctions inhabited by the served and the servants, emphasizing the upstairs downstairs contrast. In the colonial period, as ubiquitous as servitude was, a new order of domestic servitude um, emerged. Systems of labor were institutionalized. Uh, cantonments in India were signifiers of imperial domesticity, navigating the power systems and manifesting them onto the landscape. The planning of these was also rooted firmly in establishing the division of power between the natives and the colonial power, and it further complicated looking at gender and class. As Alison Blunt writes in her book, Traveling Home and Empire, compounds came to represent the imperial as well as domestic power of British women at home in India in other more tangible ways. They were racially demarcated to house Indian servants and their families at a distance from the bungalow where the British officials lived, as you can see in these diagrams. Um, of course, as Anthony King writes, social divisions of labor are always architecturally expressed. In the defense, remnants of this colonial culture are still apparent and indicative of a stark and unequal relationship between that of the served and the servant. Most housing in defense uh, cantonments across the country are designed to accommodate a servant in an attached demarcated quarter. These servant quarters are usually accessible from a separate entry as well as have an attached doorway, which usually connects to the kitchen of the house. Um, they also are a one room space usually, sometimes with a separate cooking area and a toilet. Uh, coming to the current scenario, often new housing developments have servant quarters clearly marked on plans, sometimes even becoming a selling point for the property. Uh, Middle-class housing incorporates a servant quarter or a maid's room within the apartment unit. And these rooms are usually not drawn on the liaison plan, initial liaison plans, uh, but they're rather added and subsequently built post clearance. Uh, they're also considered as EWS housing. They have small windows without adequate ventilation and sometimes even no windows to the outside, like in the famed Kanchenjunga apartments in the figure on the left by Korea in Bombay. Uh, as you can see, there have been multiple articles written on the subject from a social science perspective, but as practitioners of the built environment, a more detailed look is needed into the same. Uh, a quote from Sonal, Sonal Sharma says that the arrangement of servant quarters in Delhi is not just about the convenience of the employers, but also an example of how women domestic workers as urban poor try to negotiate the scarcity of affordable quality housing in their attempt to overcome the constraints pertaining to spatial mobility. Now, moving on to the rights of domestic workers, as I think that's also very important to talk about, regulations, councils, and organizations. You have the Domestic Workers Act, which was introduced to regulate payment and improve working conditions. You have the Minimum Wages Act, which different states have uh, different minimum wages, which are defined. You have the DWSSC, which is the Domestic Workers Sector Skill Council, which um, tries to find employment and find critical school, uh, critical roles as well as associated skill gaps. You have the NDWF, which is the National Domestic Workers Federation, which aims to protect and promote the rights of domestic workers. And of course, you have the International Labor Organization, which again wants to, according to their convention 189, expand, um, ensure expanding access to health insurance, setting minimum wages, and organizing the domestic workers together. You also have to understand the, uh, to understand the spatiality of these quarters and rooms, it's, you have to look at the building regulations in place. Uh, for example, you have a snipping from the Model Inclusive Zoning and Development Control Regulation, which says that servant quarters shall be reckoned towards EWS housing. You have a, 
you have a snip, you have snippings from the Delhi building bylaws, which say that the seven quarter should have this much space, this much area, this is the FAR, this is the FSI, this is the area which is supposed to have. Similarly, you have um, from the Gujarat GDCR mentioning that uh, servant quarters are mentioned in the same breadth along with garages and motor garages and storage sheds, which says a lot. And uh, similarly, um, it, it said that they are um, specified as ancillary uses or even that they need uh, occupancy certificates and um, you have to construct toilet facilities for servants separately as well. Um, moreover, housing advertisements also routinely market properties with attached servant quarters. Moving on to the research methodology and the case studies, these were the parameters of analysis. So there was a scope of the parameter, why it was analyzed and how it was analyzed. So there was organization arrangements, scale proportion, occupant loads, functional division of spaces, NTVA and access, and more. And there were totally nine case studies taken. And they were um, the viability of analysis for each of the case studies was seen based on the different parameters that I showed in the previous page. Uh, moving on to the comparative analysis between the case studies, this figure shows the plans of the various case studies analyzed with the main unit and the servant quarters demarcated in yellow and blue respectively. Analyzing the organization and arrangement, one can see the relative sizing and location of the servant quarters uh, in relation to that of the main attached unit that's in yellow. This table shows uh, the resultant percentage of the ratio of the area of the servant quarter to the main unit. Referring to the table, one can see that the values for the percentage area over the total area is much lower for the developer-driven housing, which is in the darker blue. It ranges from 2.6% to 7.2%, while in defense housing, it ranges from 9.3% to 17.8%, which is more than a double. Uh, this can be explained as developer-driven housing focuses on maximizing profit and space by increasing the square footage area of the main unit and decreasing the size of the maid's room. These J graphs um, show the spatial organization of the various spaces of the main unit in the servant quarter and the connections and placement between them. Uh, now, running the plans of the various case studies through DepthMap X, which is a space syntax software, and running a visibility graph analysis, uh, analysis showing uh, vis uh, connectivity, it shows uh, uh, the intervisibility between the main unit and the servant quarter. And connectivity is basically the points are colored according to how many locations are visible from it. Uh, red denotes most number of uh, connections, while blue denotes least number of connections. Obviously, as you can see, the servant quarters, which are uh, in the circles, have the least number of um, visible connections to the rest of the spaces. Uh, moreover, comparing the occupant loads for the nine case studies, you can see the disparity between the occupant load, load of the servant quarter, as well as the occupant load of the main unit, and as well as the differences between uh, those of the servant quarters themselves, between them. Um, so, yeah, our homes generally have no fixed number of spaces, uh, but there are a few general commonalities. Uh, the model building bylaws defines different components of a residential premise as uh, habitable room, kitchen, pantry, bathroom, or WC, or combined, uh, store, projections, and canopy. Uh, but if one were to go by these specific MBBL um, uh, components, the case study showed a variation in the number of spaces. Um, as seen in this table, uh, the functional division of each of the case studies, it became apparent that cooking is not seen as a priority in the design of the servant quarters. Uh, this is important to note as it colludes to the idea that uh, the occupants of the space would not, be de uh, would not be cooking their own meals, but would be dependent on their employer's family. Uh, this is a testament to the idea of patronage and dependency within the culture of servitude. Uh, interestingly though, Despite a cooking space not being there in all the case studies, there's always a separate toilet um, within each of these case studies. And I think that steps, stems from um, ideas about hygiene, though firmly rooted in caste. Um, as seen in the individual analysis, each functional division from access and entryway, main habitable area of each of these case studies was um, analyzed according to architectural parameters like dimensions, materials, maintenance, lighting and ventilation, and norms and security protocols. And there were certain commonalities that emerged across um, under each of these parameters. Finally, moving on to the significance and the implications, um, the above comparisons and analyses paint a picture of deliberate and unnecessary creation of disparity, segregation, separation, and inequality. This is firstly a direct manifestation of the culture of servitude that, is, that exists and is practiced. 
uh, social cultural aspects always find a way um, into our spaces, clearly manifesting boundaries and divisions. But more importantly, this intentional manifestation of disparity creates a cycle of inequality, exclusion, and segregation. It's highly problematic that these spaces are designed and created for the occupation by domestic health, increasing feelings of subordination and patronage that already exists, a lack of dignity of labor associated with the sector of work. And the, the design of these servant quarters further reduces the dignity, that dignity and the dignity of inhabitation, othering them from the occupants of the main units. Um, this only exacerbates the problems plaguing the sector of work. Um, I've often come across this counter argument during my research. Do you think then there should be no disparity between the servant quarters and the main units with respect to dimensions, materials, maintenance, lighting, and ventilation? I think this can easily be argued against uh, based on uh, the argument put forth within this research. The case studies do not even follow minimum standards and regulations, uh, reducing um, the dignity of inhabitation and further labor. Uh, the problem therein lies here. Uh, in the design and construction, inherent biases based on social cultural aspects find their way into being manifested. So these are the questions for the way forward. Uh, maybe we can have updation of regulations to clear and concise laws that govern the design and construction of servant quarters, including architectural aspects like dimensions, areas, materials. We can have strict compliance of the building regulations and bylaws. This could be done through creating policy changes to include various agencies at different levels and scales that protect the rights of domestic workers and include them. Uh, or, and the th thirdly, of course, um, reducing the stigmas associated with the sector of work and increasing the dignity of work through awareness and empathy. These are a couple of um, preferences, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ujwala, for the wonderful presentation. Um, moving on, we have Sai Krishna R. from School of Architecture and Planning, Government Engineering College in Trishur in India, to present her paper titled Cemeteries as Social Spaces. Over to you, Sai Krishna. Thank you, Shan. Uh, may I know if I'm audible and is my screen visible? Yes, you're audible and your screen is visible. Good morning, all. I'm Sai Krishna, a recent graduate from School of Architecture and Planning, Government Engineering College, Trishu. And I would be presenting the paper titled Rethinking Symmetries as Social Spaces. And this was done as part of uh, my dissertation in the ninth semester. Now, for me, like a vast majority of us, a symmetry was a creepy and spooky space on the planet until I, I was forced to visit one during my internship as part of a documentation. And that just totally changed my perception of what a symmetry actually was. It is a place of healing, reflection, culture, and history. It is a fascinating space where a dialogue happens between the present and the past. So, but the society has a totally different notion of a symmetry as an isolated space characterized by overgrown vegetation, inhabitation of stray animals, and a spooky and haunted atmosphere. But the thing is, are all the dead spaces essentially characterized in a similar way? Well, history shows us instances where tombs have been celebrated spaces, and we have a couple of examples uh, of cases where they have even found their names in the list of wonders of the world, just like Taj Mahal in Agra and the Great Pyramid in Giza. So the question is, what actually refrains people from accessing symmetries? Is it the fear of encounter from the vandals or spirits? Unfortunately, the taboo and the myths that have created the stigma among the society has led to the isolation of symmetries into the city outskirts. And this has helped the vandals and criminals to take advantage of the space for anti-social activities, thus turning them into dark spaces in the society. With rising urbanization and reduction in the availability of green urban spaces, symmetries could be reimagined as social spaces, as potential green spaces, as ecological preservation sites, and even as a place of culture and history. So this led me to the research question as to how can symmetries be developed into urban social spaces, and how can they be more spatially and programmatically efficient? The aim of the paper is to find out the methods of making symmetries into spatially and programmatically efficient urban social spaces. The objectives are to study the history, evolution, and architectural characters of symmetries, to understand the functions and current issues faced by the symmetries in the urban context, to understand the psych psychological and moral aspects of making symmetries into social spaces, to analyze methods of making symmetries function both spatially and programmatically, and finally, to generate suggestions for integrating symmetries into the urban social spaces. 
Now, the study focuses on symmetries with historic, cultural, or symbolic significance in the urban context and helps to put a neglected landscape into an effective space. However, it does not cover churchyards, church forests, or other sacred spaces. And the suggestions put forward have been done purely based on the limited data available and require detailed study depending on the specific region, culture, and place. Moving on to the methodology, an extensive study was conducted based on the secondary sources and literature case studies were done in detail. And the data collected was then analyzed in two parts, focusing on turning down the fear factor of symmetries and turning symmetries into social spaces. And finally, the paper concludes with a set of suggestions for symmetries based on their context and functional status. Now, moving on to the literature review. Uh, there weren't any burial practices for much of human history, but with the growth of civilization, people found different ways to dispose the deceased, leaving the body in the caves or dropping off them from the tree or mountain tops, sinking them in water bodies or even cannibalizing. So the idea of communal burials emerged in North Africa and West Asia about 10,000 to 15,000 years ago. Until the 1800s, one can see that the burials took place in a very small informal graveyards and that was a very private thing of the family. Now, with uh, rapid industrialization in the 19th century, there was immense pressure on the churchyards to be the growing burial needs, thus moving the symmetries away into the outskirts. This period also saw the emergence of symmetry companies and municipally owned symmetries, which gradually evolved into the symmetries that we see today. Now, there are different types of symmetries depending upon their size, location, area, etc., and these are the broad categories. Now, talking about the spatial and architectural character of the symmetries, Symbolism and art, these both are powerful tools which can drive the entire mood of a space. So, and this has been extensively used throughout the history. We see that symbols <clears throat> represented identity, social or cultural beliefs, etc., and was commonly used in a specific region with a specific meaning attached to it. Artifacts included monuments, gravestones, markers, and other symmetry structures, and uh, which gave them gave the present and access to the past. It actually speaks up for the dead through symbolism. Epitaphs, which are actually inscriptions on the graves, uh, right, uh, which expresses something about the buried person, offered a verbal expression uh, to the present. Now, there are several issues faced by the symmetries in the modern context. First being the lack of land due to soaring prices, uh, which has led to the practice of new burials being carried out in the same existing graves. Second one is lack of funding, which has led to the poor maintenance, making the symmetry an abandoned space in the society. The ones that suffer high are the historic ones because there are no members of the Bari left in the region to visit them. Next comes the, uh, sorry. Uh, next is the lack of security, because which prevents people from accessing the cemeteries due to fear of crime. Also, unstable structures which are about to collapse also pose a threat to the public. There are also frequent thefts happen happening where the corpses are actually robbed of their jewelry or other valuable materials. Finally pollution and environmental degradation, which cause such a major threat into society, and non-biodegradable materials, which are used for caskets, as well as non-biodegradable materials used uh, for uh, within the body, like the mercury used in dental fillings and pacemakers, etc., cause such a huge amount of disturbance in the water table. Now, moving on to the psychological and moral aspects, symmetries are sacred spaces for the family and members uh, family and friends whose beloved ones has be, have been buried there. It is also a space, a community, a communal space forming an integral part of the culture and history of society, which offers insight into the society's ideas of death and beliefs and rituals. So bringing a balance between these diametrically opposite emotions of, uh, of uh, emotions is very critical for the proper functioning of symmetry as a social space. Now, the literature case studies have been done to understand the multiple activities that a symmetry could take up apart from their basic functions. So uh, I wouldn't be going into detail into the case studies. Uh, the first case study we done was the assistant symmetry in Copenhagen. And the different activities found here were uh, cultural activities such as concerts, theater shows, performances, etc. And uh, picnicking, walking, jogging, gatherings, uh, and even exhibitions, uh, exhibition activities. Now, the second uh, case study done was the value of temples uh, in Hawaii. And the different social activities done here uh, were social gathering, wedding ceremonies, yoga practicing, meditation and contemplation, worship, musical performances, etc. Apart from these two, two other case studies were done to complement my studies. And those were the National September 11 Memorial and Museum, as well as the Madras Cemetery. 
Now, the analysis was done in two parts. First one, uh, focusing on the aspect of turning down the fear factor, and secondly, on uh, enhancing the spatial qualities of symmetry as a social space. So, uh, from the study, it was inferred that a well-defined, well welcoming entrance, which complements the character of that particular symmetry, with a naturally well-lit, airy space with ample openness, giving a visual connection to the external world, invited much more visitors. Then, uh, considering landscape, open and expansive landscape areas, especially with uh, flowery gardens and good shading provided by trees, along with well-maintained landscapes and well-defined and paved pathways, help people feel so much comfortable in that space. Symbols which uh, emit a sense of posit uh, pos positivity and security, such as the cross or maybe angels, was also highly sought, sought after. And using a natural color palette as well as material palette, along with an architectural style that complements the society, was highly sought after by people. Now, considering the aspect of symmetry as a social space, which was done in two categories as uh, based on their context and functional status, the studies show that symmetries in a suburb or town or a residential area as much more regular visitors than that in an industrial area. And garden and lawn symmetries are much preferred over, the type, over other types owing to its pleasant nature and openness. Now, the activities uh, studied have been categorized into three main categories based on their frequency as frequent activities, which included walking, jogging, and other daily recreational activities, which required much less design intervention in terms of build structures. And often activities that happen often, such as the periodical exhibi uh, exhibitions, social functions, such as weddings, et cetera, which required limited uh, design intervention. And finally, activities that happen rarely, such as observance of days of national or cultural importance. Now, coming to the results, the suggestions put forward have been classified into two categories on enhancing the functional and spatial characters of symmetries. So uh, the spatial effectiveness can be ach achieved via connectivity and accessibility, lighting and openness, landscape, aesthetics, uh, color palette, material palette, and architectural characteristics, as well as ecological considerations. Now, achieving functional uh, effectiveness based on context. So in a city center, park-like symmetry with a lot of greenery and openness, which allow for multiple activities, such as running, jogging, et cetera, were encouraged, and people uh, uh, multi-use Spaces such as halls could be built so that people could use them more frequently. And outdoor cultural events or theatrical plays, uh, dis uh, display of public art could also be encouraged, and income generating activities could also be incorporated. In terms of suburbs, uh, apart from those mentioned earlier, activities that occur more frequently, like meditation, yoga, reading clubs, could also be incorporated. Uh, while in the case of residential zone, more communal level activities such as gardening programs, nurseries, or setting aside a space for residential meetings and annual programs are also sought after. Now, uh, in terms of functional status, functional symmetries are uh, those which uh, where, where actually burial still uh, takes place. So it's highly essential that those areas are segregated from the leisure. So activities which do not generate much disturbance, such as walking, jogging, could also be incorporated here. And a fixed time should be allotted for other performance, which do not coincide with the time people come to pay homage to. In case of non-functional symmetries, which are of so much of heritage value, art galleries or museums, or something that talk about the history of the space could be incorporated, and photo shoots, filmography, or social functions could be incorporated to generate income, apart from giving the symmetry a wider reach among the public. So symmetries are public spaces that do interaction and unify community by bringing together people from different backgrounds, classes, age groups, and thus contributing to urban diversity. So what is required today is a shift in the society's perception of symmetry from being a place merely for reflection and grieving to symmetry being a community destination that, are, that is accessible, reflective, nurturing, and inspirational to all groups. So symmetry is no longer a thing of the religious community, but should be a social space where everyone shares the equal responsibility for its upkeep. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sai Krishna. Um, dear audience, I request you all to please drop down your questions in the chat box and I'll collate all of them at the end of all the presentations. All right, moving on, we have the paper titled Redesigning Existing Polytechnic University of the Philippines Toilets into Gender Neutral Sanitary Rooms, Addressing Gender Equality and Inclusiveness by Rose and Katigbak, 
Ben Joshua Labang, Haraya Sapalu from College of Architecture, Design and Built Environment, Polytechnic University of the Philippines in Manila. And we have Haraya Sapalu to present their paper. Over to you, Haraya. Hello, am I audible and do you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Namaste, Jindal School of Art and Architecture, fellow participants, panels, and viewers. Good morning. This is Haraya speaking, and on behalf of my co-authors, I will be presenting our paper entitled Redesigning Existing PUP Toilets into Gender-Neutral Sanitary Rooms to Promote and Address Gender Equality and Inclusiveness. Okay. I can't seem to place the next slide. Wait. Oh my God. Um, I can't seem to press the next slide. Uh, um, maybe exit the slideshow and try. Oh my God. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Take it. <laughs> Okay, um, so I will be continuing. In the contemporary period, there are a lot of rising issues in the human settlement, whereby gender gap has been seen as a dividing factor towards attaining a sustainable ends. Gender equality is a right and is necessary to address its accessibility in our reality. Three of the sustainable goals from the UN are, okay, I can press I'm sorry. Um, if you want, I can present the screen or you can try exiting the slideshow and present just the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, is it okay if I present it like this? So we can move. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, I'm sorry. So three of the sustainable goals from the United Nations are gender equality, industry innovation, and infrastructure, peace, justice, and strong institutions, which the paper took part into consideration and discussion. This paper looks into the role of the architecture in the built environment and through participating in social issues, like in this case, we show the relationship between gender and space in architecture. In other terms, this is an architecture gender approach we, which we use gender into the integration of this design as a space instrument. Here is the summary of the content showing the location, objectives, problems, solutions, beneficiaries, construction costs, and recommendation, which will be further discussed. According to the World Health Organization, the word gender describes the socially constructed roles and responsibilities that societies consider appropriate for men and women. Gender segregation is defined as a division of certain individuals. In history, as seen in most cultures, it is common in a variety of social settings, including schools, businesses, and religious institutions. Our society has been operating with this concept for so long that we develop our stereotyping attitude that became the problem, especially for those who do not consider themselves based on the traditional gender type. And as this attitude became reflected in our built environment, this concept of gender segregation that we see on toilets, locker rooms, and dressing rooms, among others, it reinforces the segregation and also endangers the safety and comfort of people from the non-binary gender who are frequently subjected 
to harassment and discrimination. In the Philippines, we usually call our toilet CR or for short, um, comfort rooms. So therefore, from the name itself, it should be providing a sense of comfort for everyone. Users of the proposed utility will be open to all users from the LGBTQIA plus community for a user-friendly environment that recognizes the issue of a gender gap in the built environment. Thus, the vision or goal of this research is to focus on encouraging a safe and inclusive academic environment in the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, or for short, PUP. One of our objectives is to break through the stereotypes and norms to raise awareness on the role of the policymakers in the Philippines and existing building laws. Behind this movement is to create a space for everyone, regardless of their gender identity. For the background of the community, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines is one of the most top-performing top state-operated universities in the Philippines and has a very diverse student population. One of its philosophies is to provide meaningful growth and transformation of the country through academic excellence. A research made by Herman found that 70% of the gender conforming and non conforming respondents have difficulties in using gender specific restrooms. And according to Kelleher, more than one third of the LGBT students avoid using school toilet rooms out of fear for their safety. The problem that the paper wanted to address in the built environment resulting to issue, safety issues and looks into how architecture can intervene as one of the possible solutions. For the methodology, we use the PESEL analysis to analyze the direction of the paper. For the political support and discontent, we look into the PUP admin, the board of regents, president, and directors. Then we move on into its local government unit, which is the Manila, and the presence of the LGBT groups. With that, we considered in the study the possibility from the decision makers and key players who will be approving of the proposal and the budget. We also took note from the political side, Honorable Julian Nueva, member of the Board of Regents of Philippines in the Polytechnic University and part of the Congress, he said that you cannot give a special treatment for a particular law at, expense, at, at the expense of another sector. And from the economics, it is attractive to the LGBTQIA plus groups and possibly other minority groups as it increases their confidence to achieve active economic participation. For social, it is to know the groups present in the university like Kasari and Lan. Kasari and Lan is a student group known for voicing out the community's gender expression. For the technology, we um, discussed here the fixtures available for the design and the plan of the toilet. For the laws, we have here the SOGI Bill, Manila Ordinance 8681 and 8695, and other building laws like accessibility law, National Building Code of the Philippines and Plumbing Code of the Philippines for the design methods and implementations. For the environment, in terms of reconstruction, it leads to increased carbon footprint in managing certain technicalities like plumbing and sanitary issues as well as waste management. For the analysis of the stakeholders, it is actually related to the political analysis, and our beneficiaries will be the students from the PUP. For the social laws, the Congress of the Philippines, a legislative body in the Philippines, proposed a bill in 2000 which recognized the discrimination against the LGBTQIA community. In connection to that, the Senate of the Philippines, also part of a legislative body in the Philippines, proposed a bill which is Senate Bill 1271 or an act prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity or expression, or for short, SOGI, and providing penalties. It was introduced in the year 2000, and due to the difference of the votes, especially in the groups of the conservatives, the reading of the bill is still on progress, as it was reintroduced in the hearing of December 2021. In addition, the local government of Manila, part of the university, the Manila government expressed its support in the LGBTQIA plus community through signing the ordinance 8681 and 8695, which prohibits 
gender discrimination to a person's identity, expression, and mandates to create gender-neutral toilets in the coming year 2023. There are also universities internationally and locally who are already adapting the use of a gender-neutral toilet. Beyond identifying these concerns and setting up objectives is the study of solutions. In approaching the process of redesigning, there are certain facts that are needed to be considered. The laws which regulates the environment of this society, and it is not only about how government of certain levels had taken initiative to join this societal movement, but also pre-existed laws that are already part of the system before even this had taken into a platform. For the design consideration, we have here the Batas Pampansa 344 or the uh, Accessibility Law 344 consideration on the national or macro level. The Batas Pampansa 344 or Accessibility Law states that special toilets for PWDs are requirements for every private and public institution as consideration to individuals with disabilities. The said toilets have a standard size that can accompany a wheelchair circulation and I am mentioning this law for these toilets or gender neutral toilets that are made for special groups. For the revised plumbing code, it is not part of this slide but will be mentioned later. It has provisions for ratios of toilets that are specific for male and female genders, which might concern these proposed solutions for by blurring the line between these gender um, toilets will not meet the standards set by the national codes. For the um, methods of implementation, consideration on a micro level, analysis of the existing PUP toilets describes the left one, the illustration one. This layout is the standard layout that is often used and has been used by many commercial and other public use buildings that is designed to fit again the male and female population. This type of layout and the type of toilet is a concern for certain groups, as mentioned above, and it is need of architectural response. Only after a considerate move of still complying with the national codes. Methods how? Redesigning existing PUP toilets. Now for the illustration too on the right illustration to become inclusive for all genders from the current toilet layout as for a city as male to male, female to male ratio is the equalization of the cubicle distributions removing one cubicle in each room to give way for additional two gender-neutral toilet rooms. However, as part of the revised plumbing code requirement for toilet fixtures of toilets within universities, the respect of having recognized male and female restrooms are still needed. For transforming single stall into gender-neutral toilets, the confusion on the usage of unlabeled toilet rooms can be aided preventing the dominance of a single gender in terrorizing the toilet space. In consideration with the financial condition of the university, a recommendation that the university can start with redesigning and use or toilets with a greater need of renovation as location of these gender neutral toilets. For the cost estimation, the cost estimation is with that, that we considered um, being a state university or university funded by the national government, it is always a great consideration to see through the expenses and budget of every project. So we just included this in the summary. And for the recommendation, uh, okay. we also included here the total as cost estimate from the material, the fixture and labor estimates amounting to uh, 59,567.90 Philippine peso and the actual price may vary depending on the date. But here we have the material choice in convenience with possible construction under several floors and in the aim for a fast paced construction. Lastly, an additional recommendation apart from the methods of solution in the amendment on the toilet fixture requirement of the revised national plumbing code on its provisions that are specifically designed on male and female genders, according to the chapter 4, plumbing fixture section 410, plumbing fixture required mentioned that each building shall comply with the national building code provisions and from the recommended facility and various types of occupancies. All fixture requirements on every type of building are categorized on male and female groupings, which is in need to be reviewed to comply with societal and gender equality. For the conclusion, um, it is true that the society is open to its diversity. Unfortunately, it is not yet equipped 
with tools necessary to support the growth of its sector. As what we've been presenting, this paper looks into the critical investigation of existing laws as it influences and determines the goal to support its citizens and minority groups to shift into making new plans. The new toilet design is based on the proxemics theory, which defines toilet stalls as intimate spaces that employ a psychological barrier to prevent unwanted intrusions, providing a greater sense of security and privacy. The idea transcends to the borders of digital and manual drawings and appeals to act and participate on global factors to ensure safety and inclusivity. By first redesigning existing toilets in the university, the concept behind inclusion and gender sensitivity will inculcate the idea of the community operating as one, so that as part of the youth and students, we put into practice to be able to adapt and sympathize with the plethora of the users, not just to attract the majority and to explore the vast world of architecture. This is also a reminder for students and other viewers to realize that architecture is not meant for discriminating because it serves the humanity and its users. Thank you. That is all. Thank you, Heraya. That was the end of all the presentations of this session, Ways We Dwell. It was really lovely hearing you all put forward such interesting ideas. So thank you, all the presenters. Now I'm going to read out a few questions that are there in our chat box. The first question is from Professor Esther to Ujwala. I'm surprised that you started your historical overview with what seems a random example from the UK. How about servitude, servants, and slavery in India before the Raj? Or in fact, servitude and servants working for Indian elites during the Raj? Thanks. Thanks, Shan. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so to sort of the answer that the scope of the research, of course, uh, I did it as my research thesis over the last uh, five months. And the scope of the research did not, of course, include the history of so looking at the history of servitude within the Indian subcontinent before the colonial period. Um, though, uh, of course, it's a very interesting, uh, it, it's rather interesting, the historical narrative of the cultural servitude before the Raj. Uh, but there's a book, uh, uh, which is a compilation of different sort of essays uh, called Servants Pasts by Sena and Varma. Uh, and the volume one details out the historical cultures of servitude. And um, because I was also focusing on a direct link between the spatial manifestation um, of the cultures of servitude in Britain to the colonial, to the defense and finally contemporary apartment. And my case studies that I picked up um, had a collection of uh, apartments from both the defense as well as um, developer driven housing, it sort of made sense for me to limit myself to just looking at um, taking up an example. And Robert Kerr's book is actually a repository of um, detailed plans and architectural specific and architectural and design specifications for these spaces because um, it, it sort of details out exactly where these spaces are supposed to be, how large they're supposed to be. And um, I felt that was a great space to sort of start the conversation and sort of look at the link between that and uh, uh, hence the colonial uh, manifestations in the subcontinent. Okay, thank you, Ujwala. Um, next one is for Abhiram. It's from Haraya. Given that Hong Kong has small land size and as a solution to urban spry, they learn to use the they learn to use of vertical housing. Shifting from a resident's perspective, what do you think will help them alleviate their ability to purchase a home or house to be able to overcome the crisis? Abhiram? Yeah, hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for that question. That is indeed a different perspective to how this crisis can be abated. So basically, I understand that what you're telling us, how can the residents be pushed so that, uh, yeah, so basically, it's all about how can the purchasing power of the consumer households be increased so that they can consume. Okay, I define how if I can define housing as a commodity, then how can their purchasing power be increased? so as to consume this particular commodity. That is perfectly all right. And that can be done in two ways. Either you decrease the price of the commodity or increase the um, increase the spendable income of the households. Perfectly fine. But then there comes a small problem in this regard because 
housing is more than a good it's a necessity necessity and it's not a luxury it's not a good it's a basic human necessity to have a decent living area to live in uh, during your life so this is where the problem comes in um, uh, as far as hong kong right now it's concerned the government has ha is having a kind of uh, system wherein preferential housing is provided for poor lower income households uh, through a somewhat kind of a public housing program but then again a problem that comes there is that demand is very high while the supply is very low therefore most people have are forced to in fact wait for about 15 or 20 years until and unless they get a housing allotted by the government at a price which is affordable for them so this is where the problem comes the people's income has to be increased by some mean some mean as in they need to get a better job they, they need to have better opportunities and all but the kind uh, system of anyway that was somewhat outside the scope of what i researched on my research specifically focused on what are the reasons for this particular new crisis that has come up but then um, definitely so the kind of thing that can happen is the prices of housing needs to be pulled down to a level which is affordable for the people that has not specifically happened in hong kong right now so that is where the problem lies in and that is what that requires to be tackled so i hope so in fact more than empowering the people to be able to purchase a house at an already astronomically high price a better socially efficient or at least from the government's perspective something a more practical thing a government policy can do would definitely be to reduce the price so that people can automatically go and purchase their house so that is what i believe in thank you abhiram um next question is for sai krishna by professor zai uh, she says, my apologies for missing the beginning of your talk. Where is the symmetry in your symmetry in your city? What is your understanding of it? How is it a heterotrophic space? Yes, thank you for the question. And um, if you're asking about the symmetry that I mentioned, it was in uh, it was the Tenjong symmetry in a place called Talisheri in Kanu, Kerala, in India. So uh, my understanding of the symmetry is that uh, it has such a uh, such a strategic location with uh, which offers a very scenic view into the beach below and it has uh, a very historic port in uh, in the frontage and it has got two schools uh, I mean, 20 schools on its either side so with such a strategic location and this uh, such interesting tombs uh, tombs and uh, that dates from 1800s it has been a neglected space with overgrown vegetation and stray animals etc so what happens is that uh, over the time, uh, over the time period as it got neglected, it is, it, it has become a space for the vandals and criminals to take advantage and, you know, they intentionally create that spooky atmosphere preventing people uh, from entering it or using it in any manner. And it has also uh, become a space to actually dump waste literally from those schools. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, spaces which have been neglected in societies like a cemetery, there should be some check, you know, some check uh, on the activities that are happening. So I believe that human intervention as designers or planners or even as just human beings, there should be some kind of uh, check that should be uh, regulated. So uh, introducing activities such as uh, those mentioned, the suggestions that I gave through my paper, I think would actually help people establish a connect, either emotional or physical connect to that space so that uh, it remains as an active space and it's no more a negative space. So, uh, I think that answers your question. Uh, thanks, Sai. Yeah, it does to a certain degree. I'm sorry, like I said, I missed the beginning of your presentation. Now, are you saying that the cemetery is not used anymore in terms of there are no burials there? It, those are only the ones, at some point, the burials stopped? No, no, the interesting part about the uh, fact about this particular cemetery is that it has uh, burials dating from the 1800s to as recent as 2019. Uh, that was when I actually uh, visited the cemetery. But there's the is, still a space that is getting used, uh, right? Sorry, it is still, uh, therefore, it is still very much a space that is in yes, public yes. imagination. It is in pub and not just imagination, it is still part of public engagement. Right. So what you're deciding on is the kind of engagement. And yes. that engagement to me sounds like an ordered engagement. 
Yes, but the thing is that these historical tombs are being totally neglected into the you know the back space, backyard of the particular cemetery, and the recent ones have been uh, you know uh, pretty much protected and everything. But the recent ones with which have interesting forms of pyramids and even the, uh, there have been tombs for the puppies. So it's such an interesting place which have been uh, totally neglected. So what I try to uh, say is that there are symmetry symmetries which. Uh, of historical significance like this. So they're just being neglected like anything. So I wish to actually uh, bring it into life so that people can relate it in some way or the other. Maybe yeah, so I understand that side. I'm just, I think I'm a little um, disoriented for the lack of a better word. By this, by what you're saying and the way you're framing your argument, I can understand, see, because cemeteries in many, many parts of the world have become you, you know, usable as parks, right? But there's that, they're dependent on a very different relationship between the dead and us, right? Uh, so therefore, without a cultural understanding of what it means, and that too in a place like Kunur, with a particular community of Christians, and not just Christians, but others as well, what the meaning systems of cemetery holds for us may be very, very different from the meaning systems, let's say, that are held by somebody in New York, right? In that case, when we talk about activating a space, how do we um how do we stray away from the danger of disneyfying a cemetery right how do we stray from the uh, sort of keep in check this idea that not every part of turning something into a park or a usable space is necessarily uh, understood as usable uh, or is quite often understood as usable through a very modern modernist lens as well so what would what would stop us from turning this into a Disneyland of the dead? So well, uh, the thing is, uh, as I mentioned in paper, there should be a you know a clear balance between these uh, diametrical emotions that people are attached to. Because people who come here for maybe healing or reflection should be cared for, and people who come to uh, nature should be you know. Uh, should be uh, engaged in some other way. So creating a space, uh, you know, like a very, very, um, a very celebrated space would uh, eventually harm or upset the sentiments of the people whose uh, beloved one have been buried there. So uh, the kind of active. Sorry. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. I have just one more thing for you to think about. Sorry. I am assuming that when somebody bury in this particular cemetery, when somebody buries a loved one, they have to purchase the, 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 the burial site. So therefore, is that burial site private property or public property? Yes, it's, it's actually a private property. But the thing is that therefore, how on what grounds do we can we can we how do we intervene into private property? Yes, uh, this particular symmetry, as you uh, as I mentioned, it is actually in a functional state. But there are symmetries, you know, uh, of uh, the British officials, especially in India, which have been totally neglected. So my paper actually focused on symmetries, such symmetries as, as general, and not just on this particular symmetry. So, uh, so there are spaces which have been totally neglected. Uh, so such spaces, even though they might be private, but they could be taken up by the government and could be turned into some, you know, like a useful social space and they could be brought back to life. But that is not totally applicable in the case of the symmetry that I would be doing. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zai and Sai Krishna. Uh, we have a question from YouTube from Shriya, and I believe it's for Haraya, Rose, and Benz. As a victim of harassment in a mild degree due to being a part of the LGBTQ plus community, thank you for your presentation. And she asks, how would such proposals pose in a country that is still developing and have other priorities which certainly aren't to ensure safety of genders outside of the binary? Secondly, how would these designs you mentioned be incorporated in communities such as in schools where the officials are accused of propagandas, not just in countries like the Philippines and India? Hello, here is Ria. Thank you for that wonderful question. First, for the first question from the Zoom, uh, comfort rooms have the same function as the usual toilet 
and our gender neutral toilets have the same function. Only that, what we are trying to achieve is to create an environment for all types of users, especially for the LGBTQIA community, and in order to promote the gender expression and sensitivity. So we change the layout with an average recommendation from the codes to have for PWDs to have um, 3.06 square meters or with a dimension of 1.7 meter to um, 1.8 meter. So from that, uh, moving on to the question of Sriya. So actually, it is true that um, research re reveals from, revealed from um, Kelleher and um, other researchers, Herman, that there are more than 70% or one third of the LGBTQIA plus groups who are um, who don't use toilets from their schools out of fear for their safety and is experiencing harassment and other safety issues. So uh, from that, we can lean on the government and other policymakers to control this type of um, thinking. So what you say about the propagandas is that um, we just need uh, support from the government and uh, local policymakers. So, for example, here in the Philippines, we have schools already adapting to this kind of toilets, like the University of the Philippines and also Ateneo de Manila University, which is a private institution. So, from here, um, they have what we call the Center for Inclusiv Inclusivity and Diversity, and uh, they have implemented these gender neutral toilets. And from their report, they don't have, um, they don't experience uh, maltreatment or harassment from these groups because they are enforcing the laws that will aid the students to, to be able to perform and adapt to this kind of new perspective. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Haraya. Um, next is question from Asta. She's a JSE student. Her question is to Ujwala. Interestingly enough, one of the regulations in your slide says that servant quarters should be replaced in setbacks, generally where the services of any building are put together. Similarly, while any spatial planning, spatial planning, these spaces are kept additional to the rest of the house, then would it be right to say that these personal relations between the served and servant somehow are coming from larger systems of power? Maybe as a form from maybe as from the colonial times too. Uh, thanks, Shan. Thank you, Asa. You're absolutely right in saying so. Um, and the larger argument is thus formed, you know, connecting aspects of power, patronage, deliberate distinction, and uh, segregation as well. Uh, all, and they're all rooted in power, caste, class, and gender as well. So there's a very interesting book by R.S. Deshpande called uh, Modern Ideal Homes in India. It was published in the 1950s. And it's actually an ind a very great indicator of the same. So it actually, what it does is um, it defines and specifies regulations and rules for um, apartment design of apartment housing in Bombay right after the colonial period. But um, Deshpande basically studied um under british patronage and uh, what he did was that uh, it, it's it's sort of superimposing um a colonial mindset as on on already existing social cultural uh, social cultural ideas of the time you know based on caste and class um and how power is actually um, defined and manifested in spaces and what it is very interesting you can see that um in one of the plans uh the the toilets are actually designed to be near the staircases in the early apartment housing in bombay and that's very interesting because um it it means that the person coming to clean the toilet uh does not have to enter the rest of the house and can directly clean the toilet from right outside and take it out and and that is actually and it also obviously the book um, specifies a lot of other regulations and rules about um, housing and design and servants being able to occupy these spaces even um, nikhil rao's uh, book uh, house but no garden talks about this in um, in bombay and he he speaks of uh, how these are sort of vestigial sp um, interstitial spaces um, that the servants occupy below the staircases um, behind certain um, behind the kitchen in store rooms and of course this is all a way of manifesting power and creating like sort of deliberate distinction and division in spaces and of course spaces um, directly manifest these 
I, I hope that sort of ties it up. Yeah. Thank you, Jwela. Um, we'll take one more question for this round. And we have Professor Anandit, and his question is for Sai Krishna. He mentions, I wanted to know if you think that the ebb and the flow of death, which manifests into the cemeteries, has a life of its own. Do we necessarily need to treat a cemetery as a collective social space when the multiplicity of individual events of death create the space? Shouldn't then this social space be as collectively created as this collective landscape of death? Are these even distinct to begin with? That's a good question. And um, well, as I mentioned, my paper uh, essentially focuses on cemeteries that has some sort of historical, cultural, or uh, symbolic values. So, uh, what happens in a so uh, what happens in the case of a neglected cemetery is that uh, it actually, I mean, you know, there is no activity happening at all. And with the passage of time, what happens is that it becomes a space of the vandals and the criminals created a space on their own, you know, of their own, rather. So, uh, and what they do is actually they intentionally create uh, that space into a very spooky and haunting, you know, like a haunted space. And this prevents people from accessing it, even though they wish to. So, what I try to say is that such neglected uh, uh, landscapes, you know, like if we do not intervene as a member of a society or as a planner or a designer, it's, you know, it's, uh, we are giving, actually making them into a dark space, giving the criminals an opportunity to thrive there. So uh, I think maybe uh, uh, in such neglected landscapes, there is no space being created on its own, but it's actually the criminals who come and create, you know, their own space, which should not be encouraged. So. Uh, that is, I think I answered your question. And uh, I would also like to say that the limitation of my paper was that it focused on the historical ones and it's not about the normal cemeteries that function in Africa. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Anandit and Sai Krishna. Well, the amount of questions itself tells how engaging the presentations were. So kudos to all the presenters. Uh, I'm sorry we won't be able to take uh, further questions since we are running a bit over time of our scheduled time. So I request audience to type down your questions if you have any more in the chat box. And I also request the presenters to try and answer it in the chat box itself so that we can end this session here. Once again, thank you to all the presenters for the lovely session. I hope you all enjoyed presenting as much as we enjoyed listening to you all. Also, thank you audience for joining in. Hope you all have an enriching day ahead. I, Shan Mary Saji, signing off. Thank you. Back to you, Aditya.
All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, for the next panel for today. Uh, we will now begin with the next session. It's titled City Networks and Ecosystems and will be moderated by Anamika Sarkar. So over to you, Anamika. Thank you, Aditya. Um, a very good morning to all of our panelists, audience members, and everyone else present here today. I am Anamika Sarkar, a third year student at the Jindal School of Art and Architecture and the moderator for today's session. The cities that we live in are complex places consisting of various actors that are deeply intertwined with the built environment. What processes and events lead to the formation of these relationships then? How do political or economic conditions affect the, the built urban realm? Or even cultural practices informed by structures of caste, class, and religion? These are some of the questions our panelists are going to deal with this morning, with case studies from various parts and eras of South Asia. As such, this, is, this session is titled City Networks and Ecosystems. I want to remind our presenters that each of you will have 15 minutes for your presentations. A buzzer will be sounded at the end of the 10th minute. And once again, when you have two minutes remaining. To our audience on Zoom and YouTube, please type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, and mention which speaker um, your questions are for. We will take them up together at the end of the session. Our first speaker for the session today is Ria Saini from the Manipal School of Architecture and Planning, presenting her paper titled From Sheher to Suburbs, a Verban uh, Urbanization in Bikaner. Um, thank you, Namaka. Uh, let me know when my screen is visible. Yeah, it's visible. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, good morning. My paper is titled From Shuhai to Suburb, Urbanization in Bikane. A city has often been compared to a cell. It has nucleus, protective membrane, defense mechanisms, and other sophisticated functional systems. And just like an organism, it resonates with life and is always in a state of transformation to the point that it almost appears as if the cities are mutating to respond to its various changes. Northwestern Indian cities reflected this pattern rather distinctly, as they traditionally relied on commerce and emerged as centers of trade. However, the development of Indian cities post-independence can best be described as directionless. Bikane, the former princely state founded by Rao Bika in 1488 CE, is one such city. And it is this divide that we'll be looking into. The city of Bikaneer, as it currently stands, is a result of two separate phases of development. That is the pre-independence era Shehir, or the inner city, and the post-independence era suburbs. Here we'll be looking at the two different parts, the Shehir. The old city emerged in barren wilderness and grew from its forts to the walled city that boasts a network of densely packed havelis of the merchant class, chalks, narrow winding streets that radiated from the nucleus, the Lakshmi Nadji temple, a temple being the nucleus in most cases in ancient cities. The Shehar thrived within the confines of the walled city with no scope for physical expansion, but if population increased, thereby putting more pressure on the existing high density infrastructure and degrading the surroundings. Taking a look at the suburbs, we find that uh, Bikanel being a city located on the border district of Rajasthan, with very little scope for industrial expansion, post-independence grew in all four directions, drawing migrants from across India that fueled its growth in the service sector along with government projects. They assimilated and settled on the outskirts of the city that later spun into full-fledged suburbs with modern facilities and infrastructure. These areas could now substitute the function of the inner city becoming centers of commercial and education activities. By mapping out this transition, uh, this transition, transformation, we see that the Shahar makes up just 10% of the Bikane city, and the city has grown on all sides from the central core. The inner city stands in contrast with Bikane's suburban expansion, while the Shahar is the land of the once wealthy and opulent families of the Mahavadi merchants. The suburbs mostly do the working class. The two parts of the city are now in a state of flux. This has caused a new wave of intra-city migration, with the people from the inner city shifting to the suburbs. It has been observed that the inner city areas have been marginalized 
in the process of urban growth. To take a look at this new form of intercity migration, I have taken the example of King Edward Memorial Road, or Cane Road. The name of the road itself suggests the colonial past of the city. The road came into existence as a pelted mud road between the old city and the fort in 1504 AD. It rose to prominence when Prince Edward of Wales came to visit the princely state of Ikane and structures were erect erected to appease the prince. The street house jairas or abodes of the prosperous and influential families that were later converted into shop fronts with houses on the upper floor. Since then, a majority of the residents of the area have moved out, making the street predominantly dedicated for commercial use. Taking a look at the factors leading to this migration, I have tried to identify a few of them. So firstly, congestion. The inner city is a high density residential block with every household owning a vehicle, combined with the narrow age old street network. In such a scenario, excess of vehicular movement and parking has taken over the space. The presence of a railway crossing at the entrance of the walled city as can be seen from the images, has further accelerated the traffic congestion in the area. Um, pollution, so the, the congestion has also impacted the air quality of the inner city. The noise and air pollution levels far exceed the prescribed limits of 65 decibels and 60 microgram per meter air quality level standards. The numbers are significantly higher when compared to its suburban counterparts where the average air quality is at 36 microgram per meter. Um, architectural degradation, owing to a shortage of space, the historic areas were transformed into strips of highly valued commercial land, and any remaining vintage stock was eliminated. The neighborhood relied on repair and auto construction to generate newer, bigger, and more expensive buildings to replace the old. The city has neglected its historic monuments. Poor management and a dearth of conservation efforts has led to the structural and visual degradation of the monuments. However, the primary cause for this migration could be put on the negligence by the authorities, as a lack of amenities and degrading quality of standard of living has affected everyone. The residents have long complained about potholes on roads, leakages, and annual flooding. The civil bodies have failed to ensure sanitation, check for stray cattle menace, or even remove encroachments of areas. At this point, however, it is impertinent to ask why is such development allowed to go unchecked? The research through collection of personal interviews, newspaper articles, and existing government records tries to put these things into perspective. It was observed that the inner city receives erratic and irregular funding, and the municipality hands out disproportionate spending budget towards the suburban improvements. Utpal Sharma's paper titled Revitalization Strategies for Historic Core of Ahmedabad claims that the relocation of prominent families has caused a reduction in influence in the administration and a general neglect of severe communities and maintenance for the inner city residents. The development of the suburbs has taken the forefront. The government projects are based in affluent neighborhoods, serving and pleasing the rich families, while turning a blind eye to the historic settlements. Local administrative structure and division of power between the Nagar Nidham and the UIT, also UIT or the Urban Improvement Trust, also plays a role. The Nagar Nidham is responsible for handling the old parts of the city, while the UIT manages the newer area. The UIT is enriched to property taxation as the suburbs offer greater exchange values, whereas limited avenues are available for such exchange in the inner city. Thus, we observe here that the shifting role of government from a managerial entity to one courting to capitalist accumulation through property taxes has taken, has affected this. So we see a change from urban managerialism to urban entrepreneurialism here. Furthermore, the development of newer areas is easier provides revenue generation, fame, and popularity to the government. However, it should be kept in mind that in the absence of any form of industrial expansion, government-induced development plays a key role in the city, which makes the current situation even more ominous. So 
So to conclude, what does it mean? What does this intra-city migration mean for the city? This migration, willful or not, is challenging the idea of the city as we know. The inner city's culture stands at a point of being diluted and its way of life forgotten. The state discriminates Shahir residents and align itself to lay claim on opportunities offering capital accumulation for going public interests. In this way, the state crafts a class divide. Looking at the situation from the prism of right to city, it should be recognized that the inner city residents have an equal claim on the city's resources and deserve to be treated with dignity. While it is essential to invest in the newer parts of town, investment should also be made for the preservation and protection of the historic core that provides a sense of place and character to the city. So the key question remains, how can the state's appetite for capital accumulation be paused and the rights of the inner city residents claim? Do we have a mechanism and means to do so? The essay raises these questions and seeks to draw attention from activists, planners, academicians, and residents to attend to the concern with Speaker Nail and in fact, every other city in India faces. Surely an equitable and just path could, for urban transformation in the city can be imagined. Um, these are some of the references that I've used. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation, Ria. Um, next, we have Tanisha Agarwal from the Symbiosis School for Liberal Arts in Pune, talking about her paper titled Socio-Spatial Evolution of Ahmedabad. Tanisha, over to you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. So the socio-spatial evolution of a city encompasses the interactions between the built environment and the society. In a metropolitan environment, the social space has a dual role to play. It acts as both the product and producer of change. This, could, this change could be cultural, political, or economic in nature. Developers, for one, must lobby with a barrage of government planners and politicians. Politi uh, Yes, hello, sorry. Um, must lobby with a barrage of government planners and politicians and different constituents of civil society um, uh, who voice their concerns in public forums and in groups like religious organizations that interpose their stakes and culturally defined uh, symbolic visions in metropolitan growth that exist in the city. The end result of these negotiations is a built environment that is socially constructed, involving many interests and controlled often by the quest for profit. The social spatial landscape of um, has I, excuse me, uh, Tanisha, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, we're still on the title slide of your uh, presentation. I'm not okay. sure if you've moved Just, forward. Yeah, okay, no, that's, uh, okay. yeah. The social spatial landscape of Ahmedabad has undergone radical transformation since independence. It has been shaped by numerous economic policies and several waves of sociocultural and religious phenomena. In recent times, the economic force of neoliberalization and the cultural force of Hindutva has been the most impactful on urban redevelopment. Ahmedabad is paradoxical in its aspirations because it has witnessed repeated violence being incited by Hindu nationalist organizations against its minority Muslims and is yet articulating an increasingly vociferous desire to be global. The neoliberal reimagining of the city interacts with its ethnic and religious politics to, uh, to give rise to new material conditions for people of different caste, class, and religion. The aim of this dissertation is to examine how the disintegration of Ahmedabad's capitalist traditions manifested in the textile mill owners brought forth, brought forth by liberalization of the economy gave rise to the divisive forces of Hindutva. It further wishes to analyze the socio-spatial impact of these forces on the city. Um, the research was based primarily on secondary literature. This is because the um, paper seeks to examine the discourse and debates around the changing socio-spatial landscape of the city. In a newly independent India, the textile industrialists of the city were struggling to maintain the balance between their support of the economic modernity of Nehru and, the, and Gandhi's idea of Swaraj. 
but by the late the 1930s, it was clear that Nehru had emerged as the most popular leader of the masses, with the industrialists of Ahmedabad and other cities also rallying behind him. The city of Ahmedabad is thronged by buildings that were built uh, because of the architectural patronage of the niche cadre of industrialist textile mill owners who virtually controlled the city of Ahmedabad economically and politically for many decades before the decline of the textile mills. The architecture embodies the aspirations of the industri industrialists for the city um, of Ahmedabad and its people. The architectural projects they commissioned reflect a post-independence optimism and a paternalistic utopianism that was unique to the mill owners and their position of unrivaled economic and political power. They nurtured a desire to shape Ahmedabad citizens into modern subjects by installing in them an enlightened self-consciousness about their relationship to the city, the nation, and the world. So you can see over here that at the behest of the Nehru government, um, Le Corbusier was, um, was commissioned to design, um, especially there were five buildings, Things in total that he designed and the one, which were private residences. But, uh, but these two especially are important to the identity of the city. And they were commissioned by this industrialist called uh, Hathi Singh, uh, Sir Hathi Singh. And, sorry, and, and you can, because Le Corbusier being an inherently modernist architect, um, it says something when the few, semi, quasi feudal textile owners of the uh, city um, want to bring somebody like, like Le Corbusier in because that was it was also a way for them to establish Ahmedabad as a node in global capital. Um, Ga so Gautam Sarabhai along with Le Corbusier had envis env envisioned a cultural center that would make the masses modern subjects who possessed a universal understanding of themselves. Unfortunately, the Milora's aspirations to create a modern civic culture in Ahmedabad was never truly fulfilled. The Gandhi Samarak Sangrala and the LD Institute of Indology were some of the most successful projects they sponsored, but they had particularly targeted missions and were largely away from the city itself. Meanwhile, the Sanskar Kela Kandra, uh, Kala Kendra site and the Prema Bhai Hall remained isolated from the people of the city. In the modern civic culture that the elite mill owners imagined for Ahmedabad, the past was to be channelized to project a specific vision of the future, while attempting to advance a universal modern consciousness in anyone who stepped into those buildings. The buildings were primarily, primarily a means to make cosmopolitan and globalized spaces in the city of Ahmedabad. But, um, so the city of Ahmedabad is cut into two by the Savarmati River. Um, and the projects that they commissioned were primarily on the West Bank, uh, and the West Bank is generally the more prosperous, is more prosperous of the two, whereas the textile mills were actually situated, situated in the East Bank. And um, so the te textile mill workers also lived in the East Bank. So there was a stark dissonance between the mill owners' aspirations for the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, encapsulated by the institutions and architecture they sponsored, and the social reality of many of their inhabitants of the of the city, the social stratification along class lines was concretized in much of the architectural planning of those institutions. Such stratification was not limited to the sponsored architecture, but molded the urban plan too. Few exceptions aside, the modern projects that the Milona sponsored were built on the west bank of the river ignoring the employees and the city's poorest res residents. The project never came into fruition, um, in part due to, the due to the project's isolation from the very people that it was built to serve, like I said. In, in 1969, Ahmedabad was ablaze with communal riots changing the course of its political and urban history. While there, had been, while there had been political violence in the city sporadically after 1947, as Howard Spodek has argued, these riots were unlikely, uh, unlike any other because, they, because of their escalated violence, they marked the end of both Nehru's secular and Gandhi's nonviolent aspirations. It sowed the seeds of militant Hindutva in the city. 
with the east bank of the city uh, with its mills and slums serving as the epicenter for the riots. It was clear that the social stratification of the city had only exacerbated the violence. While the western side of the city had been prospering under the textile mill industrialists, the workers who made them prosperous in the first place were left to their conditions on the destitute eastern bank of the Sabarmati River. The overlapping of the extreme violence of Hindu Muslim riots and the poverty of the mill workers was not a coincidence. The rise in divisive identity politics is often a product of economic insecurity among the people. This insecurity was a result of the wave of unemployment that had been started by the closing down of several mills in the city by 1969. The, this is because the, product, uh, because the riots were a product of dwindling um, economic and political influence that the mill owners had over the city. It had been significantly challenged in the 1960s by Indul Yagnik, who formed a new political party rooted in a malcontent pro proletariat that for a time being seized control of the municipal corporation. But even after the regain of power by the Congress party in 1969, the Melonas exerted less direct influence on the politics of the city. The repositioning of economic fortunes of the textile mills had a huge impact on the riots of 1969. Many of the rioters were mill workers who were rendered unemployed by the closed mills. Then onwards, textile production was frequently accompanied by bouts of economic volatility and interim mill closures. Despite the mill owners' attempt to keep their ties and rational, uh, rationalize the industry and build up consumer markets, um, the textile industry eventually started shrinking. In 1984, there was a series of mill closures that induced a major decline in the industry, along with their political and economic power. The mill owners' monopoly on the patronage, patronage of modern architecture in Ahmedabad declined as well. As new patrons emerged, they brought differing conception of a modern city to Ahmedabad. This diversification of the clientele of modern architecture began in the 1960s and accelerated as mill owners' political and economic strength weakened. The decline of the mill owners' influence de democratized modern architecture in Ahmedabad, tying it more directly to a chaotic, speculative-driven capitalist model than the quasi-feudalist model of the mill owners. However, the rise of a set of real estate speculators who tied modern architecture more directly to the volatile speculative market also signaled a decline in the relationship between mo modern architecture and philanthropic and cultural institutions. If the 1969 riots exposed the gap between the mill owners' aspirations for the city and uh, embodied in the institutions and architecture that they sponsored after independence and the social realities of Ahmedabad for many of its inhabitants, the re reconfiguration of urban spaces as a result of the interactions between the economic forces of neoliberalism and the cultural forces of Hindutva have only exasperated those gaps. On the February of 20, 27th February 2002, Gujarat witnessed the most violent burst of majoritarianism it has ever seen. A train with car sevaks that was returning from Ayodhya was burned at the Godhra station by an allegedly Muslim mob. This led to violence against Muslims erupting in many parts of the state, but it was concentrated in the city of Ahmedabad. Around 2,000 people, predominantly Muslims, were killed and countless were injured amidst numerous incidents of looting. The state's police and political forces are believed to be complicit in the violence. Innumerable mosques, factories, and houses were destroyed. Some estimate the economic loss of the pogrom to be more than 10,000 crores. While, the fatal and traumatic, while it was fatal and traumatic for Muslims, the genocide was advantageous for the BJP. With Modi as the BJP's chief ministerial candidate, the party won the 2002 elections with the highest ever seats. It was observed that BJP gathered the most votes from the areas of the states that were affected with the riots. The new economic policy in the 1990s eroded the protectionist regime on which many of the mills of the city depended. Consequently, 100,000 workers were rendered unemployed. Additionally, the mills provided opportunities for intercommunity interactions among the Hindus and Muslims of the city. Before the economic reforms, mill workers from both the communities and the labor unions, uh, in the labor union associations and the mills interacted with each other. With the closing down of the mills, these spaces have vanished. 
With the 2002 program came the complete realization of the inter-community divide. The worst affected by the riot was East Ahmedabad that was inhabited by the previous mill workers and the informalized poor of the city. However, the spatial order of Ahmedabad has been changing on communal lines ever since 1969. Each incidence of communal violence only hastens the process of segregation. The state has also played a part in helping the process of segregation by passing the Disturbed Areas Act, which according to many only worsened the situation. After the communal riots of 1985, the Disturbed Areas Act was introduced by the Congress-led government. In 1991, Chiman Bhai Patel, the leader of the coalition government in Gujarat, made it an act. In 2010, it was amended and came to be known as the Prohibition of Transfer of Immovable Property and Provision for Protection of Tenants from Eviction from Premises of Disturbed Areas Act, Gujarat. The act prohibits a Muslim from transferring, leasing, or selling his property to a Hindu or a Hindu to a Muslim in a disturbed area without the clearance from the collector of the district. This is, um, this is an artwork by this artist called Zarina Hashmi. Um, and she had, paint, uh, she had made 20 uh, artworks of maps of different cities around the world. And one of those was Ahmedabad. And she did, she did this uh, right after the pogrom of 2002 um, to kind of show how um, it was her response to the pogrom. The state-sponsored violent pro program of 2002 had tainted the city's image of being investor-friendly. There was a fear that mobile capital might consider exiting the city in light of the monetary losses incurred by the Gujarat's economy as a result of the program. The Gujarat Chamber of Commerce and Industry, in its desperation to appease the capital owners, organized a peace, peace march through Ahmedabad. This march occurred while violence was still erupting in many parts of the city. They even invited Narendra Modi, the man allegedly responsible for the state's ineptitude or even reluctance in controlling the violence. After the genocide, and particularly after his landslide victory in the second term, Narendra Modi set forth to paint himself as a leader associated with development. The government of Gujarat organized its first vibrant Gujarat Global Investors Summit in 2003. Since then, two vibrant Gujarats Events have been organized annually to prom promote Gujarat as a culturally and economically vibrant state with a global vision. A little before the commence commencement of the first vibrant, vibrant Gujarat uh, summit, Modi inaugurated the Sabarmati Riverfront development project in the city. Ahmedabad's municipal cooperation, the AMC, transferred into a market-based system of local government in the 90s. It tried to balance its legitimacy among the city's middle class and urban poor by spending money towards crucial water and sewer projects and to a less, lesser extent in some slum upgradation while considering public-private partnerships for road and park development and beautification. The adoption of the NEP led to a shift in the urban development plans of Ahmedabad from the development of infrastructure and public housing to urban renewal projects that focus on beautification at the expense of the marginalized to entice foreign capital. This is a result of the hyper-marketized style of governments. The urban renewal projects appropriate the life spaces of the poor, creating a city rooted in the principle of survival of the fittest. This is done by removing conspicuous slums, beautifying the city, and encouraging retail hotel entertainment spaces. Many hotel chains and shopping malls have crept in, up in the skyline of Ahmedabad in the last decade. Neoliberal renewal reconfigures urban governments by exonerating local governments from responsibilities of public housing, eradicating homelessness, slum upgradation, and improvising infrastructure. This is because the principles of development are no longer guided by distributive justice. The neoliberal moments of renewal redefine community life, reproducing struggle and conflict. The city of Ahmedabad is extremely relevant to study the twin forces of neoliberalization and Hindutva because it is a testimony to how the schisms in a particular post-independent conceptualization of modernity have exacerbated to pave the way for deeper inequalities. 
Hindutva and uh, neoliberalism might appear to be contradictory forces because one celebrates individual freedom, whereas the other demands the subservience of the individual to the society. But they both share deep in pol deeper political goals. As Gopal Krishna put it, they both represent common class interests by articulating shared notions of a bounded, unitary, and individual-based conception of society, as opposed to a community-based society. They are overshadowed by the existence of their similar outlook of the relationship between the individual, the society, and the state. For both Hindutva and neoliberalism, the state is a sentry whose only purpose is to protect and defend the dharma of them or the market. Such a conception of the state is against the foundation of a democracy. They consider all other processes related to state power as secondary to the supreme principle of the state. The dissertation aims to examine how the rise of the twin forces of neoliberalism and Hindutva altered the urban spaces of Ahmedabad. The modern consciousness of an enlightened polity in um, Ahmedabad was never... Tanisha, I'm going to ask you to uh, wrap up. We're nearly sure, out of time. Sure. Just give me a minute. Was the modern consciousness of an enlightened polity in Ahmedabad was never to be. The project was never successful because it failed to take into account the most vulnerable and marginalized sections of the city. The seemingly contradictory forces of neoliberalism and Hindutva have worked in tandem in the city of Ahmedabad to reconfigure the socio-spatial structure of the city. This has had a deep influence in the way people experience and navigate the city. There seems to be not one, but a multitude of Ahmedabads that one maps according to the intersection of their identities. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that very interesting case study with us, Tanisha. Uh, coming up now, we have Angelica Jessica Gomes, Anjori Mukherjee, and Shambhavi Bhakchi from the Sociology Department of Presidency University in Kolkata discussing their paper, Shootki, The Beef of Bengal. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we would like to start the uh, presentation. It's about uh, the fish item called uh, shootki that is present in both Bangladesh and Bengal. Uh, can anyone, can everyone view the screen? Yeah, your screen's visible. All right. Uh, so to begin with, I think it is pertinent to give a little background to how we stumbled across this particular topic. Uh, we were given a group assignment at our university to write upon the impact of caste extinction on any one aspect in our state, West Bengal. Uh, we were quite intrigued to learn about how there was a very negligible effect of caste distinction on such an important element in society like food in West Bengal. Uh, then after a little bit of uh, in-depth research, we came to know that there was a unified reservation that some people of Urban uh, Bengal had towards the consumption of the fish item called shutki, but uh, they could come up with no concrete uh, reason for their reservation or their attitude towards this. So we decided to dig a little deeper into the matter. Uh, so if we come to terms uh, with this concept of shootki, it is uh, no secret that uh, Bengal is popular for providing uh, an exquisite multi-course platter filled with rich food items. However, in contrast to this luxurious platter is the one dish meal of shootki, uh, eaten with just boiled rice with nothing on the side. Shootki refers to dried and fermented fish that are preserved for prolonged consumption. Interestingly, uh, while it was initially a tactic for the survival of the poverty-stricken fishermen or the jele of what is present-day Bangladesh, it is now considered a delicacy there. Also, while it is a delicacy for people hailing for Bangladesh but also living in Bengal, there is a certain labeling of poor people's food that has been attached to it, which seems to be the root cause for the reservation that the remaining people of urban people have, or urban Bengal have towards it. While uh, this can be looked at from a completely class-based view, uh, it, is, it is evident that the lines of caste and class are quite bloody in India. Hence, we see the construction of a certain social hierarchy based on the desirability and undesirability, as well as the preferences that one section of the society has when it comes to the various elements of the Bengali plateau. 
while globalization and commercialization can easily be blamed for such change preferences and increasing attraction towards the European and American food habits and cuisine of the urban population, the factor of exoticism and commodification cannot be overlooked. Uh, to match the urban standards, the shootki has been given a certain elitist touch. Some of the most upscale and renowned restaurants in Kolkata that uh, serve Bengali cuisine, such as Aheli, Six Baliganj Place, or O Calcutta, serve shootki by diverging significantly from the way it was originally prepared by the poverty stricken fishermen who couldn't afford fresh fish for themselves. Such cultural dilution is done to make it acceptable to the modern people, and these recipes have been termed as quote unquote authentic Bengali cuisine. These dishes are sold at outrageously inflated prices compared to other fish items on their menu. And uh, where, whereas ironically, shootki is the cheapest fish that is sold in the market. Hence, it can be safely said that a poor man's dish has been romanticized and given poor um, given urban touches to make it more acceptable in society while marginalizing the economically backward classes further in the process. Uh, uh, if we take a glance upon the pre-colonial reflection, it is uh, this type of distinction of food on the basis of caste and class is not new in Kolkata or even in Bengal. If we go back in time, we will clearly be able to see the clear division of what food was to be consumed by what caste. This was mostly dependent on the type of persona that each caste was supposed to project in the society. If we follow the Chaturvarna system, meaning the caste hierarchy where the society is divided into four distinct castes, we will see that the Brahmins, who were the uppermost in the said hierarchy, symbolize the idea of purity, spirit, and health. Purity was associated with the color white, Hence, they consumed mostly freshwater fish that were white scaled, like rohu or shakul. Immediately below the Brahmins in the hierarchy were the Kshatriyas, who were to project the factor of masculinity and power in the society. So their diet consisted mostly of meat-based items like uh, poultry and lamb. Below the Kshatriyas were the Vaishyas, who found it compulsory to project the element of simplicity and dietary purity since they felt that this would bring about success in their business ventures. So they maintained a vegetarian diet. Since food consumption is uh, heavily influenced by the material availability and resourcefulness of the given geographic location, the abundance of paddy fields and freshwater resources in Bengal or Kolkata uh, crystallized as uh, rice and fish being the quote-unquote staple diet of the Bengali people. However, a deeper insight into the culinary customs of Bengal resurfaces the neo-colonial relations of the new world. When looking a layer deeper into almost everything today, one will find the lasting impacts of systems of oppression like white supremacy, racism, and sexism. Our discussion of food politics is no different. While the everyday diet of people at the time had a lot to do with the tropical climate of the region, the British considered the lack of meat in a diet a sign of effeminacy of Bengali men. This led them to continue to consume their heavy meat-based diet despite falling sick a number of times. Soon the middle and upper class Bengali men began to mimic these practices which additionally consisted of looking down upon eating with a hand which many people in the West do even today and preservation of food. Therefore, even the ever welcoming Bengali person that you know today ended up pushing Shutki further away from their plate. After the 1971 partition, Another dimension was added to the discussion surrounding food in Bengal. The division of Epar and Opar Bengal or the Ghoti Bangal division was now at the forefront of food distinction in the state. While Shutki was considered a delicacy and still is in Bangladesh, the opinion of West Bengal in its regard is rather a mixed one. 
in fact even in the places where shukki finds a place in bengal today it is either for or by the bangal desh itself is not a very singular context it's not a very sing, uh, singular concept in the context of bengal while the first meaning of desh that most people will be acquainted with is the desh bidesh or india and abroad division second was the one i just spoke about that is the west and east bengal division and the third being the most nuanced one is the one defining the various regions of bengal from banaras the reason for calling out these divisions is important to understand the actual power structure that comes into play when we try to call something an authentic bengali plateau even more important is the understanding of how much simpler it now becomes for people to shun chutki and blame it on its otherness because it was never their own part of strategy elucidates on the three definite classes of bhotulok namely the buniyadi the shahibi and the madhyabhut this social aristocracy gradually fades the economic divides and the demarcations the choto lok epitomizes the socially and the economically disadvantaged this distinction between the two shreni or the classes have been reciprocated in the narrativization of the upper caste and the upper class as the indian or the authentic narrative Sharmila Rege points out how the vocabulary of the poor have been conveniently sidelined by the dominant classes. The role of the refrigerator in is rather amusing in this context. Introduced by the colonizers, this gadget was meant for the purpose of preservation. This violated several Hindu and Muslim notions of purity at once. The refrigerator blurred the lines of the vegetarian non-vegetarian, kacha leftover. halal haram and most importantly pure and the impure despite the risk of impurity and the loss of caste a majority of the bhotra shomaj are known to possess a refrigerator at their home today this welcome however was not extended to shukki baba sahib ambedkar has traced the path of beef eating with the inscription of identities which is majorly reflected with the consumption of shukki while the untouchables or the broken men were discriminated against on the grounds of beef eating the consumption of shukki is associated with both both caste and class much like the traditional preparation preparation of dishes like rakti uses a lot of chilies uh, for the spice or the kick of a punch shukki is known to be prepared in a similar bath of spice This is intrinsically link, uh, linked to the factor of affordability and the minimum requirement of other ingredients in the preparation of these delicacies. It would be fallacious on our part to overlook the pungent variants of preparations around the world. While some of them are discriminated against, some receive better reception. Please excuse my pronunciation because, of course, I'm not a native. Kimchi, natto, airo, duenjang, and sorstrami from Sweden. the post colonial influence on the economic structure of india had made some brahmins resort to professional cooking in the measure to emulate the ways of the british domestic life the educated middle class bengali started employing domestic cooks it was far and, far and wide known that the uriyas were impeccable cooks the influence of britishism and the underlying reservation towards the lower caste led to a very high demand for the brahmin cooks this increase in demand led to a shortage for actual brahmin cooks leading to the non brahmins forging their identities these fake thakurs were predominantly from the lower classes there was already a pre existing notion of fermented fish in the coastal region of orissa which further crystallized into the reintroduction of shudki as an exotic norm in conclusion Shutki is indeed the beef of Bengal, but unlike the much louder uproar surrounding the beef throughout the country, the beef circling Shutki is much harder to locate. This becomes an even more challenging factor in the face of the capital capital sanitization and the commodification, which blurs the lines between the accepted and the made acceptable. Restaurants and eateries have appropriated and reintroduced this pungent poor person's food to match an as Uh, accepted aesthetics suited for the upper middle class and the upper caste there is a continued glorification of the conspicuous consumption of the food of the choto lok while the growing urbanization has led to the diversion from the direct preservation that people held on the basis of caste and class 
there is still a certain practices there are still certain practices practices prevalent in the urban population that alludes to the discrimination on the basis of caste in most cases these are practiced as family norms without the individual even realizing the uh, the reason behind such norms the this is a major reason for Bengali population romanticizing the food practices of the poor under the will, willful watch of the greater forces. While the origin of the food is uh, conveniently neglected, the reformed version is, uh, is accepted by the uh, Bhadrano. This discussion on food, hence, helps us to look at both food and the social factors affecting it in a different light and analyze that which, which is on our plate. Thank you. Thank you so much for that extremely fascinating presentation. Our last speaker for the session is Saloni Terry of the Jindal School of Art and Architecture, presenting her paper, Mnemonic Camps of Indian Partition. Saloni, over to you. Hi, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Okay. Hi, I am Saloni Tehri from Jindal School of Art and Architecture, and today I'm going to be talking about mnemonic camps of Indian partition. So this paper was a part of my course called Politics of Space, where we were asked to um, discuss a subject where nation becomes a camp in the 21st century. But how does uh, camps of Indian partition are still living in the 21st century through memory? nostalgia and remembrance is what um, my research is all about because mnemonic is something that derives from remembrance and therefore mnemonic camps. Um, one second. Oh, just a second. Yeah. So uh, here I have used the code, time is a strange chemistry. There's a reason I've used it because the way that it depicts timelessness and how the essence of timelessness is there in the mnemonic camp because uh, it's been 74 years since independence but the memories and the trauma of the past is still very much floating around in 21st century first we wanted to forget because of the irreparable loss of the partition but then we also wanted to relive the time there was to have a hope to go back to what was lost and i will explain that later um, so this is a picture from Humayu's Tomb Refugee Camp in Delhi. And uh, it's a picture from 1947. And we all know that it doesn't exist anymore. The refugee camp, in a very physical sense, doesn't exist. But the mental fabric of, of these camps are still very much existing through memories. So my paper was, will essentially address the existing, existing presence of uh, Indian refugees through nostalgia and memory and how this has dictated the perspective of India towards Pakistan or towards a certain religious community. And I will explain that through Foucauldian theory of part, part on someone. And in order to exercise that part, you have to repopularize the human species. And for that, you have to create those subjects through enumeration. And during partition, that's what happened. The classification uh, based on religion was seen, and therefore enumeration through classification of religion, compartmentalization through religion. Um, but he says that rationalization could be dangerous. He says that when you are doing something over and over again, that it invokes a sense of normative action, something that becomes normalized, but to do that, you do tend to lose out a lot of details. So when the subjects are created, uh, when the subjects were created, I'm so sorry, rationalization of Hindu-Muslim conflict was seen, which essentially became a justification for the segregation um, of religion and the separation of Indian partition. And when the rationalization happened, it happened because of some power structures that were um, at play at that time. So governmentality is essentially government and rationality. And when you combine it, you can see governmentality. It is a political tool that you uh, that is practiced in the modern state where the population is allowed to conduct themselves. But in order to do so, there are other power structures that are um, in place. 
like even in democracy there are two power structures that Foucault uh, explains is sovereign mode of power and disciplinarian mode of power. Sovereign is something that comes through authorities and laws, but uh, disciplinarian is something that comes through constant surveillance, through panopticon. So how do we essentially conduct ourselves um, and how that power is imposed on us? When we know that we are constantly being surveilled, there is a conscious effort by us where we tend to behave a certain way. So essentially, the power is being imposed on us through a psychiatric manner, which is uh, what happened in the Indian partition of 1947. Um, the people were forced to um, be segregated um, in terms of the territorial sovereignty, and they had to migrate. But whatever efforts government made, they might not be very successful. Everybody. Uh, would not uh, accept it universally. They would not be happy about it. So that has, that, you know, it incites some sort of resistance, some sort of revolt, and of course, refusal. Uh, and therefore, these mnemonic camps of Indian partition, where, which is a space where refugees are still refugee in their mind, is sort of a resistance towards the cartographic uh, separation of the two nation theory. So it is a sort of a form of a counter conduct to um, defy that cartographic domination. And how biopower comes in role is biopower is biology and power. So how um, uh, it is sort of a way to create subjects, to produce subjects and to control those subjects, uh, you know, through controlling biological features of uh, uh, human species. Uh, which means a, a very basic example could be a tear gas or lati charge on people who are resisting uh, um, the power that is being imposed on them. So in that case, uh, how the government is uh, essentially manifesting the power uh, through controlling their bodies. And that's what we saw during Indian partition of 1947 when thousands of people were killed and kidnapped and uh, there was a um, tsunami of violence back then. I have also uh, considered Amrita Ghosh's article on uh, sleepwalkers by Joginder Paul. Joginder Paul published a book called Khwabru in Urdu, uh, which translates to sleepwalker, where he talks about uh, uh, Karachi in uh, Pakistan and how people there, the migrants, have essentially uh, constructed a simulacrum of pre partition Lucknow. So it's an imitation of the Mohajir, the, the, the streets of Lucknow, and how that space is functioned in Lucknow and how they have recreated that in Karachi itself. So Amrita Ghosh in her article, she demonstrates uh, the contemporary situation of those migrants, of those partition refugees, and how they're still trapped in a cage of nostalgia, how there's still a refugee in their state of mind, and which is why the term independence would be very much contested, could be very much debatable, uh, because the way that they have a dual existence, the psyche of the migrants have a duality because they're living in the present, but they're also living in the past through their memories. Uh, there's a liminality between reality and dreams. There's a liminality between borders and, of course, identity. Um, there are a uh, few projects in India who try to conserve those memories, who have a repository of partition uh, memories in form of oral histories uh, or in form of uh, partition artifacts. Uh, this is essentially um, in order to document and conserve that trauma. But why do we really need to conserve those traumatic memories? Why do we want to uh, see those alive even now? Uh, this is because how um, the attachment to the pre-partition times, it still exists. How uh, the act of not forgetting is a conscious effort to keep those memories alive in the hope that you would go back to the place that there was. Uh, so Partition Museum uh, and also 1947 Partition Archive, um, they... Um, make the effort to interview people and, you know, uh, let people share their personal anecdotes who were the partition survivors or who were really close to uh, the partition survivors. And here we can see how um, 
um, uh, Amrit Sethi, who was 17 when the partition happened, he says, even today, I think I will be going back. And if I could, I would want to go back. Uh, so the hope and the want for people to go back to what, uh, from where they come from, is essentially what what is making them um, live in that nostalgia, what is making them not uh, kill those memories. They want to keep those memories alive. Um, but while these kind of uh, mental camps can be thought of, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So while uh, this kind of uh, mental camp can be thought of as a space for the elderly who have been the partition survivors, it is not limited to their generation. Um, with the advent of, of younger generations who have more curiosity to question the house of the government, um, they have seemingly entered this mnemonic space, uh, irrespective of their no lived experience whatsoever. But mnemonic is essentially that comes from memories and since uh, the younger generation who doesn't have a memory of uh, a direct memory of the partition, how can they be a part of this camp? Um, so for instance, um, uh, the CANRC protest, in my opinion, um, I feel had a major presence of these camps because the way the population reacted and the way they countered the whole um, um, CANRC um, uh, law, um, the, uh, it was sort of that they entered this space to understand the root of enumeration in India. They entered this space to um, understand how that segregation, how that compartmentalized happened, compartmentalization happened, and how that rationalization came into play. And this is where all of this is budding from. Um, so to understand all of the roots of enumeration in India, these camps are still very much uh, prevalent to understand and to form other camps in the country. Um, but it is not a camp. Uh, since it is a very tangible camp, you cannot see it. You, it is not perceptible, but it can be felt. But for it to be able to, lab to, be, to be labeled as camp, there has to be some sort of surveillance going on, there has to be some sort of counterconduct going on. And how does that happen in mnemonic camps? Uh, for instance, like I gave the example of CNRC, how the people's Tyson was judged and how the crowd was controlled through odious uh, ways of oppression. And that's how uh, the people try to behave a certain way, but they're also keeping another space alive for themselves where they can create a home through memory. Um, and this is how these mnemonic camps uh, have contributed in making our nation a camp, even in the 21st century. And um, uh, some last few lines that I would like to quote uh, from my paper. If the harrowing partition and independence seemed any bright, then it was fringed with black. As implied by Manto in his book, Sia Hashai, literally meaning black fringe. The darkness behind India's independence still crawls um, in the nation, which makes it as a site of mnemonic camp uh, of partition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saloni, and all of our other presenters as well. Uh, we will now invite more questions from the audience as we. Uh, continue with as, as we start our question and answer session. Uh, the first question that we have from Professor Schmidt to Ria is uh, she would please, uh, uh, Professor Schmidt says, please show your evidence that the street named after the prince to appease the prince and not uh, and not out of the free will of the ruler of Bikaner who had a very good relationship with the British and on his own account commissioned British architects etc. Very often, post-colonial studies, largely from the West, promote the idea that every aesthetic or change was imposed by the British, failing to acknowledge the agency of, in of Indians. Um, hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, a very good question indeed. And I will have to agree with Professor that, indeed, most of my research was based off of uh, uh, British archives and other documentation that 
that is uh, influenced by the British as well. Uh, however, the only tentative evidence I can provide is the fact that before the arrival of the Prince Edward of Wales, the street existed as a dirt track and only when he was supposed to come were the structures commissioned. And it is possible that it was commissioned by the prince on by the ruler of Bikane on his account. However, there is no data to support either of this stuff. And most of the documentation is based off of oral history that has been narrated by the historians and archives of the uh, and the state archives of Rajasthan. All right. Uh, thank you, Ria. Um, our next uh, question is once again from Professor Smith, uh, this time to Tanisha. Um, she would uh, please explain the erosion between Muslims and Hindus as you've discussed it in your case study for Ahmedabad. Um, I'm sorry, but could you um, expand on what you mean by erosion exactly? Do you mean the er erosion of a certain kind of uh, ties between the two communities? Is that what? Hi, I, I just uh, I was just referring to your own phrase. You had one slide and it said uh, erosion between um, Hindus and Muslims, and then you went on to talk about the pilgrim. So I'd just like to know what happened before, really. Uh, I'm sorry, that must be my mistake on the slide. But yes, uh, thank you for asking that. Just to clarify, I, I think I meant that with the integration of the textile mills of the city, the mills were a place where the two communities would come together in um, spaces like labor unions, where they would um, uh, negotiate with the industrialists. But with the disintegration of the textiles and with, being, um, with the laborers being pushed into informal sectors, um, and places that they couldn't unionize, there was an erosion of the ties between the two communities. I hope that answers your question. Our, um, uh, thank you, Tanisha. Our next question is from Aloparna Senkupta to um, Shambhubi, Bhakti, and Anjori, and uh, Angelica's group. Uh, she says, Paramita Vora's short film on Mumbai, Cosmopolis, Two Tales of a City, brings out neighborhood discords among vegetarian and fish-eating residents, and also discusses how food, taste, and smell become deciding factors for communities in deciding their localities where they stay, and how they resist entry of other residents eating foods which do not agree with their cultural practices. In your research, could you find any such evidence in terms of taste, smell, and neighborhood organization? Also, are there uh, also there are many other movies which discuss similar cases in Delhi and other cities. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, uh, for us, for our research, we uh, use mostly uh, uh, books and things that we could find in uh, relation with Bengal. So, one of the main readings that we did uh, was Manfred Janeja's uh, transactions in taste. And it definitely discussed uh, this situation uh, from one uh, discussed one family, one household in Bangladesh and Muslim household in Bangladesh, and uh, how there were these uh, two domestic uh, helps who once uh, when the their mistress was outside, they cooked. Um, they wanted. They were remembering their uh, desh that we spoke about, and they cooked this meal of. I'm sorry for that. Uh, this uh, chilies. And then just when the mistress entered, she was so angry. She wanted to, uh, she said never to do this thing in a house. And, and as in, the, in the same case, when the person who was taking the interview, uh, she went and they, these two same maids, they prepared a glass of tamarind juice for uh, her. And the mistress got so angry because it was associated with uh, sexual deviance. And she suspected them to be lesbians and threw them out of the house. So it's like that, uh, it's like smell and uh, neighborhood association. It's so uh, integral, it, it, we overlook it often, but we find it everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, thank you, Angelica. We have another question for your group from Akshita Naglur. 
um does the marginalization of shutki translate into physical and geographical marginal marginalization of communities that primarily consume shutki thank you for the question uh to start with both yes and no it does lead to social marginalization and geographical marginalization too in the forms of there is a concept of jele para jele are the fishermen and para means a locality so there is a designated locality for the fishermen to reside in this has to do with the smell and uh, the fact that they do cook shutki and the taste of it however mar it is the con the complete marginalization is not possible because of a multiple reasons uh, like the partition the migration associated with it and the urbanization which leads to people to move across the state so it is not possible in that way but again it is possible uh thank you so much for the answer um another question we have from akshita this time for saloni is are there carceral built forms that aid in the camps of partition to still be vividly remembered even today in the psychological camps to come uh so uh, essentially it does akshita thank you for the amazing question and thank you for covering one part of the point that i might have missed uh, the carceral built forms um, and also the refugee camps that were there during the partition but now they might have um, you know uh, been dislocated or maybe destroyed but um, the essence of the time is still very much there for people who are act who were actually directly impacted by the partition so who were the migrants and who were the partition survivors um they still uh, can feel that the essence of that space and that time through um, the memories so uh, the whole idea of mnemonic camps is to have that sort of essence alive even though it is traumatic to conserve it as part of the heritage even though it was carceral built forms or the refugee camps so you can't see them but they're still very much vivid in your memory you're keeping it vivid through your nostalgia and i hope that answers your question um akshita yes yes it does thank you so much saloni thank you for asking um if i may like ask you a follow up like uh, saloni like taking from uh, what akshita asked and what you answered is um so clearly like the mnemonic camps are psychological camps right so um it deals with time and the effect that it has like on people and their memories but as time progresses what effect do you think like time has on the camps themselves like you can only keep memories vivid for so long um so that's how the younger generation comes in and when they enter this camp they are uh, consciously or unconsciously making an effort to keep those memories alive because it was not just some um partition that you would remember for a deca decade it was an intergenerational trauma it was something that is being passed on from generation to generation uh, in order to keep that essence and that hope if not hope but that essence alive to what life was before partition so um it is also a constant psychological effort from people to keep those memories alive and therefore the whole partition is still very much prevalent and still existing if that um, answers your question yes yes it does okay. thank you thank you um from professor aditya ghosh we have like a, a comment for saloni uh, similar cases in bengal as in punjab province also Uh, individual and collective memories and ideas of two nation, along with its representations in the literature, in literature and cinema, constitute a fascinating repository of that memory. So I feel like this also feeds into what um, I think I just asked of how these uh, memories are kept alive. Um, so I would like to uh, comment on that. So uh, the project that I showed, the 1947 Partition Archive. Uh, so they have essentially created a whole map. um of india and of pakistan and they invite people they interview people to share their anecdotal uh, uh, experiences as to from where they migrated and to where so you type in a city you say let's say kolkata 
somebody who migrated from Kolkata or migrated to Kolkata. And you can see a whole list of people who have shared their stories. So it is something that they're documenting uh, stories from around the country and how they are keeping, again, keeping the whole fabric of those camps alive, but in their memory. Thank you. Um, once again, from Professor Aditya Ghosh, but this time to Angelica and Anjuri and Shambhavi's group. Um, how is the cause of preservation and seasonality of food? Like, how is shootki different from, let's say, rice, which is also preserved in various forms? I would like to answer that. Thank you so much for the question. It's quite an uh, interesting one. So, when we talk about other food items like uh, rice, when it comes to preservation and seasonality, we kind of overlook the factor of the part partition that divided Bangladesh and West Bengal. So the reservation that is seen for shootki because of its pungency is not something that is seen for other uh, elements like rice. Like I said uh, while I was presenting that uh, the uh, resourcefulness and abundance of uh, food articles in one geographic location uh, kind of uh, decides for what would be the quote unquote staple food of, a, of any region. So the fact that the fishermen or the jailer, their profession was fishing and yet they couldn't afford to consume fresh fish and had to resort to preserved fish is the kind of economic uh, hierarchy, economic division that we can clearly see over here. And uh, the fact that rice is not looked at, at the same with the same uh, eyes is also something that's interesting because uh, it kind of shows how since the urban population also consumes rice and has no problem with it, there is no change in attitude towards that food article. Whereas shootki, which is uh, not something that was prevalent in urban, urban Kolkata or any kind of uh, city in West Bengal, uh, there is a kind of difference in attitude towards it. Uh, I hope that answers the question for you. Yeah, just to just to add to that uh, <clears throat> that response. Essentially, if you look at uh, Bengal and undivided Bengal province, you will see that uh, agriculture between agriculture and fishing, there's a caste hierarchy, and the caste hierarchy between the two actually tilts the balance towards more towards sort of a lower caste occupation as fishing or fishing as a lower caste occupation, whereas uh, let's say agriculture as a more higher caste. Uh, you know, occupation or uh, farming as a more higher caste kind of engagement. So that itself creates, I mean, actually supports your argument that you kind of propose and you can sort of probably try and see that everywhere that uh, the jailers who are fishermen largely, they are actually from the lower castes of the society, which is more vulnerable, who are more vulnerable, more risky as a kind of a vocation of, of their the, the fishing practices. So that also actually immediately creates that sort of distinction between the two kinds of food item, one which is produced on the field and consumed by the higher caste, as opposed to one which is consumed by the lower caste, essentially, and it sort of comes from a lower caste kind of a uh, profession, let's say. Now, if you see uh, most um, fish farmers, let's say most uh, fishermen would want to become uh, eventually farmers, but probably they are not able to for some reason or the other. So there's a, there's a huge and a very large cultural uh, sort of dynamics involved in this whole uh, uh, sort of uh, approach to food and how it was produced. So that's, that's one aspect you can also uh, sort of probably explore as the, the how caste gets attached to the food that you eat or that we eat actually eventually. Yes, of course. I think that's that's the that's what we were trying to conclude by this uh, presentation. Because when we explore the concept of caste in Bengal, we also have to take in consideration a huge vast field uh, of other things where the occupation becomes the caste of the people in Bengal. For example, muchi, muchi means cobbler. So that is a caste. The uh, word cobbler becomes a caste in our society. Mathor, it's a uh, mathor means janitor. So janitor is an occupation and yet it becomes a caste in our society. So that is a completely different uh, uh, view that 
kind of we can incorporate into what uh, we have already done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anjuri. Um, another question from uh, Professor Ghosh uh, to Saloni this time is that while that is wonderful work to capture oral histories as an institutional as opposed to individual or families, institutional process in different parts of the world, for example, like how is it different from post-war Europe? Um, so like he also mentions that memorials um, are one approach that has been tried, but not much in South Asia. Uh, and there is a, a very vast uh, context of politics attached to it as to why those memorials are not there. Uh, because also because of the kind of uh, memories that are attached to it. Um, I haven't really uh, delved much into it because my um, area of study was, very at, was at a very initial stage. Uh, but I really like how uh, he has connected it to post-war Europe. And thank you for that insight. And I'll definitely uh, would explore more into it. So yeah, thank you. Um, while we wait for more questions from the audience, I have uh, one question for Ria, which is, um, what is the social and economic demographic distribution uh, like in the inner city and in the suburbs? And could it be said that like the growing inequality between these two parts of the city is also a result of these differences? Uh, it certainly is. Uh, as I've mentioned, the migrant workers uh, are usually the people who came and took up the service, jo service jobs and took up government positions, uh, primarily from North Indian states as well, mostly. So what you learn from that is the government is controlled by the people who are living in the suburbs and not in the inner city. All right, all right, thank you. And um, another question that I have uh, this time for uh, Tanisha is uh, since you're talking about Ahmedabad and the kind of global cosmopolitan image that it is trying to build for itself. Um, how would you imagine that the wall which was built in Ahmedabad when the then president of the United States, Donald Trump, visited the city early, early in 2020, um, how would the wall and the permanence or the impermanence of that wall um, fit into this image that the city is trying to project? I think it's very much a part of the logic of the neoliberal city because it's trying to hide many of the inequalities within the city and it's trying to project it the city as a place um, which is uh, um, attractive to, a, to global capital and I think putting up the wall when Trump came was just another example of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I think uh, we have come to an end to the question and answer session, which also brings us to an end uh, to this panel today. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters for such an engaging session and, and also our audience for being such an enthusiastic bunch. Um, I had a lot of fun moderating the session and I hope all of our presenters had fun too. Um, Aditya, over to you. All right. Thank you, Anamika, and all the presenters for another incredible panel today. Uh, with this, we conclude the morning session for the third day of ICBE 2021. Uh, it has truly been quite wonderful listening to all the presenters so far in both the panels talk about their research and the work that they have shared with all of us today. Uh, I also thank the audience for your questions which have definitely led to some, you know, good um, discussion and dialogue. Uh, we will now take a break for lunch and return at 2 p.m. So that's about an hour uh, from now with the last two panels for the day titled Politics of Urban Phenomena and Processes Around Built Heritage. Uh, once again, I remind all of you to follow us on our social media platforms. Uh, for all updates regarding ICBE 2021, the links will be shared on the chat box. 
we will see you again at 2 p.m. to continue this engaging conversation and with the rest of the sessions. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for today's morning session. Uh, see you at 2 p.m. and take care.
Uh, hi, uh, Anirudh. I think uh, we've lost Kirti for a second. I think you can start with your paper. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. So hi everyone. So I'll start my presentation right now. So walls and floors. So these are spaces that we studied in architecture school as basic elements of design, basic elements of a building. And we've studied so many different types of walls and floors, like the parapets, partitions, and everything, and different types of floors, like platforms, based on terrain materials and structural floors and everything. And we make them, in, we focus on so much on designs of these walls and floors in architecture school. So we also learn that walls and floors are elements of designs that can define spaces. Like, for example, if you see the sketch, a wall or a floor can define a particular space from nothingness. And when we bring this to a public realm, bring this into public realm, we can see that public spaces are defined by walls and floors. And what these walls and floors are, are compound walls and platforms in public spaces. So compound walls are built by individual properties for privacy and separation, while platforms are built for people to walk on. So these, these two entities can actually mark or create uh, and help us identify the boundaries of public spaces. And here are some, uh, some examples of different designs of public walls and public spaces. Uh, for human activities like resting, walking, and so on. There is another activity that we might tend to, uh, to forget about when designing these spaces. So that is the urge to release. And the urge to release is what I'm gonna, what my presentation is on. So this is what I mean by the urge to release. Here you can see what I explained before in terms of a public uh, 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 floor that is made for people to walk on and a wall that is supposed to mark the edge of a, pub a public space. But something else is also happening there, that's the open urination culture. And that is my topic. So coming to what architecture means, here are just some examples of what architecture means according, according to many prominent figures. And if I simplify this, architecture is just the relationship between people and spaces. So if I'm going to redo the entire presentation from so on, we can see how the definition of walls and floors and everything that we studied changes because all the different ways you make them and uh, the, what they are intended for, what they are designed to do, everything is being affected by some by a public activity that we tend to disregard or tend to consider a subject of taboo. So this equation that I've shown that I'm showing here is what this dissertation is about. About why, if someone wants to urinate, a public a place like this, a wall and floor is equal to a, a urinal. In, and why does this happen? So another uh, con, uh, cons, uh, a parameter that I kept when I was researching everything is to look beyond just providing toilets because I didn't want to limit uh, the dissertation and I wanted to see why this happens more. And why is it only particular walls and why is it only a section of people when it comes to urinating in public spaces? And what is it about these walls that attracts them? So the, the dissertation that, uh, that I'm going to present is divided into four topics. So open, starting with the introduction of open urination and the problems that is caused by it and the people who cause it and the space that this happens on. And when dividing this topic further, uh, so here's how I've divided this topic uh, much further. And so if I'm gonna start explaining uh, everything, open urination is a human practice of, of urinating in the, in the open in, um, outside rather than into a, into a toilet. And there are three types of spaces that open urination happens in. One is highway roadsides, where the space is vast and open with, with a lot of nature around, that it's actually a, a less of a disturbance directly to public because of uh, less fre frequent pedestrian use of these areas. The second type is bushes, bushes and abandoned sites, because these areas have a very low visibility. Uh, these are preferred by a lot more women when um, urinating because of the privacy that this space offers. But at the same time, for the same reason, this space can also be a lot more dangerous. And the third category is footpaths and compound walls. And um, I've actually explained in the previous slides about what these spaces are. So why I've chosen these spaces, why I've chosen to focus on foot, footpaths and compound walls is because these spaces are always in dense urban areas where a uh, lot of public activity happens, but the comfort and pub, um, comfort and uh, normal functioning of this of these intended activities are being disturbed because of this culture. 
and what disturbance that, that's what um, this slide is trying to show so there are i've divided this in, divided this into two topics one is to the urban space and another to um, as the problems to the city so the urban space refers to the sensory impact like the dense the the strong stench of uh, urination and the dampness of the area that also causes a problem to the functioning of the space like the images that have shown above you can see that the people are actually walking beside the footpath that's being provided because of the thick stench that is there they're ready to risk um, to to be closer to the risk of all these uh, high traffic areas rather than using the space that's provided to them because of the thick stench that is existing there and <clears throat> excuse me and um, I couldn't even stand up for five minutes when taking this picture. But another another side of this issue is the problem through the city. So in uh, by problem through the city, I'm talking about a management side of things. So the high cleaning costs that the city is faced and the very unhygienic and um, degrading jobs that are created for um, controlling open urination and cleaning open urination. And the second problem that uh, the city and uh, economy faces is the lack of women empowerment. And the, um, this is very nicely some, uh, written by one uh, by Adam Eldridge, Mr. Adam Eldridge, in his document uh, or research paper that he wrote called Public Panics, Panics. He describes this phenomenon being tolerated as a masculinization of public space. So when studying more about this topic, I, um, I had to look into why people urinate, first of all. So there are three types of urinators. So there are uh, one research calls uh, divided, uh, summarized these uh, categories into three topics, which is homelessness, incontinent, and the nightlife. Homelessness is act, um, basically people who are not able to afford to go to restaurants or malls for uh, urine, uh, using their restrooms. And another uh, another uh, uh, thing about home, uh, the homeless category is that they are marginalized people. This can, in an, in an Indian context, this can also pe mean people who are uh, subject to caste based issues. Incontinent category actually refers to people with low bladder control where they have no choice and they have very short span of time before they uh, to release um, their urge to urinate, uh, to release their urine. So these uh, commonly the, these uh, the incontinent people in society would be children and elderly people or people diagnosed with lower urinary tract disease. Then, then the third cat, uh, category is the nightlife. So nightlife has two reasons. One is that public um, spaces are normally closed, like uh, public infrastructure, like a lot of buildings and um, uh, um, urban infrastructure would be closed for uh, for their restrooms, you know, for people to use their restrooms. And restaurants also and malls will also be closed that people cannot access these spaces for urinating. Another thing is low visibility. So there are many researches that actually outline about how people tend to behave differently when they feel like they're not being watched. And that is what uh, this third category is trying to show about how, how people would urinate in public when they're not, when they feel like they're not being watched. Um, urinate in the open when they feel like they're not being watched. So the, the second thing that I focus when I'm looking at urinators is the restroom provision, because this is a very common reason for that people say it when they talk about open urination. So one topic, one thing about um, open urination is the availability of public toilets. And the Swatch Bharat scheme is a very interesting case study that I, that I did for this uh, topic, where a, lo a very bold state uh, goal was, uh, objective was created to completely stop or eradicate open defecation. And for doing so, there was a lot of toilets that were built all across the country. But at, at, uh, the promise that was given was not completely achieved because uh, of the hygiene of these restrooms. So while a lot of toilets were actually built, the problem was that a lot of uh, very less focus was given to the maintenance of these toilets. So that is another thing that people that we, we learned that it's not only the availability of toilets, but toilets, but it's also the hygiene and the culture around um, restrooms is also another thing that we should look at because it's important to educate people about the proper use of toilets when designing them so that they know how to use it in the right way and how to maintain it in the right way and also educate, uh, educating people about so that we have less of a caste, less caste based issues in the country. And when studying about to public toilets and open urination, there are a lot of articles that support the statement that caste based issues exist prominently in um, when looking at open urination. 
And again, looking at the urinators, there is, uh, I want to study more closely about the anthropology of open urination and one, and starting with the animals. So animals use open urination as a form of commun, I mean, as, op, animals use urination, urine as a form of communication. And, uh, and uh, the civilization, uh, in the early stage of civilizations, uh, defecation spaces were normally social spaces. And this brings up a question about why is it considered a very uh, subject of taboo and why is there a lot of disgust with it? And this, when studying about it, I, did, uh, I came across this fact that the disgust around open urination came with the 19th century uh, with, with new learnings in the 19th century about hygiene and sanitation. And genetic, genetically, the bladders were developed or evolved in uh, human beings and animals so that they can voluntarily release urine rather than creating a trail for predators to follow. So then another topic uh, when you're looking at the urinators is the mentality and this basically the sex sexism that exists in open urination. So the four prominent points that I came across when studying this was the female bladder is much smaller and thin walled, this, which means that they need to release urine a lot more often, but it's not seen. I mean, that's not, they're not the reasons for public walls to be affected by this phenomenon. And uh, women are being cautious about consumption when outside, whereas, um, and that causes them to face more incontinence in the future as they, uh, as they reach, uh, as they gr uh, grow older. Um, and that's not, that's actually a, a very sexist culture that, uh, that is being tolerated. And um, the artists and canvas theories about how men, because of their gen uh, genetic uh, way of use, using the, uh, their penis to urinate, tend to look at the, a wall as a canvas and they, uh, they feel um, that's a, they're used to looking at uh, what they urinate on. And uh, the fourth point is about the advantage, the male genetic advantage of hiding behind, uh, turning around, I mean, looking, facing a wall and hiding all, hiding the uh, private genitals of urinate, urinating. Then the fourth thing, uh, the fourth category of my, the fourth section of my uh, dissertation, which is the spaces. So I was looking at two types of spaces. One is the regularly urinated spaces and the spaces that were, um, uh, that urination has been stopped at. So when looking at privately urinated spaces, I was, I mean, regularly urinated spaces, I look, I, was, I outlined some characteristics. For example, if you see the fourth image, there, um, there's a very uh, densely, a very um, highly used space on the right side, whereas on the left side, there's a car, a car park is blocking the public, space, uh, the footpath. This can be a reason why people urinate there. So, uh, and lo when looking at um, space uh, interventions that are done for stopping urination, there are six categories that I came up with uh, from a survey that I did. Basically, there are, um, there's been, uh, sorry, not from survey that I did, but from researches that I did. And there are six categories of interventions. One is art to rejuvenate, which is visually pleasing, art to provoke, which will uh, impact a person who's urinating, and religious signs that is used a lot more in India because of the uh, religious values that India, high, uh, high religious values that India has. And mirrors, which is, a, uh, which is trying to break the privacy that men have when they uh, pee against a wall. And water repellent paint, which can like uh, bounce back the urine that's going on the wall and stop a person from urinating because of the urine falling back on him. And the sixth category is providing urinals. And this, this kind of intervention is looking at the problem as a need for design rather than a problem that's caused to society. And for this, they design composted toilets that uh, composted urinals within the public spaces. And so for this dissertation, I have used a bunch of, uh, uh, um, a lot of documents and case studies and uh, e-surveys for getting, coming up with all the statements that I've said so far. And um, so this is this is a basic outline of the entire dissertation. So the urge to release is made to bring awareness, reduce ignorance, and elaborate to be a handbook to understand the op op open urination phenomena. So that when in the future, when people are designing these spaces, they consider this with a lot more importance, with a lot more understanding of this culture. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anirudh. That was a great presentation. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Yes, thank you. Um, next, next up, I invite Ruju Hirin Joshi from SEPT University in Ahmedabad in India to present her paper titled 
tracing liminal spaces, understanding the fundamental nature of urban thresholds. Over to you, Ruju. Um, hi. Hi. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Yes, yes, we can see your screen. And I'm audible, right? Yes, you're on. Okay, just give okay. me a moment and I'll start here. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roju Joshi and I'm an urban designer. I recently graduated from CEPT, as you mentioned already. Uh, and we are the first proud batch of undergrad urban designers of India. And uh, I'm really happy about it. And I'm also grateful for this platform for giving me the opportunity to share my undergrad research with the fraternity. Um, so my research explores a range of liminal spaces in various urban conditions. And I'll be walking you through the entire process briefly in my presentation. I'm sorry, I'll just go to the presentation mode. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to start with a quote from Jane Jacobs, when she emphasizes the importance of clearly demarcating public and private realms in the city in order to achieve a well-used street. But uh, it is a little controversial because clearly demarcating spaces with strong physical characteristics often create segregating zones, resulting in an exclusive and restrictive environment for people in the public realm, and which is in a way also promoting privatization. So when we think of a private space in the context of a city, it is a space with definite orders and specific purpose, with predefined functionalities. Whereas if we think of a public space, it can be perceived as a means for people to engage with the city. It is a space without any predefined functionalities, a space that allows negotiations and also offers a chance to loiter in the city. And so this binary of public-private uh, comes from a larger city-making uh, process that follows a strict top-down approach and it includes large-scale long-term development plans which are further translated into relatively smaller scale town planning schemes or local area plans for implementation purposes and it is these strategies that begin to create the divide of public and private zones through designated plots and streets which are further regulated by building and public space regulations so when we look at the different kinds of public spaces available in a city there are very limited types which we can really identify, such as uh, riverfronts or lakes or parks and streets. However, these spaces are also limited with the possibilities of predefined uh, practices of people that they allow. So to further substantiate the hypothesis, according to a UN Habitats report, uh, 45 to 50 percent of a city's land area should be counted as a public space with specific proportions from streets and open spaces which in case of Ahmedabad is only limited to 0.28%. Additionally, according to UDRBFI and WHO guidelines, per person open space should fall within 8 to 10 square meters, which again in case of Ahmedabad is uh, restricted only to 0.37 square meters. So there's a clear lack of easily accessible public open spaces in the city. And so considering the street as the first public realm of the city and also the means often for transition. It is intriguing to start thinking about the variety of interfaces created between the street and the immediate pr uh, private realm that can eventually be considered as an added everyday use public space. There exists a phenomenon of condition, especially in Indian context between the two zones, which is organic, uh, and it is often termed as chaotic, temporary, or informal. And this phenomenon induces the notion of territoriality for security purposes. However, these conditions characterize the identity of our cities. And so it is very important to question and understand the complexities and fundamental nature of this interface in order to achieve an interactive space, a third space uh, that straddles between the public and the private, and as a space of negotiation through which the binary of this public and private can be dissolved. There are I'm sorry, it's not changing, sorry. Uh-oh, I don't know what's wrong. Yeah, sorry. Um, so there are these other binaries as well uh, through which we can look at uh, the interface between the public and the private realms. And, but again, these, these binaries are also limiting in terms of uh, their observations because they are very specific and focused on particular social, spatial, or political conditions. 
which brings us to the lens of this research, which is liminality. Liminality is a temporary condition that gives an opportunity to question the set binaries of how we look at city. This lens provides a way to construct a framework that can be used to trace liminal spaces in the life of a city at various scales and times. Liminal spaces are important to be observed, analyzed, and acknowledged for its spontaneity and unstructured nature because they dissolve multiple binaries within their ambiguous nature and encourage our cities to become vibrant and chaotic as they are. Downing interprets the physical adaptation of the concepts of liminality through identifying the interface as limis or limin, which is the boundary or the threshold. Boundaries are generally perceived as a visual, physical, and notional end of space where certain practices can or cannot be performed, whereas the threshold is a potential third space where the social hierarchies and customs are dissolved. So the research identifies a boundary and a threshold as individual entities and raises the question on specific conditions under which the boundary can be transformed into a threshold. In order to answer this question, the research aims to trace liminal spaces between public-private realms, and the objectives are to explore the relationship of each with the respective zones. The scope of this research is to establish a framework that recognizes and analyzes various interfaces to further apply the framework to three distinctly identified cases from the city of Ahmedabad. The limitations include time constraints and limitations raised due to COVID situation, exploration of this framework only within the scope of this study, specific unit of study at street scale, and subjectivity of the framework to change with different land uses. The sites are strategically chosen to understand multiple built fabrics, building typologies, and regulations. The old city does not have any strong physical boundaries, whereas the new development has strict physical boundaries, demarcating the public and private zones exclusively. And the urban-rural interface is a mix of both old and new. The methodology follows literature review, content analysis, and independent as well as comparative analysis. The framework takes different direct and indirect definitions of liminality from Genep, Victor Turner, Bhava, Stevens, Downey, and identifies the important and relevant terminologies such as ambiguity, transformation, temporality, hierarchy from each of them through which it defines the parameters of the framework. The framework is divided into two specific sets of parameters and attributes, where the parameters are intangible conceptual ideas, whereas the attributes are tools, measurable tools, to identify each parameter in various urban conditions at a particular point in time and over the period of time. I'll be briefly explaining each of them through the site analysis. The first parameter, temporality, is related to time and constant change of space, which is also volatile with its frame of reference. This case from Old City of Ahmedabad depicts the temporal use of space through various necessary occasional and social practices. Of people. The building corridor here becomes a liminal space between the street and the building as it is, uh, as it is used for uh, many activities throughout the day like playing or resting or working, waiting, sitting around, just hanging out, relaxing, sleeping, etc. But at the same time, if we change the frame of reference and look at the threshold as an interface between two buildings, then both the street and the building corridor become highly liminal spaces as the practices on streets, such as meeting people, vending, feeding cows, drying clothes, parking, and so on, they use the building as a backdrop, and the absence of strict physical boundary allows possibilities of chance encounters and passive interactions. The next parameter, ambiguity, is about various choices and negotiations that are allowed by dissolving binaries and specificities of the interface. In this case from South Bhopal, the interface is used for food and vegetable vending throughout the day. And the absence of strict physical boundary outside an empty government plot brings out the possibility of the interface becoming an interactive space for the neighborhood throughout the day uh, because of its dissolved binaries. Another parameter of transformation is related to change or development of any space over time. Here, through these examples of different sites, transformation is observed at neighborhood scale in the city development process. And the sites are developed in three different zones with different social spatial aspects in three different time periods of 1800s, 1900s, and 2000s. The last parameter of hierarchy depicts the relationship and degree of influence of various groups on one another. They are formed to create specific codes of conduct within the society. 
And the space from South Bhopal demonstrates one such example, which does not have any strict physical boundaries, but the hierarchy and power structure create the notional boundaries that limit the occasional and social practices in the public realm. And the interface is majorly used as parking uh, and for necessary practices such as accessing the building or walking by the building to reach somewhere. Coming to the attributes, scale is a measure that helps identify the overall relationship of a smaller component with its larger component. And the study focuses on street scale for detailed analysis. Another very important attribute is regulations that are to identify and understand the negotiations that happen to suppress the act of subversion. Regulations play a major role in defining the scope of a liminal space in the city. And the study uh, refers to various building and public space regulations in order to understand the negotiations uh, in each case. Uh, another attribute is the physical characteristics that are the unique qualities of a particular space. The framework uses specific sets of components defined by Kim Davi to analyze the public private interface. And last and one of the most important attributes is the practices of people that are that, that, that define the social characteristics of a space. The framework uses three major categories identified by young girls that are the necessary occasional and social practices. These practices are observed across cases to identify multiple parameters in each case. Occasional and social practices in Kalapur are relatively higher in number, even though they do not abide by the regulations because the practices are deeply embedded within the everyday city life. Whereas similar practices in Vastrapur and South Bhopal are more, more vulnerable as they are being performed in relatively strict environment with strongly enforced regulations. And they are also threatened to be removed or replaced anytime by the government in the ongoing process of transformation. So with a detailed study of uh, multiple different cases and their comparative analysis, it is clearly identified that in Indian context, both occasional and social practices require equal amount of high quality physical characteristics that are driven by both building and public space regulations. And so the research identifies regulations as one of the most crucial attributes of the framework that decides the scope of a liminal space in the city. The impacts of regularization on the interface between public private realms during the transformation processes affect the nuances of the same because they are completely vanished when the space is regularized or privatized. These are two contrasting uh, examples where uh, the case from Vastrapur, which is on the left, showcases that the impacts of imposed regulations where the buildings are cut to accommodate the expanded street on the fabric of an old village. But despite the imposition, the essence of the old is still retained through their everyday continued uh, practices of people. And whereas in uh, the recent development case from South Bhopal, which is on the right, showcases designated and defined use of a highly regulated space, restricting the access and practices to just parking. These are two another very distinct cases of uh, from Kalupur and South Bhopal, where one is used dynamically throughout the day with various practices such as vending, meeting people, walking, waiting, resting, playing, parking, etc. And the practices here defy the regulations and the act of subversion brings out the social character of the space with no strict physical boundaries between the public and the private. Whereas the other case is strictly regulated with same building and public space regulations, but with stronger enforcement. So the interface here is identified through very limited activities such as parking, walking, or sitting in designated spaces. And clearly demarcating physical boundaries limit the interaction between the public and the private, making them completely exclusive. So the research concludes the question of a boundary transforming into a threshold by identifying boundary as a subset of threshold in very specific liminal conditions. It is the practices of people, ease of regulations, possible negotiations between public private realms and supporting high quality physical environments that defines the otherwise use of a boundary. And it is the lens of liminality that allows to observe these possibilities of an interface by dissolving the binary of public and private. Also, liminal spaces are temporary yet permanent because conceptually they keep moving and accommodating themselves in multiple similar con uh, contexts within the city over time. And these three sites are a strong reflection of the same. So within the process of urbanization, the city can be identified as liminal, which holds immense potential of retaining liminal spaces at multiple scales through possible negotiations. Because the spontaneity of these spaces characterize the chaos of our cities that should be acknowledged and preserved. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruju. That was a very insightful presentation. You can stop sharing your screen. Um, so this is a reminder for the audience to put their questions on the chat box. Now uh, we have the paper title, St Statistical and Perception Analysis of Urbanization and Crime Nexus in India, which is co-authored and presented by Upasana Patkiri and Kripa Thomas from School of Planning and Architecture in Bhopal in India. Over to you both. Uh, I hope I'm audible and the screen is visible. Yes. Just a second. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, one and all present here. I hope you are in all good health and enjoying the conference. As Kirti introduced, uh, today I, Kripa Thomas, along with my co-author, Pascal Parkiri, from the School of Planning and Architecture of Bhopal, will be presenting our research titled Statistical and Perception Analysis of Urbanization and Crime Nexus in India in association with built environment. We'll be briefly speaking on the research introduction, its scope, objectives, and methodology followed, the reviewed literature and concepts, our uh, results, and finally the conclusion of our study. The crime index for countries in 2021 shows that India is comparatively safer than South American and South African countries, yet on the path of increasing criminal offenses. This surge in crime and violence in the country is attributable to a huge population of about 1.3 billion people combined with dwindling uh, employment opportunities. This very relatedness of crime with urbanization and the built environment was brought to light to us in the demography lectures of our first semester, which intrigued us enough to subject our research paper on this topic. Certain key points noted in the initial stage of the research included that the transformation of a primitive agrarian society to a commercial and industrial estate has brought significant changes in criminal uh, has brought significant changes in criminal offenses. The concept of urbanization and its role in transformation of the built environment and relocation of spatial distribution of population and that remarkable growth is achieved at the cost of increasing urban equality, uh, urban inequality. We learned the evolution of built environment from the early human settlements, which is studied as acoustics, and the people forming enclaves to live close by for security purposes. And in the 1990s, that brought the LPG era and neoliberalization, where high rise apartments came into mainstream development, thereby increasing crime in India. Uh, the scope of the study extends to analyzing the very relationship between increasing urbanization and crime rates in the context of India through interpretation of available statistical data and the perception of different ages and genders on how urbanization affects crime. It, is, uh, it further briefly discusses a few solutions to urban crime. So to carry out the study, four major characteristics were outlined, them being uh, to find out the state-wise statistics for India, such as percentage of urban population, employment rates, and crime rates, uh, then to determine the impact of urbanization and its associated uh, effects, such as employment rate on crime in the country, then to understand the perception of the general public on how urbanization affects crime, and uh, lastly, to explore tools and theories of urban planning, which provide possible solutions for reducing crime with respect to built environment-related intervention. Uh, some factors that existed as limitations for the study were firstly that uh, the most recent census data available is from 2011, which may not be a correct representation of the current uh, present population of the country. Uh, second and lastly, uh, considering the pandemic situation, the primary survey had to be conducted online with the scope of the poll being limited mostly to our known ones. Moving on to the methodology and data sources, uh, both primary and secondary sources of data played a vital role in this study. Uh, primary data was collected uh, through a survey of 200 people conducted via Google Forms questionnaire. The respondents, as mentioned, were of different ages, genders, and were urban as well as rural residents. The statistics of uh, which are sh have been sh uh, shared here. Books, research papers, journals, news articles, etc., have uh, served as the main source of theoretical information, while the statistical uh, data, such as population density, employment rate, crime rate, etc., was collected from Census of India and the National uh, Crime Records Bureau websites. The methodology followed in a, uh, consisted of uh, collecting the data from the mentioned sources, processing the data to derive the required information, along with reviewing existing literature on the subject. Uh, which was followed by analysis of the data to obtain the results. As a part of the analysis, uh, maps, choropleth maps were created using GIS to picturize the Indian scenario better. 
the prominent literary works and theories relating to urbanization and crime reviewed for this study are shown here. The Jane Jacobs in 1961 wrote The Death and Life of Great American uh, Cities, which was the first influential work to introduce the emergence, evolution, and the dissolution of cities, suggesting that active street life reduces the opportunities for crime. She focused on the role of the residents as eyes on the street, which contributed to maintaining the social control. Inspired by Jane's research, Oscar Newman in 1973 published a book, Defensible Space, Crime Prevention Through Urban Design. He explained that people feel more connected to their community and take more responsibility when they have a sense of ownership over it. High population density means the residents in high rises have a weaker sense of community and they feel irresponsible for any shared uh, common public space. The broken windows theory given by uh, Wilson and uh, Kellingen in 1982, referred to as the Bible of policing, states that the visible signs of crime create an urban environment that encourages further crime and disorder, including serious crimes, under the impression that trivial uh, misconducts like the broken windows when left unfixed leads to more serious problems, which lowers the residents' perception about the neighborhood. The relation between crime and development of the discourse is often linked with a newer um, concept of neoliberalization given by Omei in uh, 2018. Neoliberalization transforms the exceptional violence into the uh, exemplary violence. It becomes routinized, quotidian, ordinary, and banal as a result of this process, increasing the level of fear of criminal incidents in large cities and urban agglomerations. Uh, as seen in the graph, approximately 28% of the overall committed crimes can be explained as, the, uh, as an effect of higher pecuniary benefits of crimes uh, like theft and burglary. Almost 20% of the uh, urban crime effect is described by character, characteristics of urban life like lower arrest possibilities. The remaining 45 to 60 percent of the effect has been associated with observable and evident features of inhabitants and cities reflecting their space, the social uh, influences and their family structure. A country's future is largely determined by the spatial distribution of its people, which is mostly dictated by urbanization. According to uh, the census data of 2011, 31% of India's population lives in urban areas, which is home to more than half of the world's population. And the UN expects that the proportion to rise uh, by 416 million between 2018 to 2015, which is mostly as a result of people moving to cities in pursuit of work and better prospects. So uh, maps were created as a part of uh, statistical data analysis to evaluate the relationship of crime uh, of crime rate with population density, urban population, and the employment rate, uh, which have been used to draw further conclusions. The statewide comparison of crime statistics for 2011 and 2019 shows a spatial juxtaposition between the metropolitan and exurban areas with citified cities experiencing more crimes than the underdeveloped ones. The graph shows the rates that, have, uh, that the rates have not undergone many major changes, except for Delhi, where the rates have escalated by around five times. Most of the union territories manifest evidences of decrease in crime rate, which can be attributed to a lower levels of urbanization and population. The summarized results, that is the highest and the lowest two states for each category, were tabulated to draw further conclusions. The uh, results of the primary survey uh, showed expected as well as unexpected outcomes. A uh, majority of the people agreed that urbanization does affect crime rates, though many of them were of the opinion that urbanization leads to a decrease in crime. A majority of the respondents also chose cities to be safer compared to villages or the suburbs. However, on the contrary, out of all the crimes that were ex experienced by the respondents, 96% of them had occurred in urban areas and a mere 4% in rural. Even for the village residents who have had been victim of any crime, 78% of them have taken place in an urban area. So the discussed observations lead to the conclusion of our study. Moving on, uh, the th uh, uh, the theoretic, uh, this theoretical and perception-based study supports that the built environment plays a role in, in inducing or hindering crime. 
An increase in urbanization leads to a decrease in informal social control, causing increased disorder leading to crime. Indian states like New Delhi and Kerala are prime examples of regions where high crime rates are directly related to high population density, urbanization, and low employment. A tremendous influx of people entering Delhi every year causes the population density to expand, making it a crime hotspot. Uh, the city is landlocked and, and shares a border with Haryana and Uttar Pradesh, making it easier for criminals to get out of the uh, get out from the confines of the city. And the, the 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 built environment of metropolitan cities like New Delhi is a perfect example of an urban concrete jungle where people live in a milieu of disconnect and anonymity, leading to a lack of individual identity, serving as an incentive for the crimes to take place. However, this direct proportionality is not true for all Indian states, as uh, in some states like Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh have a high crime rate despite having a comparatively lower urban population and higher employment rate. So urbanization, though considered as a tipping point for the creation of new crimes and amplification of the existing ones, may not necessarily be the sole factor as seen in these cases. In India, uh, India uh, in the post neoliberalization era has seen rapid urbanization and increase in crime, but this proportional, proportionality between the two is not yet universal or exponential. Also, the, another fascinating observation was to discover from the primary survey that despite personal experiences regarding cities being unsafe, some, uh, some of the city residents do not believe that urbanization has a detrimental impact on crime, which could be attributed to the fact that these in, uh, individuals feel secure in the setting where they have lived their entire lives. The urban built environment is often more desirable for economic prosperity and well planned interventions can make it safer for sustainable development of vibrant communities. So this brings us to a few examples of urban planning tools that can help reduce crime, uh, such as uh, these may be uh, like um, crime prevention through environmental design accepted, which is an approach of site design based on Jean Jacobs philosophy of eyes on the street. Its simple principles can be used to create safer and attractive uh, spaces. The UN Habitat, the United Nations Agency, Agency for Human Settlements, has also provided principles of site design that increase prospects for people to observe their surroundings through street widening programs and the creation of new housing or commercial development. The desired safety and security in urban areas can be achieved by promoting mixed land use and forming more public spaces that generate opportunities for positive social interactions and most importantly, increase the footfall of an area. These concepts can form the subject and be elucidated in further studies conducted in this domain. Next, here are some uh, references that were used for the study. Um, with this, we come to the end of our presentation. We are very grateful for having been provided this opportunity and for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Upasana and Kripa. Last presentation of the day will be by Kimberly M. Rickwillman and Noel S. San Pasquil from the Department of Architecture at Polytechnic University of the Philippines, discussing their paper titled, An Analysis of the Advantages and Disadvantages of Vertical Housing in this Time of Ever-Narrowing Spaces in Areas of Manila. Over to you both. Uh, am I audible and can you see my screen? Yes, you're audible. Can see your screen as well. Thank you. Okay. So, so good day, everyone, and who are here today, and to the viewers who are watching. I'm Kimberly Rickelman, the presenter of our research entitled An Analysis of the Advantage and disadvantages of vertical housing in this time of ever narrowing spaces in areas of Tondo Malina. I am a third year bachelor student from Polytechnic University of the Philippines. In our ever narrowing world, the infrastructure increases and the land areas are gradually decreasing. Sometimes people are not aware of this situation when the only thing that they are aware of is how they can live their everyday life. However, professionals and authorities seek for solutions that can solve the problem before it gets worse. There are solutions that were created to maximize and efficiently use the areas where buildings have been constructed. Some of those are constructing of vertical houses and reusing an existing building for a purpose. Let me give you first a definition of what vertical housing and adaptive use are. 
generally the basic concept of vertical housing policy is to put people who usually come from landed condition into vertical experience. In short, a vertical city is an entire human habitat contained in a massive skyscraper. Vertical cities hold the key to solving overpopulation and overcrowding. In a vertical city, people could live, work, and go to school without leaving the area. Plus, it also holds the key to preserving natural resources. Adaptive reuse is a process of repurposing buildings for viable new uses and modern functions other than those originally intended to address present day needs instead of placing of constructing structures on a vacant land. Using adaptive reuse could preserve the infrastructure without destroying it and could also keep from building on a new land. Manila is one of the most populated and busiest cities in the Philippines. There are tons of people living and working in Manila where houses and offices are constructed. According to the 2010 census, Manila is an exceptionally urbanized city in the public capital area. Among the 14 areas that make up the city of Manila, Tondo is the most crowded locale with a population of 38% of the city's complete populace with a census assessed 631,000 individuals in 2015 and comprises of two legislative regions. It is likewise the second most likely populated region in the city. Manila is intensely occupied and was the world's most thickly populated city legitimately starting in 2019. During the United States control over the Philippines in the 1930s, the city began to develop public housing. Lack of access to land and houses in metropolitan areas has led to the growth of squatter colonies and on both public and private properties. In the Tondo area of Manila, along part of the boardwalk, slums stretch for miles, and if government programs are not very successful, the area and other slums could get much worse. Tondo is a collection of temporary housing units constructed on a dump site and is known as one of the worst slums in the country. So the purpose of this study is to identify the benefits and drawbacks of vertical housing, specifically in the Tondo district of Manila, and how it could be an effective solution to the problem of ever narrowing spaces and the increase in the population. So the methodology will relies on the data collection regarding the problem of Tondo, and this data and information will serve as a basis on analyzing the purpose of the research. So in 1940s, the government of the Commonwealth of the Philippines reclaimed over 100 hectares of Manila in the Gulf for development as part of the Manila Port Complex, which include an international port, an inter-island port, and a fishing port. The acquisition sites are limited to Manila's inter-island port, known as North Harbor, Private Lands, and Pasig and Vitas River. Immediately after the Great Patriotic War, settlers from the provinces found the area of restoration, although it was completely unsuitable and debilitated for settlement as a convenient foothold in the city. In 1946 and throughout the 1950s, as the fledging Republic of the Philippines could not afford to develop the proposed port complex and did not have the foresight to guard the area, the site quickly became a refuge to fugitives, although it lacked roads, necessities, and public service. By the late 1960s, it had become an overcrowded slum, home to about 27,000 families or about 180,000 people spread over 137 hectares of land. That is, 2,000 of them that had lived to a one hectare clone in shock or here's about 12 square meters of space. The increase in the ever-growing range of Tondo squatter household can be traced to numerous reasons. Further, foremost, Squatters and slum sellers keep in mind their present existence that their former situation. They consider that land they illegally occupy as their own and they're a city where they do not need to pay rent or taxes, therefore they do not want to leave the area. As the population grows further in the areas of Tondo, it equates to the increase of land occupation which results in life scarcity. So confronted with a three-prong issue, meaning that is squatter discovery in the ghetto condition satisfactory, 
the exasperating impacts of the unload to the financial yields of Metropolitan Manila and the hindrances to migrant capital stances to the execution of public foundation pro projects, the Philippine government, in an emotional presentation of empathy and altruism, sustenance, uh, pick up complete nearby, nearby redesigning and improvement conspire that coordinates well being, sustenance, schooling, and other social help upgrades with actual enhancements in transportation, sewerage, and waste and lodging. The fundamental arrangement of the plan focused on the base removal of families from the test site. This was the option in contrast to the huge migration of squatter. So in line with the policy, the Philippine government has identified the following key components of the Tondo Manila. So land improvement of 180 hectares with a population of about 160,000 people living in 15,000 buildings, provision of basic urban infrastructures and housing units, health, education, and social services, other benefits, materials for housing improvements, and loans for the home-based industry. About 1,000 new services, um, main plots and units on bare land, and about 15 hectares of industrial and commercial land. So one of the few projects currently being done is the Condominium 1 and 2 by Manila Mayor Scomboreno in his first in-city vertical housing project under the Build Build Manila program. The goal of the project is to put an end to the agony of those living in the middle of the streets, highway, and bricks. The Condominium 1 and 2 will have 15 stories each and will be able to accommodate 336 families. Each unit has two bedrooms with an area of 44 square meters and expected to be done by year 2022. So vertical cities are gaining popularity as a solution to overcrowding because they may provide high levels of comfort at low energy costs, which is good for both finances and the environment. However, not everyone is passionate about the concept of vertical cities. Some people believe that these structures cause more problems than they solve. Vertical housing has several advantages, one of which is that it meets the needs of an already huge population in the built environment. And because of the shift to development programs, renovating and additional recreation of existing urban areas has gotten simpler. Automobile fuel costs and fuel energy consumptions are significantly reduced, resulting in a lesser air population. Municipal operations will be available around the clock a day, seven days a week, resulting in more job opportunities and public participation in comments, maintenance, and supervision. So resources are better utilized and services are better regulated thanks to automation and connected systems. Building upwards rather than outwards allows us to accommodate many people in the smallest space while protecting the land and natural resources. The land can be used for food, entertainment, or natural resource extraction, or it can be protected as a natural area. These structures can make it easier for people to socialize and visit friends in shared spaces, thereby promoting social inclusion. Many informal settlements in Tondo are located on public land along river banks and along railway lines, and some are located in parks, uh, playgrounds, and cemeteries. Since, so, um, I mean, since informal slum settlements are usually located in the least popular places and have no urban infrastructures, people living there are most vulnerable to floods and other natural disasters. Relocating these informal settlers in vertical cities provided by the government will reduce further problems and harm to the people living in the area. In addition, it will lessen dangerous places and bring safer and more affordable environment. Despite having an advantage, there are still consequences, limitations, and undesirable outcome in building vertical cities. One criticism is that they would make cities less livable 
by limiting people spend time outdoor since people would not need to exit the towers. Building can also distract from the skyline and change the atmosphere and culture of historical areas. So problems caused by natural disasters and other activities are more likely to cause large scale damage. Because a collapse would be devastating, its architects would have to construct these structures to resist earthquakes. Fighting flames that could break out in the structure would also be difficult and appropriate fire escape routes would have to be included. So as the building height rises, safety issues become more acute, emphasizing the importance of every detail. Building vertical cities would need significant research and planning, but they might aid in the resolution of some humanity's most pressing problem, thus the work may be beneficial. Communities are designed with the possibility to, since such a large vertical development has such a substantial impact on the environment, which is which amplified as higher degree during the construction period, creating an environmental management system in line with the existing environment standard is a huge undertaking. Communities are designed with the possibility to evolve for succeeding generations, and they do other throughout time. Vertical development is expected to last a certain amount of time. It should be discarded once its service has expired and its chances of being reused are unclear during this point. During development, vertical housing, electricity, and environmental impact are protected, projected to be substantially larger than those of the typical horizontal metropolis. So because of the large section of the surrounding neighborhood, it may have an impact on the area's climate and natural vegetation and wildlife. Air transport to other destinations of this nature is not practicable in small vertical structures, natural hazards, and also other man-made calamities enhances the chance of widespread damage. Every institutional authority at every stage of its organization is worried about humanity's health and well-being in the present era. Personal and public health, urban veracity, security, and urban environment maintenance are all issues that must be addressed. As the global population continues to rise and therefore must be managed within their system area of resources, dealing with the issues become increasingly challenging. To make the vertical cities a reality, a holistic approach is necessary, taking into consideration subject, cultural, and environmental values, as well as technological advancement advancement and urban planning factors. In a densely populated situation of Tondo, Manila, vertical urban Sorry planning- to uh, interrupt but, Kimberly, but uh, I'll request you to wrap up your presentation, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and that's all. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, uh, we will now open the stage for questions for all our speakers. Uh, we do have a lot of questions in the chat box, so I will be starting with those. Um, first question is uh, from Professor Kriti Agrawal, uh, directed for Anirudh. Uh, she says, uh, of the various options identified for curbing public urination, any stories of success and learning through failures by initiatives by different municipalities, how successful and if has Swachh Bharat Mission been in curbing public urination? Is there any study on this? Would be great to hear. Thanks. Uh, Anirudh, would you like to take that? Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for the question. Okay, so about like various initiatives that are taken. Um, basically, uh, the Bangalore uh, municipality, they had uh, had so many initiatives for stopping urination. So they started with painting the walls and trying to uh, make it more visually appealing. And to, they actually went to the extent of painting religious symbols all across many religions in many walls. And even that failed, um, which is a really interesting uh, thing that happened. But the strongest thing that they did was very bold. They put uh, mirrors across uh, their area, some areas that it regularly happened on. And uh, the, by putting mirrors, the statement that they gave itself was very bold about public urination that it, it had a stronger impact than anything else that they've done. And that could be a success, although it was not, uh, uh, it cannot be very feasible to put mirrors on every wall. Um, so that way it's not, um, 
very uh, implementable all over but that was a very bold step that they did and uh, other initiatives uh, for regenerating a wall like for example in chennai there is uh, i studied about two ngos one is colors of chennai and karam karpoom they had uh, co involved communities in various areas to come and paint some walls that are very uh, dilapidated and have a lot of post messy posters and urination happens and by involving the community they even got the community to be interested and to protect the wall further on and people who pass by also look at the wall like a wall that is being cared for so that way uh, public urination on these spaces have been stopped so regenerating has been working in some areas and art to provoke there's been um, some really interesting provoking artworks like for in for example in chennai uh, there was this um, viral trend of painting this phrase naya ni which actually in tamil means are you a dog at on on some walls where um, the stench is really strong so when someone goes to urinate on these walls they'll feel provoked because uh, the wall is kind of like insulting them or they feel question themselves similarly in delhi also there was a trend uh, called deko gadda mootra where people were um, uh, whenever someone's urinating on the wall they'll read that statement and they'll feel like they're uh, uh, get the question about whether they, they're donkey or, or something like that and that has also been kind of like very impactful on these spaces and coming to the swatch bharat scheme um the original scheme was to complete to clean india swatch bharat means clean india and uh, the scheme was to build 110 million toilets across the country to um to, so that 50 percent of the population who don't have access to toilets will get uh, get uh, access to toilets so that was a very bold scheme that actually pointed out because of it was a, a political agenda for the prime minister it was very strong that uh, something like urination is being considered with such importance and uh, at the end of the uh, time period of five years they they uh, completed the uh, the implementation of these toilets and an institute a research institute called rice they had um, surveyed in like a few northern states uh, and um, they surveyed before and after this uh, uh, before and after this campaign. And in the beginning, they found that 70% of people in some rural villages were urinating in the open. And after this, they, that value from 70% had reduced to 44%, which is actually a very positive impact. It's a very strong and positive impact because it's happening in rural areas where it uh, can be forgotten or ignored. And but at the same time, the uh, fact that this is uh, supposed to be completely eradicating open defecation, this has not happened. This has made us aware uh, made people uh, to be aware that it's not just implementing building toilets that's important, it's the hygiene, the maintenance and education of people that is important at these places. So that way, Swachh Bharat also is a very good scheme that, that taught us about what should be focused on and what can work and what cannot work in open urination. Hope that answers uh, the question. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Anirudh. We'll be moving on to the next question. Um, Next question is by Anandit for uh, Ruju. Uh, he asks, do you believe that liminality can be perceived as ambiguity if we consider it on the scale of city nation building? If so, how can we understand liminality while talking about architecture, which is driving a large dis larger discourse of permanence and legacy, legacy in the current political scenario? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I've read the next one also. Anyway, so uh, so yes, uh, I believe that liminality can be perceived as ambiguity, but again, it is a very uh, in-depth and larger discourse in anthropology, and it is explored at multiple human development levels. So if I look at it in context of a city development process, like if I compare it, uh, with that, then yes, it is that frame of uh, of opportunity where you can use it as an ambiguous um, as an ambiguous uh, space where you can create unusual or uh, you know unconventional ways of developing our cities. And uh, as you said, like uh, the the regulations that that are being followed right now currently in this uh, in in the country are mainly focused on buildings and uh, which is essentially the shape of it or how it will end up looking uh, you know which is related to architecture and more towards an individual building and not thinking of cities as a whole like there are 
CV schemes and development plans, but then there's this gap between those plans and the uh, end end result, which builds the uh, individual spaces in the city. And I think uh, that is where the challenge comes, and that is where liminality comes into picture. Where to use that uh, liminal space or to use that ambiguous uh, ambiguous space to introduce uh, that in between uh, negotiation for between the building and the urban realm. So I think that is how it is going to uh, challenge the current uh, scenario. In and that is what I'm trying to put forward through this research that that is what is important to look at. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Ruju. Uh, we'll move on to the next question now. Um, next question is uh, for Upasana and Kripa by Asta. She asks, um, uh, your work uh, your work highly takes inspiration from Jane Jacobs' ideas, talking about her concept of eyes on street. When we use these concepts in Indian city, whose safety are we referring to? And what would be, in your opinion, should be the line between surveillance and safety, which is eyes on the street, should be drawn? What could be identify? Uh, what could we identify the meaning of public in public safety? Um, over to you. Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, here, when we meant uh, about the eyes on the streets and whose safety are we referring to, it is always meant uh, as uh, we always meant it to be the people who are associated with any particular place. For example, it can be the residents who uh, live in the locality. It can be the people who come for uh, commercial related uh, for job opportunities in the locality. There's a commercial place where they come. So it can be that it can be a, a public space where people come enjoy. It can be a recreational area. So uh, where it, uh, it's all the people who are associated with a particular locality. All these people come under uh, when we look into the safety prospects. And also by public safety, we meant the same thing that whoever is associated with the uh, area. Also surveillance and safety, uh, there should be a demarcated line, uh, obviously, where we should, there should be no means uh, that by any means uh, there should be no hindrance to any uh, privacy of the people uh, what our lookout was uh, from a uh, planning point of view we uh, we were looking forward that uh, we should reduce the number of dark, dark spots that is um, within a society there should be more of mixed land use so that we have residential and simultaneously within a very short distance we have a commercial place we have a public uh, so that uh, there's a the activity. Uh, it it is the it uh, it becomes an activity node for uh, yeah, so like the long zones are not created basically. Yeah, and also about illumination. Uh, by that means uh, we can have more uh, street lights uh, on the streetscape to increase the illumination in the streets so that and the uh, there's, Yeah, basically there is no chance of uh, like to reduce the chance of uh, creating such spots where criminal offenses can be taking place rather than more focusing on who will be looking or how will they be. Okay. Yeah. Hope this answers the question. Uh, I'll be moving on to the next one. Um, this is from Joshita Yadav. Uh, she commented on YouTube. Very relevant research for Kimberly and Noel. How, uh, housing that you have described here is pretty common in Russia and often seen as an example of communist housing. How do you think the political scenario of Philippines affects uh, perspective of your research about built environment in Philippines? Thank you for sharing your research with us. Uh, this is for Kimberly and Noel. Um, hello, can can I think for a moment for uh, how I can answer the question? Sure. Uh, so I'll take another question and we'll get back to that. Yes, thank Thanks you. Already. Okay, thank you. So um, next question uh, is for uh, Ruju by Professor Alok Parna. Uh, she says, really appreciate your research work on liminal spaces within the public. I agree that street markets, hawkers, vendors largely contribute to the liminality and in amplifying the publicness of the street in our cities. 
As an urban design student, do you think urban road boards can retain hawkers and such livelihoods along with providing continuous walking path uh, for pedestrians? If yes, then how? I ask this since you talked about regulations. Also appreciate your modifications of Gail's diagram. So over to you, Ruju. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, hi. So I, yes, I mean, as, as an urban design student, this is what we've been looking at for past five years and in different conditions. And absolutely, I feel that uh, it can be retained and it can be accommodated in the uh, street design code because <clears throat> uh, the codes that we've been referring to or the guidelines that we've been referring to come uh, from the Western part of the world. And most of them have uh, certain, uh, certain fixed elements such as uh, sidewalks or chicanes or this kind of parklets or certain kinds of uh, planters or seating or lighting etc but uh, so that there is no such uh, provision for uh, these uh, kind of on street markets or on street uh, small hawkers or the kind of uh, the kind of activities that we see in our cities or on in in the indian context if i put it that way and uh, so that's where i think uh, we can modify those guidelines and uh, and uh, implement it in our context where we can say that certain parts of the street is going to be for these people like for, for these hawkers and in in some sense there should be some code of conduct through regulations but it should not uh, be such that it enforces them or uh, you know uh, yeah, I mean, enforces them to be in a certain place in a certain way. So maybe we can give, uh, maybe we can give provisions for them to be in that space and modify that space according to their needs, but not completely design each and every aspect of their, say, lari or uh, the cart or anything that they are using to uh, do their business on street. So I think uh, that way these negotiations can happen. And uh, there are also certain uh, studies that we did or uh, smaller researches that we did during our studio projects, which focused on plugins. So which, uh, which basically introduce a simpler module for these hawkers on street and uh, which can be multiplied uh, whenever and however needed. So if say the street is wide enough and there's more space to accommodate the a larger space of uh, a sidewalk then then that mo that module can be multiplied in uh, in that space and then if there's if it gets narrower in in some places then then maybe one or two different uh, it it can be plugged in in different parts of those uh, those sidewalks i mean that uh, that street so i think there are i mean there are multiple ways through which we can do this and uh, I think it is important to show uh, these things because, as I mentioned earlier, it is the uh, essence of our cities, and that is what makes our cities different than what is present in other countries or other parts of the world. So I think yes, it is possible, and uh, there can be multiple ways to do it. This is what I uh, had in mind at this point. So I uh, I'm just going to ask a follow-up here, if I'm allowed, Kriti. Kriti. <laughs> we do have a lot of questions lined up, so. Okay, then just to maybe, comment. Maybe you can ask that follow-up question on the chat, and Ruth, you can uh, okay. answer that. Right, right. I'll yeah. do. I'll do. Yeah. So um, I'll move on to the next question. We are definitely running short on time, so I'll take a few more. Uh, this is from Professor Zai Makwani. She says, I did truly appreciate your deep dive into penis culture, pun intended. That said, public urination has, of course, been posited as a social crime of sorts, quote unquote. Uh, but who is this crime again? Is the wall merely a surface canvas? What kinds of wall are more favored than others? Adding on to that, that also reminds me of um, this recent scheme in Delhi where a lot of walls were covered with tiles with uh, pictures of God. So how did that impact? And it turned out to be quite effective for certain reasons. So over to you, Anirudh. And actually, Kirti, uh, if I might just jump in on your yes. comment. Yeah. <laughs> I 
means put, putting gods up on a public wall any less offensive. That yeah, Not true. Offensive That's something to be. God, but my sensibility is offended by that. So yeah, Anirudh, go on. Okay, so starting with the crime thing. Um, according to the fines and punishments uh, articles that I saw about public urination, it's considered a public nuisance. So um, that's so the crime over there would be a damage of infrastructure and disturbance to people around. And speaking of which, an another thing that's related to this is disgust, because um, one um, article that I uh, or a, a research that I read about regarding this is called um, uh, but. Uh, uh, non-fiction book about a woman who was traveling with gypsies. It's called Barin is Standing, where she was documenting how, about how some gypsy cultures were defecating together uh, in a uh, commune, in, in a group way, without feeling disgust about the, what the other person is doing, by talking, by discussing things and all that. That is urinating the open actually a disgrace, or is it just inconvenient for someone nearby? And that's uh, that's how I came to the um, understanding that the disgust itself came from an, uh, our understanding of hygiene and sanitation. But yeah, uh, the crime about your public urination comes from um, uh, the public nuisance thing that I said, said first. Um, other than that, if the, the wall being a surface thing, um, it's another connection to how animals have, have evolved to urinate. For example, if you, a, a male dog or a female dog, the way they urinate is very different. A female dog would um, urinate at certain spots and uh, all at once. But a male dog would urinate at things that it finds interesting, uh, at things that can mark its territory with. So the uh, for urinating, it, I mean, it uses its urinating uh, habit or tendencies to actually uh, mark things. And that I meant uh, by canvas, that is what I meant. So the, uh, at the same time, this in, in movies, uh, this is not included in my result, but in movies and uh, um, other pop culture references, you'd see um, scenes or stuff where they'd use uh, the aim and shoot, con uh, uh, aim and shoot um, feature, if that's what it is, aim and shoot feature for jokes and more. So this is what I meant by the canvas theory. And did I miss anything? Uh, Okay, about what walls are favored more than others. Actually, that um, I, I realized that I just skipped a slide when I presented. And in one slide, I, uh, it's basically a survey, survey that I did asking people, what kind of walls do you think uh, public urination happens on more often? And from that and all the answers that I got, I had summarized all the um, uh, descriptions into four categories. And one category of walls that people regularly urinate on is walls that are dilapidated by regularly um, unregul unregulated exploitation, like putting posters everywhere, putting paint and graffiti everywhere. This kind of walls are regularly urinated on. Second category is uh, walls that are dilapidated by un under maintenance. So this, uh, like for example, fungus growth, vegetation growth, and weed growth and all that uh, can make it look um, uncared for and people tend to urinate on these walls. The third category is spaces that are unseen and secluded, like a corner of a building that people uh, that is like a, kind of a negative space that is also another space and the fourth category is uh, spaces that are regularly urinated already I mean that are already regularly urinated on like for example in uh, in the light case that it is of an area called triplicane in Chennai uh, it's a very um, prominent area where a lot of shopping areas are but then there's one corner of the road where um, it's uh, that one corner that's in a four-way junction is regularly used for urinating and um, uh, it's, it's interesting about how people who come to the area every time they use that one corner for urinating in spite of like there being public toilets like probably 100 200 meters away and that because of regularly urinating over that that culture developed about like if people want to urinate they go to that corner that is like always that's always happening now so did i miss anything no thank you that was very interesting i mean one could have longer conversations on it but i think there are other questions too but thank you um, Thank you so much for questions, everyone. So uh, I would ask uh, Kimberly if she's ready with her answer or else we can move on to the next question. Yeah, so I think about that the public arrangement is to give fundamental necessities to the most weak segment of our general public, regardless of who the administrator are. So maybe there are laws in place in providing housing for the financial disadvantaged sector. 
there are existing laws, but sometimes there are, they were not followed. Yeah, that's my answer. Did, did I answer? Maybe you could give uh, the answer also on the YouTube section. That's where Jyotish uh, asked that. I hope that answers for her. So thank you so okay. much, Kimberly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'll be taking the last question. I'll request the presenters to please re uh, reply to the questions and comments in the chat. Please take some time once the session is done. Uh, so the last question is for Upasana and Kripa, asked by Professor Girish Agarwal. Uh, first question is, crime data in India is notoriously incomplete and the NCRB data is generally unreliable for anything but gross fatality numbers. How does one go about estimating crime rates under such a scenario? This is the first question. Second is, a statistical model linking population density to crime numbers is kind of meaningless, almost at the level of saying, quote, uh, the sun comes up before I wake up and my data shows that, unquote. Should you not be looking at, at, that, at the minimum geographical locations, industrial activity, and political conditions control variables? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, to answer the second part, uh, part first, of course, the number of uh, control variables or the factors that can be considered for a particular type of research, especially something related to crime, can be many. And uh, the political conditions affecting crime can uh, be one factor. It can be one research in itself. Um, a, a wider uh, study in itself but what our focus over here was to just uh, in general understand uh, the uh, scenario of Indian states in case uh, in the um, uh, in the relationship of their levels of urban population and uh, the reported crime rates and uh, coming to the first part uh, uh, we had to rely on the NCRB data because um, as mentioned that uh, what we had access to was uh, was uh, was this data that was uh, related to crime and that is the uh, reason why we also uh, try to conduct a prime way to analyze the current situation of how, how um, like the people feel about this uh, how or what people feel about this relationship but since it was not possible to uh, conduct any uh, uh, more surveys Quite because of the current situation we have today. Yeah, exactly. So, so we will, there was a certain limitation. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I think that answers this question, but uh, maybe you can go through the rest of the questions and answer those because we do have more in the chat. So I think this is it for the evening. This was definitely a very engaging session. Uh, there were a lot of insights and points uh, to stay with. Um, so um, this brings us to the close of the seventh session of the conference. Uh, and now thanks to all the presenters for sharing the research with all of us and to the audience for being so engaging. I really enjoyed moderating this session and hope everyone present here did too. Uh, back to you, Aditya. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Kirti, and all the presenters for another incredible set of presentations and a wonderful discussion that followed. Uh, we will now take a short break before we start with the next panel. We will return at 3.35, so about six to seven minutes from now, for the last panel for the day titled Processes Around Built Heritage, which will be moderated by Akshita Naglur. So uh, we will see you again in about five to six minutes at 3.35 p.m. Thank you.
we are live all right um good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the next panel for today um the panel is titled processes around built heritage and will be moderated by akshita nagrur um so over to you akshita um thank you so much aditya good afternoon everybody i'm akshita nagrur a third year student at the general school of art and architecture and i'll be your moderator for today's last session titled processes around built heritage built heritage embodies itself through myriad associations across time how does heritage get constructed through social and political interactions how do people and places become active agents that link memory and identity to the idea of heritage even though the progression of time complicates this question in this session we will explore the spatial code of the public realm where ideas of heritage are constantly in the making the presenters in this session will discuss critical questions pertaining to heritage thereby engaging in ideas of community practices difference museumization and preservation of heritage I would like to remind the audience that we will have the question answer session at the end of the presentations. For the ones joining us on Zoom, please type in your questions for the speakers in the chat box, and for those of you joining us on YouTube, please type them in the live chat. Uh, for the presenters, here's a reminder that I will remind you with the sound of a bell once your tenth minute of the presentation is done, and I will ring the bell again at the thirteenth minute. Our first speaker for the session is Megan Quigley from La Trobe University in Australia, presenting her paper titled "The Missing Narratives in Heritage Conservation: A Study on Ballarat, Australia." Um, I hand it over to you, Megan. Hi. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Hi there, um, I'm Megan Quigley and I'm from La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I'm a second year student studying urban planning. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I will be presenting my paper, The Missing Narratives in Heritage Conservation. Um, I looked at a small town called Ballarat in regional Victoria and attempted to unravel some of the power bestowed in the stories and mythologies that the heritage buildings possess. Um, so Ballarat is a town located in the central highlands of Victoria and is roughly 100 kilometers to the northwest of Melbourne. Its current estimated population is just over 110,000 people. Um, the town was first settled in 1838 by European squatters and was rapidly developed after the discovery of gold just 13 years after in 1851. With the discovery of gold in the mid 1800s, Ballarat became a booming city that once rivaled Melbourne, the largest city in Victoria. It is home to some of Australia's most defining and historical moments, including the scene of the armed rebellion known as the Eureka Stockade and represents man's fight for freedom. In 1854, tensions built over several months between miners and the government. The miners were becoming increasingly frustrated with a lack of land ownership, restrictive rules and a lack of rights. A group of miners protested demanding political reform and the eradication of licenses. They were shot down by the military in a surprise attack and over 100 prisoners were taken captive. Regardless, many Australians supported the miners and the Eureka Stockade led to a political reform and represents triumph over an unjust government. When traveling by train to Ballarat, you arrive in the center of town when you leave the train station headed for Sturt Street, evidence of the gold rush history is visible everywhere. The colonial period is very much in the present. The lure of gold drew people to the town looking for fortune and freedom. And they left behind a grand city with many buildings dating back to 1860s and 1870s, a town now frozen in time. This history of discovery and wealth linked to the colonialism of Australia 
is central to Ballarat's identity, culture and economy. The conservation of heritage and culture within rural towns can be necessary when striving to maintain a sense of local place, especially in the face of globalisation. The Heritage Urban Landscape Framework, or better known as Hull, was developed with UNESCO to cope with rapid urbanisation leading to homogenous cities. Ballarat was one of the first towns to adopt the Hull approach and attempts a culture-led regeneration that reuses heritage buildings, hoping to reinforce local culture and the community's sense of pride and identity. Um, some of the power that is embodied in heritage is a result of the geographies in which they are set. Power that includes emotional power, authoritarian and imperial dominance. There is also an invested interest in the economic value of the heritage um, within Ballarat, uh, and it holds a great deal of power. A report in 2006 noted that heritage listed pre the heritage listed precinct in the centre of town attracted over 2 million visitors each year, um, with over 300 million total visitor expenditure. Some of the tourist attract attractions include Ballarat, Ballarat at heritage tours, inviting you to discover the city's golden past, tales of rebellion, tragedy and triumph. But too much emphasis on material value can replace the social value, ultimately pushing those who cannot afford to live in the centre out of town and drawing boundaries between newcomers and settlers or rich and poor. Geographer Doreen Macy was well known for her theories concerned with understanding power relationships and contested the power that is placed in spaces, especially those places that hold prime land capital. She, she debated that the impacts of globalization on the shrinking of space and time, otherwise known as time-space compression, drives one to seek stability and identity within the uniqueness of a place and can sometimes form nationalism, competitive localisms, obsessions with heritage, and the drawing of boundaries, differentiating between us and them. Many locals have a significant level of pride for their heritage in Ballarat, and this was confirmed with an extensive survey performed back in 2013, when Ballarat adopted the whole approach. The survey asked locals what they love about Ballarat, and a large percentage said heritage. However, when it came time to name a new suburb in the town, the name Mullawalla was suggested in memory of one Aboriginal man, also known as King Billy. But residents in Ballarat contested it aggressively. And the, the council received over 100 written objections from community members and under pressure, they ultimately rejected the name. Those who were against the name claimed it was too hard to pronounce and spell, and that it would be difficult for emergency services such as ambulance drivers to locate the suburb due to the difficulty with pronunciation. When observing the different forms of heritage around Ballarat, the lack of indigenous celebration compared to the rich heritage of colonialism supports the argument that lack of appreciation for Indigenous heritage is primarily due to the invisible presence and contributes to placemaking today. The whole approach looks at preserving a diverse range of heritage. Regardless, the most visually impactful heritage in Ballarat includes statues, parks and buildings that showcase a time of much trauma for many Indigenous Australians. The elements of power and mythologies embedded within these structures appear to define Australian nationalism and represent a larger narrative of white heteronormativity and a deep conservatism that reinforces white belonging. Ballarat's centre and the old town are home to many powerful stories and heritage pieces. These stories are a large part of Australia's history and identity. However, the tradition of forgetting and the invisible Aboriginals contributes to placemaking today. 
New migrants relocating to small regional towns will often seek out sites of cultural relevance such as churches, mosques or schools when forming a community. These sites have become essential to forming an identity and a sense of belonging while significantly impacting the location to live. Ballarat's population is projected to increase by 26% over the next 15 years and the projected growth is primarily forecast in the outer suburbs. Almost 40% of people who relocated to Ballarat between 2011 and 2016 have migrated from elsewhere in Australia. Ballarat is unique in considering a diverse influx of people with varying cultural backgrounds, potentially creating tensions between the communities. When comparing the locations of Ballarat's heritage areas with the predicted growth patterns, a conclusion can be drawn that the heritage sites, which are crucial to the identity of many residents in Ballarat, restrict development and contribute to urban sprawl. In addition to the problems urban sprawl has on our environment, limited development within the centre of Ballarat is forcing minority groups to the outskirts, sometimes ostracising new ethnic communities. Ethnic sites or buildings can become reference points to diverse identities. Furthermore, these sites can significantly impact the dynamics of social cohesion and intercultural relations within communities. I interviewed a group of residents from Ballarat who had migrated from overseas at different points in time. They were part of the Intercultural Ambassador Program that aims to enhance community awareness and social acceptance in Ballarat. A common theme emerged when listening to Francis Solange and the Intercultural Ambassador's stories of migrating to Ballarat. Each person felt the need to assimilate and forego a piece of their culture, identity and self in order to be accepted. With such a large concentration of heritage buildings occupying prime real estate in the centre of Ballarat, communities are pushed out to the edges of town, adding to the urban sprawl, isolating more impoverished families and creating divisions between residents. Our towns and cities are shaped by heritage. Heritage can tell our stories, provide a cultural context, placemaking, and prevent homogenous cities. Conservation is crucial in maintaining the character of a region, which can drive community identity, creativity, and tourism. This report is not questioning the value of heritage. Instead, the power bestowed within the mythologies that the heritage structures hold. The impacts of excessively preserving heritage in the built form contribute to urban sprawl, affect intercultural relations, and deny social cohesion. It could be argued that the lack of appreciation for Indigenous heritage is primarily due to the invisible presence of Aboriginal culture within regional towns. Obsessions with heritage can result in boundaries differentiating between us and them. When a large concentration of heritage dominates a central area, development opportunities are limited, forcing minority groups to the outskirts, sometimes ostracising new ethnic communities. Place is non-static, it is forever growing, dissolving and reforming throughout time. To formulate diverse cities is to create a sense of place and build a narrative linking the past, present and future, where the history, where the historic fabric is no more important than the social meanings of place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That was an amazing presentation. Next, uh, we have Ranak Datta from the Jindal School of Art and Architecture in Sonipat in India with his paper titled Lost Heritage. Over to you, Rana. Thank you, Akshita. Share my screen. Is the screen visible? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. You're audible? Good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to present my paper, The Lost Heritage, which will elaborate on the processes of how monuments generate identity and often an objective tainted truth of the past. This truth often fails to represent the complexity of the past, and this is the main topic that I'll be focusing on. 
so by the end of this presentation i'll be discussing two case studies one which one would be on the fulewara museum in pune and the other will be on the de demolition of the babri masjid so uh, every moment that we pass by we are constantly in the process of creating memories and eventually these memories create certain feelings for us which are termed as nostalgia the nostalgia is an emotional process through which people connect to certain events of the past and often in doing so an individual tries to capture or perceive the world through the memories as in how the world has to be what what is correct or what is wrong these are to some extent explained by the memory of an individual so the nostalgia can be uh, explained as a to and fro process through which an individual tries to mitigate the past onto the future here it be becomes very important for us to acknowledge that the memory of an individual becomes an important part of the heritage which can be preserved in any form whether it be tangible or intangible this heritage gives them their identity defines their culture and traces back their origin by culture i mean a set of social norms and practices that are constantly shaping the way an individual perceives the world and such constructs are established through a consciously set environment of signs and symbols these cultures memories and heritage are then validated through monuments exhibiting tangible objects for us to touch in order to believe their existence this like museums and memorials are the nothing but a space that has been consciously designed with the interference of art and architecture to bridge the gap between the historical events and the visitors the museums kind the museums are constantly reciting a story with an appropriate re-representation of the past events the monuments are created for one to identify the culture to art and objects that connects to the memories of the past and these memories memorials not only commemorate or glorify the past but also makes us aware it makes us mind remind and also defines our actions it kind of guides us to a way so in terms of if if we try to understand the museum in an abstract term then we can think of it as a chain a chain that never breaks but un unfolds itself at every point of a life and it kind of regulates our actions thoughts and perception of the world another uh, purpose of the memorials other than kind of reiterating a story is to entertain individuals through visual consumption memorials abide by modern world's fetish of materialism and aims at mummifying the heritage and presenting it in a tangible form and in doing so the little humble intangible monuments such as the stories the cultural practices even the materiality of buildings and and, and other uh, kind of uh, stories maybe that the, these are very important things uh, that become a part of heritage so the monuments kind of deprive such representations in itself so now here it becomes very important for us to understand the relationship between the heritage displayed in these monuments and its certainty of truth history or to be precise heritage is not just an absolute truth but a mere perception of a particular event of the past that is narrated by an individual that has a like particular distinct cultural background as a result we should define heritage as a coming together of various perspectives to represent the complexity of the past but on real world on contrary the underlying politics of power and hierarchy often consciously decides which events needs to be commemorated or celebrated while identifying the ones which needs to be disposed of as a trauma this process of selection of events leads to the creation of a biased objective truth or perception of the past which are aimed at developing a collective identity as smith lorigen an australian archaeologist had also mentioned in the book the uses of heritage that in museums the certain popular tangible memories are restyled and rewritten creating a sentimentalized past generating uncritical nostalgia of of an idea that it was better back then because of such idea that is generated by the museums an individual thinks that they need to uh, kind of put, uh, like inhabit the practices that were there in the past and all and uh, kind of regulate their actions based on those for the for the for the future so the important so the, so one thing that we need to ask here is that who are the ones who are included in the creation of this collective identity while which section of people are alienated within this construct of heritage so with such understanding coming on to our first case study we shall be discussing the mahatma phule museum in pune 
So Pulewara was the home of Mahatma Jyotiraw Phule and Sabitri Bai Phule. They were revolutionists who devoted their entire life fighting against class and caste discrimination, and they also fought for women's right to education and equality. Their house was built in 1885, which went on to be declared as a heritage site in 1993, which was maintained by the State Archaeological Department. But the problem arose in 2011 when the municipal Pune Municipal Corporation decided to build the Sabitri by Fulis Marak, which will house an exhibition that celebrates the uh, life and works of Sabitri by Fule. It will also have murals, displays, and an auditorium. The state authorities decided to build a road connecting the Smarak and Fulewara that will allow the visitors to commute easily between the two memorials. During the process of monumentalization of these of the Smarak as well as the Fulewara, almost 200 slum dwellers were displaced from from the place that they inhabited. And the people who used to live there, basically the slum dwellers, had connected to the place in an emotional way. There were stories that were passed on to them by their ancestors, stories that spoke of the struggles against class and caste discrimination, and also stories about Mahatma and Jyoti, Mahatma and Savitri Bhai Phule, that how they helped those people. These memories were preserved by the slum dwellers in the form of intangible heritage of memory and stories. These stories help them create an identity and at the same time connect to the place, the Fulewar. Once it got displaced from their heritage, uh, from, from the place they, where they used to live near the Wara, they, their heritage was lost. The continuum of memories were put to a stop. Although the Wara like, stood for a national pride, it celebrated the fighting of class and caste discrimination, but at the same time, the monumentalization of this past suppress the voices and memories of these very class that that Mahatma and Jyoti, Mahatma uh, Jyotira Phule and Sabitri Bhai Phule were fighting for. So why, when these people were displaced, not only the heritage was lost, not only the identity was lost, but along with that, they, they lost their, their, they lost their livelihood and as well as they were pushed to a more precarious conditions. After studying the case of Fulewara Museum, it is in my opinion that the, this memorial had like celebrated certain events of the past that helped to create a collective identity invoking a sense of nationality. But at the same time, the views and perspective of the marginalized people were not given a proper representation through the museum. The monument never represented the stories of the people who struggled against this discrimination. It never did spoke of the cultural practices of those uh, the people who were discriminated. In my opinion, this was consciously done by the development authority to so that to avoid that national embarrassment and focus only on those events that gave them a sense of pride. So within the museum, through various signs, symbols, texts, the memorial had presented a sanitized past curtaining the class discrimination. And even the one more interesting thing would be to know that the presenters who were there in the museum uh, they were not allowed to speak anything else. They were not allowed to share any stories other than the script that was provided to them. Therefore, it was very clear that the museum was aiming to create an objective truth to a truth that did not include the voices of these uh, marginalized people and also did not include the heritage of these people. Moving on to our second case study. We shall be briefly discussing about the infamous case of the demolition of Babri Masjid. So this controversial masjid was created by Mir Baki, the governor of Awadh, during 1527 under the Mughal Emperor Babur. The masjid since its inception stood on the land of Ayodhya, now commonly known as or now perceived as the Ram Janmabhumi, as a worship place for the Islam community. The monument held great importance for the Muslim population as it was a place where they used to worship, they used to practice Sufi songs and other, they, they, through the place, they actually put their culture, culture to a continuum. During the period of 1850, various rites took place and thereafter, the, Babri, the whole area of Babri Masjid was being used as a worship place, both for the Hindu and the Muslims. But the problem arose as the Hindu communal parties aimed to establish India into a Hindu nation by bringing religiosity into politics and polarizing the population based on religion. Their main aim was to get the whole area of Babri as a Hindu worship area and raise support for the parties. 
then the Hindu, like with the, with such an aim the hindu political parties consciously began to recollect specific events of the past that narrated the conquest decay and destruction of the hindu civilization by the mughals this the, the, the recollection and reiteration of such events also helped the islam community as some like also helped to frame the islam community as something alien to the indian culture this process of categorizing was the first step of creating a collective identity. The Islam culture was now gradually being perceived as the other, as the minor. And with here the masjid stood as a symbol of Hindu victimization that had to be demolished, de de demolished to regain Hindu identity as well as reverse the trauma. But, but what is trauma actually? So Dr. Dory Law, a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine, had remarked on traumatic experiences to be the inability to fully witness the event as it occurs or the ability to witness the event fully only at the cost of witnessing one's life. Basically, it says that when a person experiences a traumatic event, his or her brain experiences a belatedness. Such a delay leads to the inability of grasping a part of the event. And to bridge this understanding or this knowledge gap, the brain then tries to establish the truth at the expense of simple knowledge and memory. Similarly, in the context of Babri Masjid, these traumatic events were a story that were being established through specific memories of the past at the expense of biased knowledge of the Hindu communal party. And, and surely there was an un uncertainty of truth that lied within these traumatic events. Once the traumas were set in place, now the people undertook certain actions, such as a Ram idol was placed inside the Masjid in 1949. And it was framed that the, the idol had suddenly appeared inside the mercy. And such assertions were mixed with the controversies of the already disputed land of Ayutthaya. And, and it was kind of a falsified narrative was being created that the land was actually of Hindu god Ram. And there apparently was an, was, there was an existence of a temple before the masjid, which was destroyed in order to create the uh, Babri, Babri masjid. But the assertions that were being made that the existence of the temple till that there has been no confirmation as in in terms of legality or in terms of archaeological or in terms of archaeological studies that there was some consistent some existence of the temple. So basically they, these narratives were constantly falsifying the events of the past and it was kind kind of also outraging the Hindu community like Hindu community and was also kind of promoting a communal violence. Um, but, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have two minutes left for your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just with such outrage and uh, uh, with such outrage of the uh, Hindu Communal Party, uh, the demolition of Babri Masjid took place on 6 December 1992. With the destruction of the Babri Masjid, the the community of the Muslim community or the people who kind of connected to the place, they lost their heritage, they lost their identity. They lost the continuum of culture that was put through the heritage. But at the same time, this event was being celebrated by the Hindu, by the Hindu, like the Hindu population, because for them the past had been falsified. For them, the masjid truth uh, was was framed as a as a sense was framed as a uh, trauma. So so they were very happy. There were celebrations all around the world that the masjid was getting was was demolished. But at the same time, the the Muslim community, uh, like Muslim community, were in great despair and were not at all, and also the, their uh, identity lied in very like insecure situations. So, on the conclusion, I would like to say, so the, the process of monumentalization and the creation of monuments consciously project certain events of the past to manipulate the truth, and in doing so, they deprive the inclusion and narrative of certain class of people. I believe that monuments should not only be created with the aim of establishing an objective truth, but bringing in various narratives and present the complex unbiased truth, unbiased truth of the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronak. That was a very interesting presentation. Now we have the paper titled A Pilot Site Approach for Built Heritage Diagnosis, which is co-authored and presented by Rated Kerry Ronquillo, John Cedric Abarka, and John Den Suizo from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines in Manila in Philippines. Over to you guys. Um, good day, everyone. Um, unfortunately, 
can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, John, you're good. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, the weather condition we currently deal today, uh, deal with today, we have encountering we are encountering some internet difficulties. So we we have prepared a video presentation of our research. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, it's visible. The National Commission on Indigenous People identifies 110 indigenous groups in the Philippines, one of which is the Igongwat ethnic minority, which is not giving adequate attention to assessing their remaining cultural significance. From the culturally diverse and historically rich country of the Philippines, Namaste, Meranam, Cedric Abarcahe. Namaste, Meranam, Ray Depe. Namaste, Meranam, John Den Suizohe. We are architecture students from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, and we are here to present the study, a pilot site approach for built heritage diagnosis the preservation and conservation of a Gongwat ethnic minority. In the Philippines, some heritage structures are frequently misunderstood, one of which is the Gongwat tribe in Aurora province. Behind this misconstrued people are diverse traditions, rich cultural practices, and an astounding architectural paragon. However, these indigenous people are known to be wild and forest dwellers who are infamous for their headhunting customs, which is widely misunderstood. Consequently, people lack sufficient knowledge of how to properly conserve and preserve remaining cultural artifacts. This could lead to the deterioration, if not oblivion of key Filipino cultural values. It is with this concern in mind that we decided to take action in assessing the remaining traditional dwellings of Igongot people. Giving light to their forlorn traditional architecture is a vital heritage in the country. The research aims to analyze the current material and structural aspects of the built heritage to document and provide a detailed explanation of the existing structures and to understand the value of historical, cultural, and architectural knowledge of the Igongo tribe. The study encompasses the use of historical and observational data through pilot site approach to utilize and analyze the current state of the remaining structures, namely the Abong House, Kamage House, and the Sepio. This research shows that heritage preservation as a symbol of national identity is not restricted by any time period, but rather transcends from the common religious architecture spectrum in heritage conservation. It also proves that there is still architectural value in built heritage. The pilot site approach includes three phases, the historical documentation and surveys, the present architectural condition assessment, and the diagnosis of conservation treatment as a method of approach. The historical data collection phase of the pilot site included the conventional construction technique and the usage of vernacular materials. The architectural assessment, the second phase, gave observational data on the current status of the building after conservation treatment. The subsequent investigation of both the past and the present is the final part of the pilot site strategy, which is the diagnosis of observation treatment. These two criteria are used to create a comparison between the how it used to be and the how it is now. In order to gather and collect the data needed in the research, we have conducted an interview and on-site documentation. These collected data include archaeological findings and historical documentations that describe the original identity of the built heritage. Data collection includes conducting conversations with a village elder named Chieftain Romeo Kawad, who is the leader of the Egomot tribe in Aurora province, and gathering historical or written data on weathering, construction procedures, and material sourcing. The Igongo tribe speaks the Bugalat language. They have numerous construction vernacular terms, starting from the top of the house, the wooden carving on the top of the roof that is inspired by the hollow bird is called the tangkolok or eteng. 
The kanawan is the roof or upper covering composed of dried cogon leaves. The sepgat is the slope structural member in the middle of the clang and the kanawan. It is where the kanawan is attached while the clang is the rafter that supports the roof. The pengpatan is a horizontal structural member or a beam that is made up of hardwood which supports a load transversely. While the togay is a vertical structural member or a column that is made up of hardwood that supports the load from the ceiling to the foundation. The pengpetan is the main element in the frame floor supporting the other floorboards. As you can see on the illustration on your screen, the dugtog is a piece of wood laid inversely with the pengpetan. The degnag is a small wood support between the dugtog and the tetag is the main flooring of the room upon which one sits and is made up of rattan. There is a particular feature in our Onakamage house called the asagan, which is a built-in wooden chair around the interior of the house. One of the most important part of an Igungot house is the tangkolok or eteng. It is it is a wood carving that is inspired by the beak of a rufous hornbill, locally known as the hollow bird, on the apex of the roof. Not all houses are built with tangkolok. It can only be seen on the houses of the elite warriors and brave headhunters. It is a representation of the tribe's pride and valor. Kawad also states that the Igongots use a unique kind of wood joinery on every corner of the house where they creatively weave the rattan skin around the materials. The intricate weaving on the upper part of the roof of the house is called bingad or binengad, while the weaving on the lower part or on the walls and floor is called the kenindo. But on November 11, 2020, Typhoon Ulysses with an international name Banco with destructive winds and dumped heavy rainfall over the province of Aurora. This resulted to the destruction of the buildings, including the tribal village of the Igomot. The Abong, Tamage, and the Sepio are the three rim structures that remain standing but are greatly damaged due to the typhoon. The bigger type of Igomot house is called the Abong. With dimensions 4 by 3 meters, it is elevated 1.3 meters above the dampness of the ground and to keep away from the snakes and the vermin. The height of the floor to the apex of the steep roof is 3 meters that provide a dead shade from the sun during the summer and shed the torrential downpour of rains. It has balcony unlike the other house with dimensions 2.6 by 0.9 meters and 0.8 by 0.8 meters square window on the right side of the house. The interior is plain with no rooms and dividers. Neighboring the Abong is the smaller type of Igongot house called the Kamage. With dimensions 3.5 by 3 meters, it is also elevated 1.3 meters above the ground and the height of the floor to the apex of the roof is 3 meters. It has no balcony and windows but there are small openings on the walls for better air circulation. The interior is also plain with no rooms and dividers but it has chairs surrounding the inside of the house. Lastly, the Sepio is 9.3 meters long and 6.2 meters wide. The height of the hall is 3.7 meters from the floor to the ceiling. It has two types of windows, the single casement and triple casement windows with dimensions 2.1 meters by 1.3 meters. The interior is plain and open space with no rooms and dividers. The current sepia is built by fusing modern and traditional materials together. Concrete cement is used on the interior flooring and on the lower part of the walls. Nails and screws are currently present in joining the woods instead of only weaving them together unlike the traditional way. Conservation technique requires a thorough grasp of structural and material properties. The information on the structure in its original and earlier states, the techniques employed in its construction, the modifications and their effects, the phenomena that have occurred, and lastly, its current state are all necessary. The diagnosis of the current state of the Egonga tribal village is derived from inspection and images taken on the site, with the Luhai being the NGO of the village as our primary source. After being hit by several typhoons and other natural calamities, the condition of the building materials has evident damages. The remaining structures have holes on the floor, on the roof, and the walls. The post and roof bases are already infested by wood borers and some of the tangkoloks have been snapped from its base. With that, we have arrived into a resultant diagnosis of its material and structural being. The diagnosis of conservation treatments are divided into two aspects. First, material analysis and treatment. 
Second, the site safety evaluation. Integration of modern building materials such as softwood, the utilization of nails and screws as wood joinery, and the application of cement and concrete blocks may affect the structural quality and cultural identity of the built heritage. The site's proximity to a river makes it vulnerable to flooding and tall grasses surround the village due to no maintenance procedures implemented. The elevated structures of the Egonghots may not be greatly affected, but precautionary measures should still be observed and implemented. Furthermore, conservation and reinforcing measures should be based on a safety assessment and an understanding of the structural significance. Our recommendations on the preservation and maintenance of the Egonghots built heritage were derived from the pilot site approach phases. For traditional construction practice, it is crucial to replace nails and screws with the traditional rattan weaving as a joinery method to revitalize the structure's cultural identity. Implementation of landscape maintenance should also be observed to reduce environmental factors such as infestation of wood burrs and presence of tall grasses affecting the structure. Moreover, proposing a municipal ordinance to declare Egonot traditional houses at ethnic treasure is beneficial to provide various incentives and subsidies, as well as a governing body that will spearhead the preservation and conservation action for the site and be tasked with performing all stated maintenance practices. For the structural and material evaluation, floor, roof, and wall holes of the ethnic structures, wood illness could caused by wood bars and sepious concrete walls and flooring should all be revitalized by the integrating vernacular materials which were traditionally used by the Egonot people. The amalgamation of faces surmises the conclusion that from an architectural heritage perspective, Egonots generally use native vernacular materials for the abong, kamage, and sepio, which are the three kinds of Egonots built heritage houses, which vary in size and dimensions. The sepio, which serves as a communal hall, is the largest of the three, followed by the abong house and the hamage house. The pilot site is an effective way to address the inherent challenge of preserving building heritage. In the case of the remaining Egonot ethnic built heritage, it demonstrated unique building techniques through historical survey and documentation. Furthermore, thorough examination revealed substantial alterations and technical implications. The ingenuity of the materials chosen, as well as the structural stability of the building, were both affected by the conservation intervention. Thus, more effective preservation and maintenance procedures to help the existing damage have been created. It is vital to follow precise standards in this plan process, which will finally lead to the conservation of the cultural heritage item. And these are our references. We would like to thank the Luhai for participating in our research, Chief Romeo Kawad, our Dean Architect Rivera, Architect Jocelyn Rivera Lutap, and to our friends and families. Thank you so much. Once again, I am John Den Suizo. And I am Rated Terry Siron Curio. And I am John Cedric Abarca. Thank you for your kind attention. Namaste. Thank you so much, you guys. That was a very insightful presentation indeed. Our last speaker for this panel is Parvati Patel from Goa College of Architecture, presenting her paper, A Comparative Study of the Shaivite Temples of the Western Chalukya, a case at Sankeshwar, District Belgavi, Karnataka. Parvati, over to you. Is the screen visible? Yeah, Parvati, your screen is visible. Okay, so I'll begin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Parvati Patil, and I've recently graduated from the Goa College of Architecture. And I will be presenting the research paper, which is a comparative study of the Shaivai temples of the Western Chalukyas, a case at Sankeshwar, district Belgavi in Karnataka. 
the research was a part of my dissertation and uh, the paper is based on the shankar temple which is a small scale regional western chalukyan temple located in a town called sankeshwar in karnataka the temple was built in the western chalukyan style the vesara or the karnata dravida in the late 12th century or the early 13th century and has undergone some alterations to its original western chalukyan architectural form so in the event the temple undergoes further irreversible modifications to the extent that its distinct western chalukyan identity is lost it becomes necessary to document this temple and that's what the study does also the study attempts to analyze other western chalukyan temples to understand the vesara style so based on this analysis of western chalukyan temples the study also generates ideas of what the shankarlin temples original features may have looked like so the data was collect the data was collected and analyzed on three broad parameters the plan form elevation features and the shikhara composition further ahead the study will be explained along these three parameters so coming to the documentation of the shankarlin temple the temple has a arrangement of the single vimana which houses the garbhagriha that's the sanctum and antarala which is the vestibule the navranga that's the enclosed mandapa the hall and the mukha mandapa which is the open pillared hall so as you can see here on the periphery of the open hall there's the seating called the kakshasana and um, as seen here in the elevation the shikhara above the garbhagriha of the temple has been rebuilt in staggered pyramidal form using modern materials like bricks and mortar so considering the elevation features the plinth that's also called the adi stana at the garbhagriha level has undergone renovations and has been covered in a band of concrete whereas the mukha mandapa has still it still retains it still retains the original molding layers so coming to the garbhagriha wall details the central projection that here has these wall lines and the walls are mainly composed of these stambas or pilasters one is the simple block type and the other is the much more elaborate version which is the staggered type so sorry yes yeah. so the prasthara or the entablature at the roof level of the temple consists of this canopy layer that's called the chadiya where and the above layers above that have been again rebuilt in newer materials so the western chalukyas basically built temples that possess characteristics of both the dravidian and the nagara style of temple architecture resulting in this vesara style the architecture of the western chalukyas developed in two phases the first phase lasting for about 25 years and the second phase from the beginning of the 11th century till the decline of the empire in 1189 so the temples built during the second phase can be further divided into two categories the mainstream and the non mainstream temples so the mainstream temples were probably commissioned by the people belonging to the western chalukyan administration whereas the non mainstream temples were commissioned by the feudatories of the chalukyas and these temples are generally built by workshop so the two main workshops that built the mainstream temples were at suddhi and lakundi that's here that's in karnataka and the workshops that built the non mainstream temples were dispersed over a very wide area away from lakundi which was actually the mainstream heartland also certain geographically isolated non mainstream temples appear which were built by small local workshops so although these temples depart from the proper western chalukyan style they are certainly derived from it and the shankarling temple appears to be one of this non mainstream temple built by a local workshop so to understand the western chalukyan architecture various temples were studied and of these the mahadeva temple in etebi from the mainstream category and the tarakeshwar temple in hangal from the non mainstream category will be discussed further So the Mahadeva temple follows a single shrine arrangement. Adjoining the sanctum is the vestibule, that's the antarala, connecting to the enclosed mandapa, which is then followed by an open mandapa. So, uh, considering the Tarakeshwar temple of the non-mainstream category, the plan is quite similar. What is noticeable is the additional Nandi mandapa that's present towards the east, and the entrance of the temple is through this mandapa. So, considering the elevation of the Garbhagriha towards the west, the Mahadeva temple. um the top portion is actually lost of the shikhara but as per the drawings that are generated by professor adam hardy the temple consists of four talas or stories and um each of this story has a similar composition so the tarakeshwar temple too has a composition of four talas so looking at the mahadev temple into more detail 
the temple garbhagriha wall has five projections so that's one two three four and five with a central emphasis created and um, these wall shrines that are there that are placed in the central projection and the corner projections so um, the plinth or the adhisthana at the ground level consists of these very elaborate moldings and what is noticeable is the fact that this particular order of moldings is present across all the mainstream and the non mainstream temples as well also the entablature at roof level consists of these molding layers above which you have these adicular components called the shala and the kuta present so a detail of um, the detail is shown where a kuta is placed above these molding layers so similar to the mahadev temple the tarkeshwar temple's garbhagriha wall also consists of five projections and um vision of basically pilasters and wall shrines and the moldings present at the roof and plinth level are also quite similar a noticeable feature in the plinth moldings of the open mandapa as seen here in the image the kakshasana is present that's the seating on the periphery just like the shankarling temple so although in this case the kakshasana is very elaborate with intricate carvings of these mini pilasters so um the talas or the stories of the shikhara consists of these smaller modules as mentioned earlier called the shala and the kuta so a central staggered shala is present and the corner and intermediate positions are occupied by these kuta modules this is similar in the mainstream temples as well as the non mainstream temples also an interesting element is the sukhanasa which is the frontal antefix of the shikhara and the sukhanasa projecting in case of mahadeva temple is this barrel shaped form which reaches up to the base of the fourth tara or the story and the sukhanasa in case of the tarkeshwar temple has this sculpture of a lion attacking a warrior so this appears to be an influence from the temples built by the hoysala dynasty which again ruled the deccan region so coming to the recreation of the temple components the shankarling temple's open mandapa still retains the original plinth as mentioned earlier so referring to these layers the garbhagriha plinth has been recreated also based on the comparative analysis of other western chalukyan temples the common molding layers have been identified and a second iteration is been created for the plinth as well also at the roof level where the canopy layers still present the layers above have been again recreated by analyzing the co common molding layers that are present across all the mainstream as well as the non mainstream temples so considering the shikhara composition the number of talas or stories generally vary from 3 to 4 across all the western chalukyan temples and a garbhagriha wall that's below here um, with three projections will have a three story shikhara and a wall with five projections as seen in the mahadev or the tarkeshwar temple will generally have a four story shikhara so following this trend the shankarling temple should have a three story shikhara based on the documentation and um, as seen here the exterior wall has a central projection and very subtle corner projections see um, above the garbhagriha at the roof level also this original canopy layer still present so based on the staggering that's happening within this layer the shikhara with a central double staggered shala module and um, one adicular component on each corner can be generated additionally um, within the shankarling temple the doors have been studied where above the lintel here you have these five miniature shikharas so this feature was considered for recreating the temple as well so thus this leads to a composition where you have this double staggered shala edicule and these corner kuta domes oh sorry yeah so the sukhanasa design uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, varies across all the mainstream and non mainstream temples and it follows no general norms so in some temples the molding layers that are present within the shikhara continued itself and um, so the common layers again have been identified and have been used for the recreation of this element so to conclude since the mainstream temples were predominantly built by the sudhi and the lakundi workshops mentioned earlier they appear very homogeneous whereas the non mainstream temples appear very eclectic as these temples were probably formed when the workers from the original mainstream workshops migrated so due to this a lot of external 
So due to this, a lot of external influences are visible in the non-mainstream temples. So two examples showing the Hoysala dynasty influences are the Bhimeshwara temple in Nilgund and the Tarkeshwar temple that was mentioned earlier. So that's an image that was mentioned earlier of the lion attacking the warrior. So this is a Hoysala dynasty influence. Also taking into account the plant form, the main shrine is always located towards the west and the temple entrance is generally towards the east. An exception is the Bhimeshwara temple in Nilgund, where a fourth shrine is located towards the east. Also, the open mandapa, that's the hall, of some of the non-mainstream temples has the Kakshasana present with the decorative bands that was mentioned in the Tarkeshwar temple and the Shankarling temple as well. And the molding layers present on the Adhisthana, that's the plinth at ground level, and the Prasthara, that's the entablature, the roof level have the molding layers present in the same order in both the mainstream and the non-mainstream temples. So coming to the wall compositions, some of the um, mainstream temples and non-mainstream temples are quite similar with these tambas or plasters segregating the wall into projections of three or five. The central projection and the corner projections are always occupied by these wall shrines. So the Shikara composition generally follows the standard norm where the number of the Garbhagriha wall projections and the number of Shikara talas are interlinked. And the adipular components too mostly consists of the Sala and the Kuta domes. So considering the architectural features, the Mahadeva temple in Itagi that was mentioned earlier from the mainstream category is said to be modeled after the Amritesha temple in Anigere belonging to the same category. So this Mahadeva temple further serves as a model for the non-mainstream temples, that is the Tarakeshwar temple and the Someshwara temple. So this, go, this shows that there are no distinct or clear-cut boundaries between these two categories in terms of the architectural characteristics. And this also suggests that the non-mainstream temples were probably influenced by these mainstream temples. So to conclude, the Shikara of the Shankarling temple was built in modern materials with stepped stories. And it's in total contrast to the Western Chalukyan architecture. So based on all the above mentioned factors and the comparative analysis, the Shikara of stories that has been recreated would be an idle iteration for the Shankarling temple. That's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Parvati. That was a great presentation. Uh, we will now be taking questions from the audience for all our presenters. So if you haven't sent your questions in, please send them to the chat box. I see that we have a few questions, so uh, we'll begin with that. Uh, our first question is for Megan and Rana from Professor Girish Agarwal. And he asks, in both your presentations, you made the distinction between tangible and intangible heritage. Megan implicitly and Rana explicitly. How much of this difference can be attributed to power differentials and how much to the apparent need of human collectives anywhere to see physical structures, monumental or human scale as things which represent a more stable truth than mere stories? Uh, Megan, would you like to go first? Yes, sure. Um, I guess uh, by giving stories something tangible like a building or a statue allows for the story or narrative to pass through time um, it gives it a sense of permanency um, and with indigenous australians the tangible heritage um, is not regarded as important there, there definitely is tangible heritage in the form of um, nature uh, birthing trees and they don't get nearly as much respect as what the, the tangible European colonialism heritage gets. Um, and I think uh, you need to, for something to be tangible, um, to represent a truth um, it, that also sort of shows the element of power, um, that the tangible heritage has more value than non-tangible heritage. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Oh, I think that's cool. Uh, Ronald, do you want to answer next? Yeah, I think the, the, the distinction that is made between the tangible and tangible, in, like intangible heritage, uh, much can be attributed to the idea of creating physical structures and monuments. Because from the very beginning, we have been concentrating on the idea of understanding the world through our visual senses, as in the idea of the pictures, the idea of perspectives and all. 
so the importance that we have been given to visual senses we have within like going through this process we have been uh, giving less importance to the other senses the other senses of hearing the senses of um, the senses of as in materiality the textures and all other senses so for this reason it it becomes very important for us to create a physical structure in order like giving importance to the visual sense so that while we see the structure we 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 kind of feel that that memory as megan said that memory is kind of stable in nature not as in the intangible heritage which is which might be perceived as some kind of intangible memory but like unstable memory and in case of the power uh, differences yes it 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 does create a power difference the people who are uh, who own these physical structures uh, are getting much more priority just as in the case of like uh, the babri masjid or the cases which i presented the people what people are saying they are tending to believe that other than those intangible heritage which are out there thank you so much megan and ronak our uh, next question is for uh, john cedric dated and john den smizo from ramya uh, she asks do we see the existing materiality and structure systems of the egonot houses manifest in peri urban and urban built forms of the philippines if so how um hello can you hear me i guess yeah. um, if we're talking about the material materiality and structurality of the egonot houses in aurora province here in the philippines we can um if we rely on our own observation we could say that there are um some houses or dwelling dwelling houses within the peri urban um proximity of the locality in the aurora province that do um manifest or yeah manifest or reflect the cultural um tradition of house housing of the igongot people but if we look at it in the urban context here in the philippines um most of the uh, buildings here in the philippines do really do rely on the use of modern materials such as concrete and um, steel glass for windows and etc and other materials that uh, also is seen in other countries that is also used in urban urban cities and but but we really can't give a compact answer about this and we can't really rely on our own observation because there is still a need to document the indigenous houses here in the philippines to correlate or say compare the um house uh, the, the building tradition of the igongot people or igongot tribe within the peri-urban peri and the urban um perimeter uh, proximity with of the aurora province and so uh it is imperative that we document the indigenous house and identify the architectural identity so we can so we will be able to discuss or say um have a have a compact narrative of our past or generally the past of the igangot people um i'd like to ask a follow-up question to the same so i i understand that there is some sort of a translation happening from the Aurora region to the peri-urban region, right? Especially in terms of the materiality and structure. Do you think um, it is somewhere related to a form of cultural nostalgia that the Egonaut houses have, since they are considered a sign of heritage for the Philippines? And do you think that aspect of nostalgia and memory allows for this translation to happen across time and space? Mm. To answer that, actually, we really can't say that there is a um, transition of nostalgia within the within the proximity of the um, of the site because uh, there are only few egongots who are um, present in the area, and so the 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 let's say the propagation of the idea that this is how the egongot tribe build their houses or this is how we represent Igongot people cannot really manifest if there are no present um let's say Igongot uh bloodline within the within the within the area but i could say we could say that there is still hope 
in in preserving the identity of the Igongwat people since we all since one of my colleagues um uh um uh had an interview with the current chieftain of the existing tribe but there is still no uh, actually the, the uh Igongwat people is is still not yet let's say um, considered as a heritage site in the Philippines, although they are recognized as part of the indigenous uh, groups in the Philippines, but there is still no initiative in um, protecting or conserving the con protecting or conserving the uh, existing uh, structures in the Igonga tribe. All right, that makes sense. Thank you so much, John. Um, so we have one question for Parvati from Professor Girisha Garwal, and he asks, um, how did you measure the existing structures for your research uh, using standard surveying tools or a LIDAR? Yeah, so basically the Shankarling Temple was, uh, I did the measure drawing of that and I used the standard measuring tools like the measuring tape and I also used the laser tools to get the heights. All right, thank you, Parvati. Um, we have one last question from Ayushi, and this is for all the members of the panel. Uh, and she asks, culture does manifest into the build, and perhaps the build could be seen as a way of preserving legacy, but does it manage to preserve the narratives? Is it possible to preserve the ever-evolving narrative through the build form? Um, Parvati, why don't you answer first, and then we can move in order from there. Yes, so um, in the case of the Shankarling Temple, of course, the original Western Chalkan Shikara is lost and instead a new one has been built. So in case of this temple, it's not preserved, but there are other prominent temples where it has been, there are governing bodies like the ASI and all who actually attempt to preserve the elements of the temple. So there, it's, it's something that, happening in the bigger scale temples whereas in these small scale regional temples it's not possible because there's no um if there's no body which can give out more effective advice or exercise some sort of control or guide these transformations that are happening and these transformations are something that are bound to happen due to urbanization so yeah that's it <laughs> Thank you, Parvati. Um, John, Raider, and John, do you guys want to attempt answering this next? Um, um, hello. Um, if we're going to uh, say that the architectural um, architectural manifestation of a single culture does not manifest the narrative of that certain um, indigenous group we really can say that it that i think it doesn't have it wouldn't have any other purpose or say it wouldn't have any other significance as a cultural heritage so i think um the uh the, the preservation and the conservation of a heritage site alone is very vital in propagating the idea that this culture has this own tradition of how they had developed their own architecture. I think I, I, I wish I hope that I answered the question. I think you did, but let's let's wait. Let's wait for Ayushi to get back to that. Uh, Rana, why don't you take a shot at this? Sir? Yeah. So I think, yes, the culture does manifest into the build and the build plays a major role in kind of pre, pre, like preserving the legacy. But then often, as in we see the, we have seen in the case studies, it, it fails to kind of represent all the narratives. And yes, it is very much possible to preserve and kind of represent all these narratives. The moment that we uh, stop creating a distinct a distinction and provide and pro, like stop giving an order to everything stop creating a hierarchy and allow the subjectivity of things it would be possible for us to represent various narratives as well as respect them all right thank you so much Ronak. um megan would you like to go next um yeah i would have to agree with um Ranuk. i think 
that it does manifest itself in the built form um, and it does have the ability to change with the narrative. Um, with Ballarat, it's the, the imperial dominance and colonial heritage is, is a, a large tree at the moment, overshadowing a lot of other cultures within that town. Um, but by just by talking about this like, like now and acknowledging those missing narratives, it gives the ability to tell those stories that are missing in it. Um, but it's important to acknowledge, I guess, the power that those, um, those the, the ownership on that land has as well. All right, um, thank you so much. This was a very informative session for all of us. Your presentations were incredible and I think we've had a great round of discussion as well with the questions that were generated by all four of your presentations. Um, thank you guys once again. I'd like to thank um, all the audience as well for being so patient and for asking extremely insightful questions. Um, this has been a great session. I had a lot of time. I had a lot of fun moderating this session. Thank you so much. Um, Aditya, over to you again. All right. Um, thank you, Akshita, and all the presenters for uh, the final session of the day. It has been very insightful, and the discussion has been quite, quite wonderful. Um, with this, we conclude all the panels uh, as a part of the International Conference on the Built Environment, or ICBE 2021. Um, it's been incredible, and we are very excited that all of you have joined us for it. Uh, we are very grateful to all the presenters for sharing with us your valuable research and for being a part of such an incredible set of panels uh, as a part of ICBE 2021. Um, for those of you who have joined us on Zoom, we request all of you to return at 6 p.m. after a break for the screening of the documentary I Gai, When Will Electricity Come? by filmmaker Dr. Anandana Kapoor. Um, after the screening, we will be in conversation with Dr. Kapoor and even taking some questions um, from the audience in a session which will be moderated by Professor Aloparna Sengupta from the General School of Art and Architecture. The link for this screening has been shared with all of you previously, but it will be sent again on the chat box for your convenience. And we will see you at 6 p.m. for the screening. Um, to all the presenters and those of you that have joined us, we look forward to staying in touch with all of you and are excited for possible collaboration opportunities in the future. We thank our university advisors at OP General Global University, the Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, Additional Registrar, for their incredible support and encouragement uh, for the conference. We also thank our industry partners who have joined us over the past few days for their support. Uh, we thank members of the review panel um, for, for their incredible support uh, on hosting this, this uh, conference. We would thank, we thank the organizing committee of the conference, the faculty members here at JSAA, the entire student community that has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to help organize and host this conference. Uh, finally, an incredible thank you to the social media team, as well as the IT team that has been working behind the scenes, to, um, which, which includes Mr. Vishnu, Mr. Vidyut, and Mr. Shubham, as well as their entire IT and logistics team for their incredible work in helping ICBE 2021 run smoothly without any disruptions. Um, a reminder that all the recordings of this conference will be uploaded on our JSA YouTube channel in case you wish to go back to them. Uh, you can follow our social media platforms for all updates regarding ICBE 2021. The links will be sent on the chat box. Additionally, we will be releasing the ICBE 2021 book of abstracts as a part of etc. the JSA student newsletter on the 1st of October. Um, so that's coming very soon. Uh, we are extremely delighted that all of you have joined us for the past three days of the conference and have continued to engage with us uh, and the presenters as well as the keynote lectures. 
we hope that this conference has been an enriching experience for all of you and we are so excited to see all of you again next year as well at the JSA JGU campus for the second edition of ICBE in 2022. We will see you again at 6 p.m. for the documentary screening. Um, thank you so much for joining us and please take care. Thank you.